A Cinderella for the Duke. Written by Abby Ailes and published by Starfall Publications. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy! Chapter 1 I do not think it is a good idea for me to go, Lady Louisa said to her mother across the breakfast table. I would worry about you, mother. In Lady Gilchrist's hand was a letter from a relative of whom Lady Louisa had not heard more than a handful of words spoken. I agree that it is regrettable that Aunt Sarah's husband has died, but I don't see how my attending to her can help. After all, does she not have children of her own? Lady Louisa continued, pushing aside the toast and marmalade set before her. She does have two daughters. They are not much younger than you. I know that you cannot do much to help them, but it would be nice if you went anyway. Lady Gilchrist was looking much better now, though the year anniversary of her own husband's death had been a difficult hurdle for her to overcome. She scarcely believed that she would have done as well without the constant companionship of her daughter. Lady Louisa always seemed to be a calm mind amid turmoil. I am surprised that Aunt Sarah wrote and told you in the first place, Lady Louisa said, taking a sip of her hot chocolate. As am I. In fact, I cannot remember the last time either of us spoke to the other. I find it to be a gesture of goodwill, and I think it would only be right for me to make one in return. Sarah is not as well off as we are, Lady Gilchrist continued. It would do well for her to have the additional help. It also might be nice for you, she finished with an arching of her blonde brow. In what way? Lady Louisa responded with scepticism. She wasn't sure how leaving town, her only home really, to stay with relations she barely even knew, would be to her benefit. Well, for starters, you only know our circle here in London. It might be nice for you to see prospects on a broader horizon. Prospects? Mother, I am 26, almost 27 years old. I believe the time of prospects is over for me, Lady Louisa said in honesty. I don't think that is true, Lady Gilchrist countered. You are in your prime, if you ask me. Perhaps this new change of location will give you the courage to stand out. If you would only do that, I know you could find your own happiness. Perhaps, Lady Louisa said, doing her best not to roll her eyes. Her mother was always encouraging her to step out more and be noticed. Lady Gilchrist loved her daughter dearly, and for that reason refused to see that she would be nothing more than a demure wallflower for her entire life. Lady Louisa was not like her brother, who was always free with words and off on exciting adventures. It was not her way nor would it ever be. Though she would have liked to have a romance and family of her own, she had resolved quite some time ago that the chances of that were very slim. Not only was Lady Louisa quiet and reserved, she was also quite homely. Perhaps it didn't help that her best friend Isabella, the Duchess of Wintercrest, was just about the most stunning creature in the whole of the ton, both in looks and personality. In truth, Lady Louisa was a bit curious to learn more of this family that she had otherwise never heard much about. She knew that some rift had been created between her mother and aunt, but nothing beyond that. Her aunt's house was, in fact, not very far from their own county seat. If I am to go, Lady Louisa said timidly, I would like to know what caused the hostility between you two. I would hate to make a situation worse. I highly doubt you could do such a thing. You always seem to be the pillar that all the rest of us can rely upon. You have such a calming, steadying force, Lady Gilchrist complimented. She was hoping it would distract her daughter from the question at hand. The rift with her sister seemed very petty now that she was older, and somewhat of an embarrassment to have to tell her daughter about it. When Lady Louisa wouldn't let the subject go without a straight answer, however, the Dowager Countess had no choice but to explain it all with an exasperated sigh. I suppose my sister grew resentful over time. Of what? Lady Louisa encouraged. Well, she was intended to marry your father. What? Lady Louisa let out in shock. She couldn't believe the words her mother was speaking. How had she never heard of this before? They had never even met each other, 
when the arrangement was made. In fact, I am certain our parents arranged the match when she was still an infant. Sarah had a bit of a rebellious streak in her youth and was determined against marrying a man she didn't know for the sake of our family connections. Lady Gilchrist moved her hand to her hair and, out of habit, smoothed back a curl that framed her face. It was easy to see this wasn't a comfortable subject for her. Sarah fell in love with Mr. Hendrickson, and they ran away and eloped before my parents could say otherwise. I do not understand. Then why is she upset with you? Well, the reason for their rushed elopement was because your father was to come and acquire his bride that very week. He wasn't aware of the events until he and your grandparents arrived on my family's doorstep. It was most embarrassing for your grandfather, my father, that is. I fear he never forgave Sarah for that. Lady Gilchrist was silent for a moment as the past seemed to flash before her eyes. Luckily, the Frasers were very good friends and understanding of the whole situation. Even your father, God rest him, was not too hurt by the slight and insult of it all. They stayed for a time, and the result was our union. I still don't understand why Aunt Sarah would be angry with you. She had no interest in father, it would seem. Why would she care that you married him in her stead? Lady Louisa acknowledged the complications arising from the situation. But if anyone ought to be angry, shouldn't that be her mother? She was the one forced to marry the man meant for her sister. We married to honour the promise between our families, not because we cared for each other. I am not the first to do such a thing, certainly, but I am one of the lucky ones that actually found enjoyment in the arrangement. Your aunt held tight to her conviction that she should have been free to choose for herself and not be forced into a union. When she heard of me taking her place, she thought of me as weak. I was marrying a man for the security of his name and fortune, and she married for love. Unfortunately for her, she has lived a very hard life due to her choice. Mr. Hendrickson, though a landowner, did not have the means to give Sarah the life she was accustomed to. I think that over time, and because of her great many hardships, she resented her choice. Our parents also disowned her for her actions. Lady Gilchrist added at the end. All that was to be split between us two sisters upon my father's departure from this world was given to me in whole. I see, Lady Louisa said. I offered to give Sarah her portion at the very least. They certainly needed it more than we did. She would not hear of it. I suppose that was the last straw for her. I had meant it in goodwill, but she took it as an act of gloating. I'm not sure how I can help in this in any way. I cannot imagine anything I could say or do would change Aunt Sarah's heart towards us, Lady Louisa said, searching her own thoughts. I'm sure you are right, in fact, at least in my view. Nonetheless, it is our duty as Christians to extend the hand of friendship and love to those in need. I know she would never receive me. Our relationship is permanently destroyed, but that doesn't mean yours has to be with either your aunt or your cousins. So, what would you have me do? Lady Louisa asked. I would ask you to simply be there for your aunt. Help in any way that you see fit. Be a good friend to your cousins. In such manner, you can mend the bond severed between our two families. Lady Gilchrist paused for a moment before giving a half-smile. If you should happen to chance upon your prospect at the same time, all the better. Lady Louisa did roll her eyes this time at her mother's words. Yes, her mother wanted her to go and create a connection where once it had been and now was lost. But Lady Louisa suspected the request was more than that, her mother's last effort to see her only daughter settled in life. If only she had the courage to tell Lady Gilchrist that such a thing was not just unlikely, but surely impossible. She did not possess a great beauty or eloquence when it mattered. Yes, in the safety of her home or around close friends, she was more open than she would otherwise be. But even in these instances, she would still be considered reserved. Why Lady Gilchrist thought sending her to a distant county to stay with relations she hadn't met before would make her into that shining light she always wished her to be, she didn't know. If anything, it would have an adverse effect on her ability to be outspoken.
I suppose it would be the right thing for me to go and at least see if I could alleviate their pain a bit. After all, I have experienced the loss of a father myself and can therefore comfort my cousins. Lady Gilchrist broke out in a satisfied smile before setting aside the note that had rested in her hand for the entirety of their conversation. I will write to your aunt today and suggest the arrangement. Lady Louisa nodded before turning back to her hot chocolate. She wondered how her mother would fare all alone here. With the Earl of Gilchrist and his wife Abigail gone to the Americas, there didn't seem to be anyone here to keep her company. Of course, she did have all their friends here, as well as London society and several others to keep her busy. Perhaps her mother would scarcely notice her absence. Though the year mark of her father's death had caused her mother deep depression, she had been wise enough to keep her hands busy. In that way, the Dowager Countess had overcome the memory of the darkest day in her life. Lady Louisa reflected on this newly discovered information about her mother and father. If she had never been told otherwise, she would surely have believed they had married for love. The affection and warmth that seemed to emanate from her memory of her parents never once suggested an arranged marriage. Perhaps while she was away with her aunt, she could somehow show that her mother had never meant to slight her sister. Nor had she intended to take away any possession that belonged to Aunt Sarah. Lady Louisa knew that pride and jealousy were not easy vices to overcome, especially those rooted so deeply for such a long time. Perhaps in her own small ways, though, she could begin to help her aunt see the providence in her elopement and the resulting marriage of Louisa's parents, for surely all things were done for a purpose. If there was one thing that Lady Louisa was actually good at, it was to see the virtue in a difficult situation, the answer amid the darkness. Chapter 2 Lady Louisa did her best to calm her inner turmoil as she saw the Hendrickson's house come into view. Really, the only other county estate she had to compare it to was Wintercrest Manor. Naturally, it was not as vast as Isabella's home. Lady Louisa had no memory of her own family's county estate, as she had not been there since her early childhood. Menthith House, as she had learned it was named, may not have been the vast estate of Wintercrest, but it had its own charm. It was a simple house that looked worn with age. Along the front was a wall of ivy, climbing and twisting amongst the windows. Exiting the carriage that had brought her thus far, she was surprised to see that no one stood outside to greet her. They had to have heard the clamour of wooden wheels and hoofprints clacking on the dirt road's pebbles. There was no other property nearby. They would know that it was none other than her arriving. She could smell the pungent odour of the pig barn just to the left of the house and hear the whine of their horse in a stable. For the most part, she found the countryside refreshing and invigorating. She had experienced so much in just her short ride there that she couldn't even imagine how much more the country might have to offer. She waited patiently as the coachman removed her chest from the top of the carriage. Lady Louisa wondered if she should walk up to the chipping blue-painted door and knock. Before she could raise her hand, however, the door opened and an elderly-looking footman came out. "'You must be Lady Louisa,' he said in a quaking voice while bowing. He was vastly unkempt compared to her own footman. His clothes were unclean, his nails dirty, and his hair flowing free in cobweb wisps. "'I am,' Lady Louisa responded timidly, brushing the dust of travel off her grey muslin dress with her leather travelling gloves. "'I am Mr Johnson, the head butler,' he said, moving over to her luggage. He promptly took the hat-box from her hand and laid it on top of the chest in order to carry them both. Lady Louisa hesitated for a moment. He seemed far too old to be doing such hard work. I thank you for your kindness, Mr. Johnson, but perhaps there is another who could take my things inside. I fear it may be quite significant in size and weight. That's very kind of you to worry after me, my lady, but I promise you I am quite capable and the only one available. You could not possibly be the only one in such a house, Lady Louisa inquired. It may have been of humble size compared to Wintercrest, but even her own London house had a butler and two footmen. There are three others, my lady. 
However, during the day they are to tend to the fields of the property and see to the animals. I promise you that we do our best to be sufficiently staffed with what we have. Lady Hendrickson has her own lady's maid, and two for the use of her daughters, Miss Hendrickson and Miss Mary. You will be happy to know that the services of one will be devoted solely to you for the duration of your visit. Oh, I see, Lady Louisa said. She hadn't meant to seem presumptuous or rude. Really, she was just surprised to hear the estate was staffed with so few people. She hadn't expected that. I'm thankful for my aunt's willingness to see to my comfort. Perhaps I will be received by her shortly so that I may express my gratitude in person, Lady Louisa asked, doing her best not to seem rude again. Lady Hendrickson will receive you in the drawing room this afternoon, Mr Johnson informed her as he hoisted up her chest. She followed behind him promptly, not wishing him to have to tarry for her any more than needed as he struggled into the house. She did her best to study the surroundings as they made their way up to her room. Most of the walls were darkened with the black suit of time. Even the portraits on the wall were barely recognisable. If, however, one overlooked the general disrepair of an old home with limited resources to maintain it, the house seemed rather comfortable and inviting. Mr Johnson led her up the stairs and down the hall past several doors. Soon the hall became narrower and the ceiling seemed to brush against Mr Johnson's head. He didn't seem much taller than Lady Louisa herself. She was sure he was taking her through the main sleeping area and into the servants' quarters. Forgive the tight space, Mr Johnson said as he slid open the first door in the narrow hall. The estate can't afford guest rooms. He pushed open the door and walked in, setting down her trunk. Lady Louisa entered after him. In the room were two simple beds with drawers between them. Next to the door was a simple washbasin stand. The only other fixture in the room was the large window with the blue shutters. Lady Louisa noticed that they matched the colour of the front door. One of the beds had a fine quilt while the others was threadbare. She guessed that the room was meant for the female servants. She walked forward to look out the window. Lady Louisa gasped at the sight. In front of her lay the vastness of the property, with a beautifully clear lake in the distance. She could see one of the footmen working in a field below, as well as several gardens in disrepair. Since they were facing the back of the house, she guessed those were the kitchen and medicinal gardens. Lady Louisa hoped that she could explore them thoroughly, for she dearly loved to learn about plants their therapeutic properties and health benefits. What a beautiful view, Lady Louisa commented. Yes, Mr Johnson said with a huff as he set down her chest at the edge of the bed with the fine quilt. Madam is kind enough to afford us our own rooms on the estate, but with your coming, Bess was quick to volunteer hers. She knew how breathtaking the view is. Your ladyship will be even more impressed in the evening. The sun sets just there. He moved forward and pointed over to the lake. It is a most spectacular view as it reflects in the water, he said with a soft smile. I am most grateful for your sacrifice on my behalf and Bess's as well. Well, he said, scratching his stubbled chin in embarrassment, we are more than happy to oblige. There is plenty of room, however. I don't mind sharing the space with Bess. Oh no, my lady, we wouldn't have it that way. Mr Johnson excused himself from the room, and Lady Louisa reflected on the odd things that had happened since arriving at her aunt's house. To start with, there were the butler's final words. He spoke as if he and the other servants would not have allowed such a thing as that which she suggested. Surely her aunt had other guests visit her. Did she make them all stay in the servants' quarters? Lady Louisa did her best not to contemplate too much on the strange beginning of her little visit and instead prepared to meet her aunt. She felt overly nervous for this first meeting. It was odd that her aunt had not been present at her arrival. After freshening up and changing into a rose silk dress, Lady Louisa felt ready to meet her aunt. She wanted to make a great first impression, for she had a feeling the success of her trip would largely depend on it. Her dress was a little ruffled from its time in the trunk. She hoped her aunt wouldn't hold this against her not to mention her hair was still a bit worn from the two-day ride from London. She had hoped that Bess might appear and help her get it done. 
Usually she wouldn't have cared much about her looks, but today seemed to be the day that putting her best foot forward really counted. She retraced her steps back down the hall and stairs, not entirely sure which room was the drawing room she was meant to go to. Luckily, just as she descended the stairs, a maid with a tea tray appeared around the corner. Could you perhaps point me in the direction of the drawing room, as it appears you are also headed that way? Lady Louisa asked. The maid smiled kindly at Lady Louisa and nodded. Without another word, Lady Louisa fell in step behind the maid. She paused for just a moment before the door as the maid walked in, clinking cups and teapot in hand. Lady Louisa hesitated as she peeked into the room. She could see three ladies already seated. Lady Louisa could only assume it was her aunt and two cousins. She took a deep, steadying breath. Finding her stomach full of knots, she made her way into the room. She stood before her aunt and cousins without introduction as the maid set down the tray. All three pairs of eyes looked at her rather sceptically. She felt like crumpling against the wall. I suppose punctuality is not something practised or taught by my sister, the Dowager Countess, Lady Hendrickson said, looking reasonably bored with her niece. Forgive me, Aunt Sarah, I wasn't told where or when you were expecting me. For a beat, silence filled the room. Lady Louisa was waiting for some kind of response, and her aunt seemed to relish the awkwardness it was causing her. Indeed, Lady Hendrickson finally said. You have quite a familiar tone with someone you are meeting for the first time. She let out a long breath of distaste. I suppose you should take a seat. I would rather not have a garden statue in the middle of the room. Lady Louisa tried to laugh it off as if her aunt meant it as a joke. Her stone-cold face told her otherwise. Lady. Louisa had a feeling that mending any bond between the two families, or even creating a friendship between her two cousins, was going to be significantly harder than she had first hoped for. I expect you will be needing an introduction, Lady Hendrickson said with a raised brow. Lady Louisa couldn't believe how much her aunt reminded her of her own mother in looks. Perhaps it was the fact that Lady Hendrickson was completely garbed in a black dress, as her mother had also chosen to do since her own husband's death. It was more than that, however. Though Lady Hendrickson looked vastly more worn with age and had a roundness that her mother was altogether lacking, it was still possible to pick out their similar blue eyes and matching golden hair. Unlike her mother, who, even in her darkest times, had a glow in her eyes, Lady Louisa's aunt only seemed to have a face full of disdain and unhappiness. The lines of her displeasure ran deep along either side of her still plump cheeks. I think I can figure out names, Lady Louisa said as pleasantly as possible as she took a seat in a high-backed chair. You must be Miss Elizabeth Hendrickson and you Miss Mary, Lady Louisa said, turning to each of her cousins. She did her best to take note of the fact that Lady Hendrickson didn't seem to care for familiar terms between relations. Though Mary gave her a soft smile, Elizabeth seemed to share in her mother's expression of abhorrence. It was easy to see that not only was her aunt going to be a difficult person to win over, but her daughters would be as well. Chapter 3 They stayed in the drawing room for the remainder of the afternoon and on into the evening. It was strange to Lady Louisa not to leave and dress for dinner, since no announcement was made to do so and neither of the other ladies said anything about it. She kept her mouth shut on the matter. It seemed that Lady Hendrickson's need for propriety was most duplicitous and only mattered regarding Lady Louisa. As Lady Louisa spent the time either in awkward silence or answering loaded questions laced with disdain, she felt very much like the schoolgirl of her youth, being tortured by the other students. Lady Louisa couldn't quite imagine at that moment how she was ever going to make an extended stay here at Mentheath House work. She felt no more welcome than a mouse looking for crumbs in the pantry. Finally, Mr Johnson entered the room. Lady Louisa took notice that both his hands were clean, his threadbare coat had been brushed, and his hair had been pulled back smoothly. She couldn't help but feel a little relieved when her aunt's scrutiny left her and turned on the poor butler. 
Have you no gloves? Lady Hendrickson spat at the man. After all, we have a very fine guest with us tonight, she continued, waving in Lady Louisa's direction. Oh, please, aunt. I mean, Lady Hendrickson. I don't ask for any special treatment while I am here. Do you hear that, girls? Lady Hendrickson said, turning to her two daughters. Your cousin seems to be gracious enough to descend to our level, she said with a snake-like hiss. I only meant that I have come to assist you in any way I can. I do not wish to create more work for the household. It's my goal to help you. After all, I too have felt the loss of my father. I know how it must tear at your hearts. Lady Louisa addressed the last of her words to her cousins. She had to remind herself that they were going through a difficult time and much of her aunt's negative disposition had to be the result of the current stress and grief she was under. How very magnanimous of you, Lady Hendrickson drawled before standing and calling her girls to follow her. Lady Louisa sat shocked in her seat for just a moment at the cruel manner in which her aunt had already treated her. Surely her mother wouldn't want to attempt to mend bonds when it seemed so clear that the other party involved had no wish to do so. Her mind drifted to her mother at that moment, however. Yes, she was keeping busy and probably not wanting for much entertainment in her absence. She was, however, still very frail of spirit. Lady Louisa could only imagine the degree of hurt her mother would feel if she returned home without having accomplished her task. If she couldn't win over her aunt or cousins, it wouldn't be for lack of trying. She was determined to stay the course, if only for her own mother's happiness. Lady Louisa stood from her seat and quickly caught up to the swaying skirts of her two cousins to follow the procession to dinner. Did you mean what you said? Lady Louisa's aunt asked from her right side at the table. Lady Hendrickson had insisted that Lady Louisa sit at the head. Forgive me, but what are you referring to? Lady Hendrickson gave an exasperated puff of her cheeks like she was dealing with a stupid child. Lady Louisa could hear the covered giggles from her two cousins. That you are willing to help in any way you can? Oh yes, Lady Louisa said, perking right up. She was hoping that this could perhaps be the opening she was looking for. Well, the house has always been shorthanded. You see, Mr. Hendrickson had promised me the world when we first met. This is all he seemed to be able to give, however, Lady Hendrickson said with a wave of her hand at the room. Normally, the girls and I contribute to the housework, so few staff members simply cannot accomplish everything that is needed. Unfortunately, since my husband's departure from this world, Lady Hendrickson paused for a moment and dabbed at her nose with a handkerchief. Well, neither the girls nor I have been up to it. We barely manage ourselves every day, let alone the mountain of tasks piling up before us. Lady Louisa felt excitement inside her. This would be her chance to show her aunt that no hard feelings were harboured between the two families. She would do all that she could to get Menthith House back on its feet. After all, was not charity the greatest love? Lady Louisa would show that she and her mother had high abounding love for this family, and in return she hoped the Hendricksons would again accept them into their lives. Lady Louisa was sure this was the last grievance her mother needed to fix in this life. She wasn't willing to let her mother down. By the end of dinner, Lady Louisa was in high spirits and full of tasks for the morrow. She thought it was quite a long list and figured it was only because all three would work together to accomplish the tasks. Her first task would be to get the kitchen garden and medicinal garden set to order. She actually didn't find this task too tedious and thought she might rather enjoy it. It was, after all, early enough in the spring that she might yet get a good yield for the dinner table. In times past, she had helped her own gardeners tend to the small plots behind their London home, and therefore had good knowledge on the matter. She had even made a bit of a hobby out of medicinal plants and their uses recently. The second task on her long list was to retrieve from the town the parcels that the women of the house were expecting. She worried more about this job, as she had no familiarity with the area and she would be in public all on her own. Perhaps her cousins would accompany her on this trip, and in that way it would not be improper. 
But for a lady to walk to town and through shops without even a maid at her side was more than Lady Louisa had ever done in her life. As much as Lady Louisa wanted to mention such concerns to her aunt, she also knew that she would no doubt be ridiculed for them. At every moment Lady Hendrickson directed cruel or insulting words towards Lady Louisa. First, there was the instance in the drawing room. Then at dinner, she covered her insults with humility. Lady Hendrickson had initially commented on how the meal was no doubt distasteful to someone used to the finery of London. Next, she remarked on how Lady Louisa must have chosen her most outdated gown so as not to make her cousins feel unfashionable. All these comments and so many more were all meant to belittle and embarrass Lady Louisa. She hated to admit it, but it was working. That night, before retiring to her bed in the small servant room meant for two, Lady Louisa sat at the edge of her bed and did her best not to cry. She was sure in that moment she would have much preferred to be back at Mrs Mason's school for young ladies and have her hair dipped in the inkwell than to have to spend another meal in the company of her aunt. Lady Louisa's only solace was that if she just kept her head down and did the work asked of her, as she had done in primary school, then it would all be over much more quickly. Tomorrow, she would have nothing but sunshine and a day in the garden to look forward to. With any luck, that would also mean not having to be in her aunt's presence. Chapter 4 Much to Lady Louisa's dismay, luck didn't seem to be on her side, though she did wake to a steaming hot basin of water and a simple but filling breakfast tray, things only seemed to go downhill from there. Bess, the maid who under normal circumstances resided in the room that was currently Lady Louisa's, was kind and cheerful enough. She did her job efficiently and was quite skilled in dress and hair. Lady Louisa was sure Bess could best the skill of any lady's maid in London. Bess also informed her that any plans of seeing to the needs of the garden were unlikely. The plots of land were normally taken care of by Mr Hendrickson. His illness had come on three years ago, and as a result, he was unable to keep up with the work. He had suffered three long years in bed before his body could no longer bear it. Any supplies that Lady Louisa would need in recreating the gardens would first have to be procured in the village. Lady Louisa, always the one to see the bright side of things, took it as an opportunity to cross off other things on her list, as she would spend the morning in town and hopefully have the afternoon to garden. Sadly, Bess then informed Lady Louisa that such a trip would most likely take the whole of the day. The village was a two-mile walk. Bess offered Lady Louisa the option to ride in the carriage instead. Lady Louisa pondered on this for a moment. Her aunt certainly knew how long the distance was. No doubt her aunt and cousins never walked there but rather rode in the carriage. Perhaps this was yet another way for her aunt to single her out. If Lady Louisa were to take the carriage as offered, then she was sure that night at dinner would be filled with talk of her overly delicate nature. Unquestionably, the maids and male servants didn't take a carriage or horse into town, though. If they could walk the distance, she was sure she could manage it too. She had spent many a season walking the trails in Hyde Park. How much harder could it be to walk a level path to a village? Actually, if you would be so kind as to hand me my sunbonnet, I would rather enjoy the walk, Lady Louisa replied determinedly. Bess looked at her with surprise through the reflection of the looking glass. She was a sweet enough girl in a rather dull brown muslin dress. For the most part, her conversation had been steady without betraying any emotions, up until this moment. I'm afraid, my lady, that I might not be able to find someone to accompany you to the village. I assumed as much. I will go on my own. It is not dangerous here, is it? Bess gave a nervous laugh. Of course it isn't dangerous. I myself make the walk on my day off to visit with my mother. I only meant that it might not be, well... Bess hesitated to finish her sentence. It was not her place to tell Lady Louisa what was and wasn't proper to do. Bess seemed to feel her actions too impertinent already as it was. I appreciate your concern, Lady Louisa responded with a sincere heart. But I am sure I will be just fine on my journey. 
Bess hesitantly gave Lady Louisa easy directions to find her way to the village. Lady Louisa was sure of her own abilities and bravery, though up until this day, bravery was not something she would have ever associated with her personality. Her confidence slowly faltered with each step she took on the path. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor, hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. The country surrounding her aunt's house and fields resembled more an enchanted forest filled with deep, dark secrets than the leisurely walk in the woods that Bess had described. Even with the sky blue and clear of clouds when Lady Louisa had left the house, she was now enshrouded by the darkness of high, overarching tree branches. She shivered and pulled her shawl closer to her as she trudged down the road. She was sure these paths were the old bandit trails from the fairy tales she read as a child. At any moment one would jump out and take all she had. Seriously reconsidering her determination, she was about to turn back when the sound of a horse echoed off the trees. Lady Louisa moved to the side of the road and looked to the bend ahead, waiting for the rider to appear. From the sound, she was sure it was a single rider with no cart or carriage behind. Perhaps they would stop and inform her how much farther she had to go. Lady Louisa was sure that if it was not much farther, she would be able to complete the rest of the journey. She was not surprised when a single rider came around the bend, but she was shocked to see his speed. She took another step back to give the man the whole of the road as his heaving, frothing steed pushed with all its might to reach its maximum ability. In the process of stepping back without looking, however, Lady Louisa stepped on the back of her hem and stumbled to the ground. Lady Louisa hadn't expected the rider even to see her at his high speed. But apparently, he did. What was worse, he saw her fall. He pulled on the reins, causing the horse to skid on the path and rear up in protest. The rider must have been quite proficient, for he didn't lose control despite the animal's protest. Instead, he turned the beast around, dismounted, and walked it over to where Lady Louisa had fallen. I'm terribly sorry for the fright, miss. I am not used to seeing others on this path. Lady Louisa looked up past her sunbonnet at the face of the man before her. He did seem sincere in his words, but the embarrassment was still fresh for her. I was under the impression that this was the path that leads to the village. One would think it would be used often enough to encourage caution from riders, Lady Louisa said, as she brushed the leaves and dirt off her dress. Looking down, she could see the hem of her rose-coloured dress was not only smirched with dirt, but also torn from her misstep on it. The village is just down that way and around the bend. However, not much else is in that direction, he said, pointing his leather-gloved hand to the path she had already trodden on. Well. My aunt's house is in fact in that direction, Lady Louisa said with a small hint of irritation. Oh, how wonderful. You must be a neighbour of mine. I've only taken residence a month ago at Basson Park and have yet to meet all those around me. Are you familiar with the estate? I'm afraid not, Lady Louisa said, truly having very little knowledge of anything past the road she now walked on. I have only arrived myself just a day ago. I was on my way to the village to procure the necessities for a summer garden. How splendid, he remarked, seeming relieved that she was physically intact as she stood before him and readjusted her bonnet. So your aunt must work at one of the small houses along the path before Basson Park. I believe there are only three, he said more to himself. Which one can I send a note to inquire about your health, miss? It wasn't the first time that Lady Louisa had been assumed to be a commoner. More often than not, it was due to her very plain looks, for surely a member of the ton could not look as uninviting as she did. She also suspected that her being covered in dirt and walking alone further encouraged his first assumption. Perhaps it was the way that her aunt had spoken to her the night before. It may have been because Lady Louisa felt shame in announcing that she was, in fact, a lady, and should have been escorted but more than likely she was just too embarrassed by her looks to correct the man. Bess, it is just Bess. I am staying at Mentheath House, but I pray you don't inquire. I assure you I am quite well, Lady Louisa said. 
Well, just Bess, the gentleman said with a tip of his hat and a twinkle in his clear emerald green eyes. I am the Duke of Rowland. Please do come and inquire at my estate if you are in any need. I would be happy to oblige. Lady Louisa's mouth opened for just a moment in shock, but she quickly regained her composure. She bowed to the Duke and kept her eyes on the ground. Finally, seeing there was nothing more he could do for the maiden. The Duke of Rowland mounted his steed and returned to his way down the path at a much slower pace. Lady Louisa, on the other hand, stood there for some time, stunned by her action. Not only had she made a fool of herself, she had also lied to the face of a duke. What if he sent someone to inquire about her at Lady Hendrickson's house? How would she explain herself to both the man and her aunt? Lady Louisa was so lost in her thoughts about those last few moments and what consequences might result from them that she hadn't even realised that she had turned the bend and was now following the path out of the forest and into the open air of the village. With the return of the sunshine warming her skin, Lady Louisa let her worries melt away. She couldn't help but feel accomplished as she made her way over the final hills and into the cobbled streets of the village. Here people were busy with their own lives and didn't have time to notice or question her. For someone who consistently remained unnoticed most of her life, she rather found it refreshing. Though it was a country village, it was still much more significant than Lady Louisa had expected. She easily found the central market from the calls of people and animals. Lady Louisa was overjoyed that she had arrived on what seemed to be market day. Lady Louisa spent the late morning and early afternoon slowly perusing the various vendors and wares. As she came to the end of the market, she found a vendor of gardening wares. Mostly it was annual bulbs for ladies to decorate their gardens with, but she did find some good kitchen garden seeds. The vendor was also kind enough to point her in the direction of an apothecary where she might find her other items. As Lady Louisa made her way in that direction, she thought that she had already learned the basic layout of the village. She took note of the fabric and notions store just outside the main market. It was here that Lady Louisa was to pick up the parcels for her aunt. Lady Louisa stopped for a moment to examine the fine dresses and hats that adorned the windows. She decided it must have been quite a skilled seamstress who resided there to make such perfect pleats in the window's dress. It was undoubtedly something that might rival a store in London. Though she didn't want to admit it, a part of her had expected that this county, so far removed from what she had known, would be behind in times and fashion. She was pleasantly surprised to see that up until this moment it was proving to be just as enjoyable as her hometown. Lady Louisa thought back to the letters that she and the Duchess of Wintercrest had exchanged. Though Lady Louisa had done her best to stay positive for her friend, she was sure that her departure would end in a substandard living. Lady Louisa smiled to herself as she thought of those first few letters she had received. The Duchess hadn't been too happy with her distant and lonely situation. Now it had all worked out for her dear friend, and the Duchess rather enjoyed her time in the country surrounded by her family. Lady Louisa had also visited Isabella from time to time. Never having left Wintercrest Manor, Lady Louisa had only assumed that the surrounding towns weren't adequately modern and that the Duchess had merely made do with her surroundings. One day in this small country village had already vastly changed her outlook on life outside London. Up until this time, she had never dreamed of living somewhere else and being as happy as she was at home. This country village seemed to present her with many new possibilities. Chapter 5 Lady Louisa had collected all her necessary gardening products and placed them into a basket on her arm. Things were looking very pleasant until the time came for her to procure the parcels from the seamstress. They were not just a few notions, but actually several ordered dresses. Lady Louisa had no idea how she was meant to get these items home without the use of a carriage. Had she been in London, it would have been easy enough to call a hired coach to take her home. She had a sinking feeling that such a thing wouldn't be possible here. Perhaps it was what her aunt had wanted all along. 
In her current situation, she would have no choice but to return to her aunt's house having failed the task. No doubt Lady Hendrickson would make sure to point out her failure in front of her cousins. Lady Louisa was determined to salvage this task somehow. She asked the seamstress if she had a cart that Lady Louisa might borrow. I am afraid not. Lady Hendrickson purchases items often from my shop, but has never sent Mr. Johnson without his own means of transport, the proprietor responded honestly. Lady Louisa felt no surprise at this point that her errand had been a sham all along. Perhaps there is a public stall that I might rent one from, Lady Louisa asked encouragingly. There is a public stall at the end of this street. It is used more for storage of animals and carts during events such as the market outside. I'm sure it will be brimming with animals and buggies, but you may find someone willing to offer you theirs. Lady Louisa could tell that she was trying to be as helpful as possible. It seemed the circumstances were just not favourable. Perhaps I might go and inquire there first and then come to collect the items. Of course, if that is all right with you. Lady Louisa did feel bad that the owner had just wrapped the packages and they were taking up ample space on her storefront. It will be quite all right. I don't mind keeping them. If you have no luck, I will just retire them to the back until you are able to pick them up at a later day. Lady Hendrickson and her daughters are some of my most frequent customers. It would not do if I couldn't allow a little leeway for them from time to time. I appreciate that, Lady Louisa said making her way out of the dress shop. She found the stalls just at the edge of the village. The barn did seem to be bursting with carts and animals, and she hoped that one might be able to give her the desired help. A small stable boy was leaning against the building, dozing in the warm sunlight as she approached him. Excuse me, could you please help me procure a cart to Menthith House this afternoon? I would be happy to compensate you for the effort, as well as the effort of the driver. Not many would be willing to go down that way, ma'am. Very few live there, and it's awful far, the boy said, scratching his head. Yes, so I've been told, Lady Louisa said, as she irritatedly remembered her encounter with the Duke. Is there something I may assist with? A deep male voice called from behind Lady Louisa. She turned in her spot to find an older gentleman before her. He was dressed finely in a militia red coat and shining black high boots. He was handsome for a man older in years. Lady Louisa surmised that he must have been in his mid-forties by the grey streaks that ran on either side of his dark auburn hair. Yes, Lady Louisa said with a slight bow. I am Lady Louisa visiting with my aunt at Menthith House. I came to town to pick up some parcels and fear that it is much more than I am able to carry on my return trip home. I was hoping to rent a cart. Well, how very fortunate for you. I just came from that direction myself, to acquire some items from the market. I would be happy to escort you back home if you would allow me. How very kind of you. Don't mention it. Colonel Hugh Jasper, at your service, he added with a deep bow and a sincere smile. A half hour later, Lady Louisa was sitting next to the colonel in his country cart, laden with both their items. It was a much more delightful ride back through the forest than the walk in the morning. The sun was just beginning to set, and orange, golden rays found a way to penetrate through the leaves in downward angles. Before, the forest had seemed so terrifying and dark, but now, with her escort at her side, Lady Louisa felt altogether relieved. The colonel was kind enough to make light conversation during the ride. It had to be the first time she had had a friendly conversation that didn't seem filled with the double entendre of her aunt and cousins. You must let me repay you for your service somehow, Lady Louisa said as they came out of the woods and Menthaith House appeared in the distance. I wouldn't think of such a thing. I am duty-bound to help a lady in need. In fact, I was rather glad to have the company. My companion had to leave quite suddenly and return to his estate this morning. Perhaps you would join us for dinner tonight. I'm sure my aunt would welcome the company and would like to thank you herself. Well, I've never been the sort to refuse a meal. I'm new to this county as well, and it might be good for me to make the acquaintance of some of the families here. I am sure that my aunt, Lady Hendrickson, will be the perfect place for you to start. If I remember correctly, 
the late Mr. Hendrickson's family has resided at Menthith House for four generations. Then your aunt should know the area well. I am aiming for a bit of adventure while I am here. Well, both my mother and aunt were raised in this area, though I am not sure if they did much adventuring. Nonetheless, since you have been so kind to ask me to dine, I shan't refuse it. Lady Louisa wasn't sure what bothered her aunt more, that she had in fact completed the task at the dress shop unhindered, or that Lady Louisa had already made an acquaintance that Lady Hendrickson wasn't familiar with beforehand. Colonel Jasper, you say, Miss Elizabeth Hendrickson said, as the three ladies sat around the drawing room, not doing anything in particular, when Lady Louisa arrived home. Yes, he was very kind to me. As I said, I invited him to dine with us. I suspected you yourself would have done the same, Lady Hendrickson. He is currently in the library awaiting an introduction. A colonel, mother. I bet he is unattached too, Miss Hendrickson stated with excitement in her eyes. Remember yourself, Elizabeth, her mother chastised. Lady Louisa had thought it was to teach the girl some propriety and decorum. Certainly, she was only two years younger than Lady Louisa, and should have known that giggling excitedly at the prospect of a suitor was unbecoming. We have our eyes set on a much better target, Lady Hendrickson finished. She didn't want to say anything more on the matter in front of present company, and Lady Louisa did her best not to be offended by this. Miss Mary also seemed to be quiet and reserved on this, and just about every other matter. Lady Louisa found a bit of a kindred spirit in her ability to hold her thoughts close to her heart. Seeing that there were no further objections to the colonel staying for dinner, Lady Louisa asked Bess, who was waiting just outside the drawing room door, to show him in. Colonel Jasper was very friendly with the present company and seemed to know how to keep the conversation moving along smoothly. I was not aware that a regiment was in the area, Lady Hendrickson said over dinner. I am not here with the regiment, but rather on a bit of a sabbatical. Oh, are you visiting with family then? Perhaps we know them, Lady Hendrickson continued. Actually, my parents died when I was young, ma'am. There was another gent in a situation similar to mine at boarding school. We became good friends, the two of us. He has been out of the country for some time, but he recently came back. He and his uncle have been my family, so it only seemed right that I take a holiday and help him acclimate back to normal life. Acclimate? If I may ask, was your friend fighting in the war? Lady Louisa asked, thinking of her brother and the struggles he had after his time in the war. No, nothing like that. Actually, he was travelling the various regions of the Empire. You would have to ask him which ones. They're far too many for me to remember. I believe the last was the Indies, though. Forgive my asking, Miss Mary said, but perchance is your friend Henry Vaughan, the Duke of Rowland. Miss Mary received a sharp look from her mother and then darted a look at Lady Louisa. It seemed that her aunt had no desire in telling her that the Duke was present in the area. Little did she know that Lady Louisa had already, quite literally, run into him. Why, yes it is, the Colonel said with a light to his face. Rowland hadn't been able to leave his estate for some time. He took a little ill with the change of climate. I believe he only left Basson today. News must travel fast here in the Lake District. You would be surprised how fast, Miss Hendrickson said, as she too gave her sister an irritated stare. Well, I should suspect with two unattached females in the house, news of an eligible duke in the vicinity wouldn't go unnoticed, he added in the direction of Lady Hendrickson. Lady Louisa decided that she liked Colonel Jasper very much. However, she was a little concerned that he was in close contact with the Duke of Rowland, a man with whom she had not only had a very embarrassing first meeting, but to whom she had also given a false name. What would happen when Colonel Jasper returned to his friend's house tonight and informed him of all the day's happenings? Surely the Duke would not believe someone was visiting an aunt in service at the house, while at the same time a niece of the house's lady was also visiting. She wondered if perhaps she should tell the colonel all that had transpired. Though he was thin of frame, he was undoubtedly the jolly sort and might in fact find humour in her tale. She looked between her aunt and cousins. 
Clearly the Duke of Rowland was the man alluded to earlier. Why Lady Hendrickson had hoped to keep it a secret from her was a mystery. Certainly a peerage member so close to her own family seat would mean there had to be connections between the two families. It would be to Lady Hendrickson's benefit to use her link. It would be even more beneficial if she was, in fact, hoping to make a connection herself between the Duke and one of her daughters, as the case seemed to be. But then Lady Louisa remembered how much jealousy and hatred her aunt felt towards her parents' alliance. Perchance it was in that spirit that her aunt hoped to shield Lady Louisa from all these doings. In that way, she could say that the deed was done without using the influence of Lady Louisa's family name. She decided at that moment not to speak of the matter to the colonel or find cause to meet with the duke at all, for inevitably he would ask of her family and thereby gain that connection. Instead, she would do as her aunt wished and help in any way possible, even if that meant staying quietly at the side. For a moment, Lady Louisa smiled at that thought. It was surely the first time in her life that being a wallflower might have its benefits. Chapter 6 The following day, Lady Louisa spent her time under the warm sunshine as she prepared and planted the garden. She found it to be a most enjoyable task. She couldn't believe how invigorating and enjoyable the country air could be. Even more enjoyable was the fact that she wasn't alone in her task. To her great surprise when she announced that she planned to plant the garden that morning, Miss Mary had asked to join her. Though neither one was prone to much speaking, it was an enjoyable day spent working alongside each other. My father used to keep the garden, Miss Mary said after a time. Since he took ill a few years back, it just sat barren. It was such a sad sight to me. I believe Bess told me some of that. I am very sorry for your loss, Lady Louisa responded. Did you ever spend time here with him then? Lady Louisa continued, hoping to bring up happy memories for her cousin. If she had learned one thing from the death of her father, it was that forgetting was not the remedy. So often when a loved one was lost, remaining family members would do all they could to forget the unhappy circumstances that led to their death. This would often result in the removal of anything that might remind one of the deceased person. In the end, all memories, both happy and sad, would be lost to them. Then all that would be left would be that empty, sorrowful feeling of loss. It was far better to suffer through the bad memories in order to hold on to the good. Only then could the pain lessen over time. Though Lady Louisa was sure that it would never go away completely, it certainly would be bearable. No, Mother never thought it quite proper for my sister or me to be out in the garden. She said it was servant work. I am actually a little surprised she didn't object this morning. Perhaps she changed her mind, or perhaps she hoped to see the beauty of the gardens again as well. I can't imagine the latter. Mother would be so cross with father when he was out here in the gardens. She would always comment how anyone could see him, and it was so unbecoming of a gentleman to do such work. My father, though, Miss Mary said, rising and wiping her cheek with a dirty glove, he would always say his father and grandfather and great-grandfather all stood on this same spot and dug around the same lettuce. He would not break such a tradition. Lady Louisa smiled as Miss Mary recounted the memory. For a moment, she let her cousin drift off to another time before she shrugged and went back to the work of removing deep-rooted weeds. He sounds like a very determined man. I wish I could have been lucky enough to have met him, Lady Louisa said before returning to her own particularly stubborn weed. Would you tell me more about him? Miss Mary paused for just a second. It's funny. Mother barely liked the subject of him while he was with us. Since his departure from this world, I honestly thought she would be happier. She speaks of him even less, however, and seems even more sullen. I'm sorry to hear that, Lady Louisa said truthfully. She had heard from her own mother that her aunt and uncle's relationship was strained over time. It must have been a terrible thing for her aunt to choose love and then lose it in the end. In truth, Lady Louisa wondered if it was her own aunt's pride and jealousy that had not only severed the ties with her sister, 
but with her husband as well. I, however, would be more than happy to speak about him, Miss Mary said with a little spunk. The two ladies spent the remainder of the afternoon covered in dirt, swapping stories of both their now-gone fathers. It was a most pleasant and therapeutic experience for the both of them. My word, said a deep voice coming from around the house and walking along the white picket fence that encased the two garden plots. Lady Louisa and Miss Mary turned to find Colonel Jasper watching them with a teasing gleam in his eyes. Lady Hendrickson informed me that I might find you two out in the garden. I had no idea she meant that you would be more covered in dirt than the last time we met, he continued. Both ladies quickly stood up, a little embarrassed at the current status of their stained hems. Miss Mary even had a smudge of dirt on her cheek from where she had wiped at it earlier. I can safely say neither one of us was expecting company in our present condition, Lady Louisa replied as she tipped back her sunbonnet and removed her gardening gloves. Miss Mary was nervously doing the same. Though she did do her best to brush the dirt off of her apron, she still wasn't aware of the offending smudge on her now rosy cheeks. Though Miss Mary was no match for her older sister's beauty, she was very pretty in her own way. Even with the heat of the day on her face and the strenuous work deflating the curls of her golden hair, she still outshone Louisa in looks. Well, I do beg pardon for the intrusion, Colonel Jasper said with a bow. Roland was most anxious to meet the family I spoke so highly of all night long upon my return. I dare say members here shared the same sentiment, he added with a wink. I would be more than happy to introduce you two ladies as well. I thank you. Lady Louisa said quickly, remembering the promise to herself to give her cousin space on this matter. But I am sure another opportunity will arise. Hopefully, at that time, I will be more properly dressed for it, she added with a cool smile. Of course. Well, I'm not offended by your hard work. Perhaps you wouldn't mind showing me around the outside grounds while the others speak inside. It is far too fine a day to waste it, Colonel Jasper said. Lady Louisa looked to Miss Mary, waiting for her to respond. It didn't seem that Miss Mary was used to making such decisions, so instead, Lady Louisa made it for both of them. We would both be delighted to, though I will have to defer all leading and talking to my cousin, as I know the land no better than yourself. Miss Mary was happy to lead them both around the grounds and show the various highlights. At first she was very timid. Colonel Jasper would ask her little encouraging questions all the while, however, and soon Miss Mary needed no prompting in the discussion. By the time the sun was starting to set in earnest, Lady Louisa couldn't help but hold back from the party with a smile as the two in front of her engaged in conversation. Both were enthralled with the current discussion of prevalent wildflowers versus ones planted in gardens. I don't think there is anything more wonderful than to walk down a path and come upon a meadow of freshly bloomed wildflowers, the colonel debated. Although such a thing is a beautiful sight, I would have to argue that one can find more happiness in a bloom of their own doing. In fact, my father used to say that it was the toiling and hard labour put into a plant that made its fragrance so sweet. What a lovely sentiment, Colonel Jasper said, with his eyes lowered down to Miss Mary, one that is truly hard to argue with. Lady Louisa had never expected her cousin to have such an interest in the outdoors before this day's interaction. Now she had a feeling that Miss Mary had a great many interests that she kept hidden away at Lady Hendrickson's request. Pray tell, what lovely flowers will waft their wonderful aromas from your labours today? None really, Miss Mary confessed. I have only planted lettuce and root vegetables. My cousin, Lady Louisa, was the one to plant the herbs and medicinal plants. I suspect they will create a much better sight to behold. Both pairs of eyes turned to Lady Louisa, as if they had remembered her presence for the first time. Rather than being upset that she had been forgotten, Lady Louisa rather liked how well the two were getting along. I suppose the only fragrance of pleasure from the medicinal garden would be the lavender and rose hips, Lady Louisa supplied to their questioning looks. Both lovely choices for growing and usage, I must say, Colonel Jasper said, 
making sure to include her in the conversation again. Lady Louisa couldn't help but notice that there had to be almost twenty years separating her young cousin and the colonel, but the two seemed quite well matched. She had never considered herself to be a matchmaker, but in this instance she might make an exception. The two seemed to make a very handsome couple. Why did you two never come in? Miss Hendrickson said that night over their family meal. I expected that once Colonel Jasper had informed you of our guest, you would have come straight away to meet the Duke. We were not presentable after a day of working in the garden, Miss Mary stated, merely not wanting to say more on the matter. Then what were you two up to? Lady Hendrickson said, with a narrowing of her eyes. Colonel Jasper expressed a desire to know more of the area, so we took a turn with him around the gardens and property, Lady Louisa responded. You two would rather walk around outside with an old man than meet the very eligible Duke of Rowland, Miss Hendrickson scoffed. You really are dull of mind, Mary. No matter, I had no problem keeping the Duke entertained all on my own, she added, with her head held high. Even Lady Hendrickson beamed with pride at this. Though it was all meant as hurtful comments towards her and Miss Mary, Lady Louisa couldn't help but be at least satisfied in doing what she suspected her aunt and cousin had wanted of her. Louisa, Lady Hendrickson said, I was wondering if you would be so kind as to help Bess tomorrow with the mending. Of course, Lady Hendrickson, Lady Louisa said. And then there are the new dresses that need to be tried and fitted before the mending. I am sure you are more than skilled in such work. It would be a shame not to make use of your expertise on the matter. I would be happy to help. Wonderful, dear, Lady Hendrickson said in a dismissive tone. Lady Louisa was beginning to feel that every day of her visit would be filled with such tasks from her aunt. Chapter 7 Lady Louisa wasn't surprised when the following week she was once again asked to go to the market on foot. At least this time she was not alone as Bess was at her side. Lady Hendrickson insisted that Lady Louisa accompany the maid as she made her monthly walk to town to sell butter at the market. Lady Louisa didn't mind the task as she rather enjoyed the morning talks with her maid and expected her day trip to be no less enjoyable. Lady Louisa was also looking forward to the chance to have another look at all the stalls on market day. As they walked, Lady Louisa learned how each morning and evening the milk was collected from three cows that permanently resided in the barn. Then Bess, as well as the other maids, would let the cream separate and then turn it into butter. Each pat of butter was salted and moulded by decorative wooden moulds with various flower motifs on top. Once prepared, they were then wrapped in cheesecloth and placed in the root cellar until their designated market day each month. Mr Johnson, who was normally somewhat dishevelled from his hard labour around the estate, was dressed in his Sunday best that morning as he took the rest of the goods into town in a cart. The butter needed to wait until later in the day when the height of commerce began. In that way it wouldn't spoil or melt in the heat of the sun. People come from far off villages, my lady, just for this butter here. In fact, I was even told that the Duke himself has had it on his table since he arrived. May I ask what makes yours so unique? Lady Louisa questioned as they made their slow stroll through the tree-covered forest. Some say it's just because it is pretty. Others will tell that it's on account of the feed the cows get. See, we don't let them graze willy-nilly as most other folks do. The milk can change in taste by what she's been eating. Our girls get only sweet barley from our very own fields. How interesting, Lady Louisa said. She could tell by the way Bess had her chin held high and was also wearing her Sunday best that this was a production of love and pride. She suspected that Bess was about Miss Mary's age and showed the signs of her youthful vigour as they trudged along on the path. Even her brown hair seemed to gleam in the light breaking through the trees as if it had its own supply of energy. Lady Louisa looked up her nose at her own grey-blonde hair that was placed so perfectly onto her head with delicate ringlets framing her face. How she wished her own hair glowed and emanated light as did Bess's. She couldn't help but think at that moment, with Bess in her finest and her in a walking dress, it much rather looked like she was the lady's maid and Bess was the lady. She shook the thought out of her head. 
It was an awfully silly thing to think that clothes alone could determine one's status from the outside. Bess might be a commoner, but from her looks and high-held head that day, she could have been the Queen of England herself. I suspect I will have to sneak a small amount on a biscuit before the day is out to decide if the superior taste agrees with me, Lady Louisa finally said in a joking manner. Bye, my lady. You've had it all these days with meals. Tis the same we serve in the house. I know, but I didn't realise its importance then and took it for granted. I will have to try it again with this new knowledge, for certainly that will make a difference. Both girls continued such conversation as they made their way through the forest and into the village. Lady Louisa found the trip to be most enjoyable and spent the whole of the day there with Bess. Much to her surprise, people seemed to flock to their stall as soon as they arrived with their baskets of butter. Some had even been waiting the whole of the morning with one eye on the stall for Bess's appearance. It was strange for Lady Louisa to see that just about everyone knew each other by name. Indeed, in London, there would be specific markets or even stalls and shops that might be favoured, but rarely did a proprietor know the name of every single customer that walked through the door. This seemed to be the case of this small village. With each client that came to the stall, either Mr Johnson or Bess spoke a few words with them. Often inquiries were made about family members and gossip was exchanged. Lady Louisa enjoyed watching and taking in all the close familiarities. It was unquestionably much friendlier than things back home. She was surprised when the conversation turned to her. Lady Louisa, a voice called and waved at her from the other end of the stall. It quite startled her since she hadn't expected to know anyone here. Yes, that is me, she said a bit shyly. I thought I recognised you, the portly older man said, coming to her side. I dare say you don't remember me. I do apologise for that, Lady Louisa said as she searched her memory for any past encounter with this man. I am Mr Henderson, your brother's solicitor. Oh yes, of course, Lady Louisa, now having put a name to the face, remembered him. He had dined with her family on two separate occasions while her brother prepared for his journey to America. I never imagined meeting you here, he said with a jolly laugh. Nor I you, Lady Louisa agreed. I am here visiting my mother's sister. Ah, yes, Lady Hendrickson. No relation to me, I'm afraid, he added with a wink and a twitch of his nose, though I did know her late husband well. You did, Lady Louisa said, surprised. Ah, yes, Mr Henderson said, leaning back. Come and let us have some luncheon together, and I will tell you all about it. Louisa had to agree she was beginning to feel quite hungry after the long walk and the day's efforts. She couldn't imagine a better companion than this jolly gentleman who might just shed a little more light on her aunt's situation. I would appreciate that very much, Lady Louisa agreed, coming from behind the stall and taking the solicitor's arm. They walked a short distance down the lane and arrived at a rather quaint-looking tavern. Inside, it was just as simple and small as it looked from the outside. Mr Henderson explained that it was the only establishment without a bar present thereby making it the only appropriate one. He assured her the tea was always fresh and the biscuits and iced rolls that accompanied it came from the fine bakery next door. Have you known my aunt and her family long? Lady Louisa asked after they were both comfortably seated at a wooden table next to the still cool hearth. Their seats did, however, have the only view out the sole window. Lady Louisa was thankful for the rays of light it allowed in and warmed her with. I grew up here, same as Billy, Mr. Henderson said. Billy? Oh, Mr. Hendrickson, in fact, I knew your mother and aunt as well, since they didn't live too far from this place. In fact, both regularly came to the village on market day to see the wares. I think it was also to do a little socialising with us regular folk as well. I had no idea, Lady Louisa said, leaning forward, enthralled with his tale. I knew my father's county seat is not far away, but since I myself never spent much time in the country, I had no knowledge of my mother's childhood in this area. Oh yes, she was a wonderful lady. My parents owned some fields on her father's land. 
When I showed great marks in school, your grandfather paid for my further education. He was a wonderful man. I unfortunately never met my grandfather, though my mother spoke of him often. Yes, he was a good man. Though, he added with a shadow coming over his face, I suspect Lady Hendrickson doesn't share that sentiment. Yes, Lady Louisa said, a little embarrassed for her aunt that this man seemed to know her business. I know she didn't feel she was justly treated upon his death. The man shrugged as if this was common knowledge. Lady Louisa thought back to her morning in the market and then suspected it, in fact, was common knowledge. But she married for love and there must be solace in that happiness, Lady Louisa said, always looking for the silver lining. Perhaps, Mr Henderson said, and Lady Louisa guessed he knew how unhappy the relationship had become over time. If you wouldn't mind, Lady Louisa shifted the topic. I wonder if you could provide me with some information about my late uncle. I never had a chance to meet him myself, you see. Miss Mary has shared some things, but I fear it is still fresh and painful for the whole household. He was a good friend of mine growing up, Mr Henderson said, happy to talk about past memories. We went to grammar school together. I can't say he was as good as me he added with another teasing wink. He was, however, a dashingly handsome man, the solicitor continued. All the girls had their eyes on him. It was no surprise that your aunt gravitated to him time and time again, not only when their father would allow them to the market, but also every Sunday after the parish service. I honestly can't say I was surprised to hear they eloped. Everyone knew she was promised to the Earl and that she had eyes for Billy, he continued as he thought back on the memories. I suppose we all thought it a win for love and all that. But it wasn't, Lady Louisa asked. Well, I think at first they were very happy. Even when your mother and father married, it made no matter to your aunt, for she had her own happiness. I think over time, however, the magic of new love wears off and your aunt missed the life she had once been accustomed to. I only knew about your grandfather's decision to remove her from his will, because your mother had been kind enough to recommend me as solicitor to your father. It was a very ironic situation. In what way? Lady Louisa asked. Well, your aunt married for love and happiness, and in the end I dare say she didn't have much of either. Your parents, on the other hand, from the outside at least, married for family connections. I don't know that I ever saw a couple more in love or happier with each other all the way to the end. Lady Louisa smiled with glistening tears as she too thought of the happy memories she shared with her parents. They had loved each other dearly. Her father had been such a happy man and always seemed to light up every room he entered with his teasing mannerisms. There is no use dwelling on the past, though, he said, wiping his nose with a handkerchief. Tell me how your brother is finding America. Lady Louisa quickly brushed her own tears away and relaxed into a smile at the change of conversation. As well as can be, we have only received three letters from him so far. Perhaps Mother has received another since my departure from London. They are both doing very well. The baby is a healthy boy. They only wait now for the child to grow a bit more before they can bring him across the sea. How wonderful, Mr Henderson agreed. I had heard some news in a letter from the Earl that they planned to extend their stay due to his wife's condition. I am glad it worked out well. I won't be surprised if they decide to stay there forever. Virginia is a beautiful country. You really think they might? Lady Louisa said, shocked as the idea came to her for the first time since their departure. It was true that when Colton had first told her of his plans to journey to the property in the Americas, Lady Louisa thought her brother might leave and never return this time. After he acquired his beautiful bride before he left, however, Lady Louisa did not doubt that at least Abigail would have the desire to return. But now that she thought the matter over truly, she considered Abigail's own free spirit. Perhaps the two of them would love the new land so much they would have no desire to leave. Would she never set eyes on her dear brother or his family again? I don't see why they wouldn't, Mr. Henderson said. It is a fine estate. You must go and visit them sometime. Had I not gotten so old so quickly, 
I would have tried to make a last go at it and stay there permanently myself. What an interesting idea, Lady Louisa said politely while she inwardly felt herself twist in turmoil. Chapter 8 Lady Louisa thought on the solicitor's words as she walked quietly back down the path with Bess and towards home. She couldn't help but feel a deep rock in the pit of her stomach. Of course, she knew her brother would marry one day, start a family of his own, and in essence have a life of his own. She had never thought to be separated from him by a whole ocean. She had been so close to him as children and up until his time in the regulars. She had wished so dearly for that relationship to restart after his return. When Colton struggled so with readjusting to society with his injuries, she feared she had lost him altogether. A newfound hope had grown with his love for Abigail. With her, Colton was able to be a bit of himself again. Lady Louisa had seen the change over their time spent together. She was sure she would again have that close friend and brother she had grown up with. Now, they were gone, and quite possibly permanently. It made Lady Louisa feel so utterly alone in the world. A part of her always knew something like this would happen. First, it was her best friend Isabella. Now it seemed that Colton was out of her life too. Though Lady Louisa and Isabella still wrote and kept in touch, things were different now. After all, she had a growing family to take care of. Now her brother had gone so far away from her that even written correspondence wasn't a very reliable tool. She had accepted the fact that she was not one to find a match of her own. She didn't have the looks or personality to stand out in the eyes of any suitor of the ton. She had never minded that, believing that she would always have her family around her. That no longer seemed as sure a possibility as she once thought. What would she do if she found herself without family? Naturally, her mother wouldn't be around forever. Isabella would be happy to take her in. But would she ask that burden of a friend? Life seemed to be getting increasingly dreary with every step she took. So lost in her thoughts, Lady Louisa didn't hear the sound of a carriage coming. It was only when Bess grabbed her arm and yanked her to the side that she was awakened from her thoughts. A basket gig with a single rider was coming down the lane. Lady Louisa looked up in time to see the rider, and her heart sank even farther. It was clear he was also coming to a stop. We have to stop meeting like this, Miss Bess, the Duke said, parking his gig on the side of the road and coming down to greet the two ladies. First Bess, at Lady Louisa's side, looked very confused, having never met the man in the first place, let alone along a roadside. Luckily, Lady Louisa had the sense to intercede before anything could be said on the matter. Your Grace, I must confess that last week when we met on the road, I was a bit frazzled and may not have given you accurate information, Lady Louisa said, doing her best to hide her embarrassment over the fact. I'm not sure I understand, the Duke said with a furrow of his black brows as he looked between the two ladies. Well, it's very hard to explain, Lady Louisa said with a nervous laugh. I was just so flustered. I might not have actually given you my name. I'm visiting my aunt, but when you made assumptions about my status, I didn't want to be rude and correct them, so I gave you my lady's maid's Christian name. Lady Louisa did her best to explain as she motioned over to Bess next to her. He looked between the two for the briefest of moments. Lady Louisa would have rather buried herself in the ground right there at the edge of the road than have to explain her silly action to the man. That does make some sense then, he finally said, rubbing his hand along his chin as he thought it over. Lady Louisa looked up at him in utter surprise at his words. She was caught in the deep green of his eyes. When I came to call on Lady Hendrickson, she mentioned a niece visiting. I couldn't believe that both the lady of the house and one of the household could have a visiting relative at the same time. You must beg my pardon, Your Grace, Lady Louisa said. I didn't mean to confuse you. I was just startled at our last meeting. Well, it is as much my fault as yours. In fact, you must allow me to beg your pardon again for last we met on this road. It was a rakish thing for me to do, running you out of the lane. Perhaps I might make it up to you by offering you and Miss Bess, he said, motioning to Lady Louisa's company, 
a ride for the remainder of the trip home. That is very kind, Your Grace. Normally I would respectfully decline, but since we are coming on late in the day, it might be nice to hurry our way home. Both ladies climbed into the back of the basket and seated themselves while the Duke took his place at the reins again. It was a small gig and had scarcely enough room for the three to avoid touching each other in such close quarters. The Duke was sure, however, to make the ride as slow and smooth as possible on a dirt road. While they started their journey, Lady Louisa wondered how her aunt and cousin would feel about her arrival in the Duke's gig. It was not what they would want, and went against her promise to help them. On the other hand, the man had considered her a servant at first. Plainly, her cousin would see no threat in her. If anything, Lady Louisa could use the opportunity to gain stronger ties between the Duke and Mentheith House, thereby increasing her cousin's chances. My aunt told me that you have spent many years abroad, Lady Louisa asked. Yes, he responded as he kept his hands steady on the reins. For the most part, I was in the Indies. It must have been very exotic, Lady Louisa commented as she studied his still bronzed stature. I have to say I did enjoy it greatly. I rather thought of it as home. I've only returned upon my uncle's request. I dare say he didn't love the land as much as I did, and was insistent we both return. How very unfortunate for you, though. Do you plan to return to the Indies? I suppose it would all depend. Depend on what, Your Grace? Lady Louisa asked, not understanding. Well... Surely you know why my uncle convinced me to return. I suspect the whole county has talked over the matter. I'm in want of a wife, apparently. I would assume it is because my own parents were only five years past my current age when they departed from this world. It has caused my uncle to pressure me into producing an heir. Oh, I see, Lady Louisa said, trying not to blush at the intimate conversation. Though if the whole county knew this fact, perhaps it wasn't that intimate at all. So, it will depend on my wife and her willingness to travel to the Indies or be left behind, I suppose. You don't seem too happy about it, Your Grace. Though I'm not an expert on the matter. Only knowing what I have seen of the season in London, most find their years of courtship and searching for a match very exciting. No, I must confess I am not thrilled on the matter at all, the Duke agreed. It's a very wasteful use of time, if you ask me. If I were to meet a match in life, I would not be opposed to it, but I don't currently find myself in need of a female companion. Now I feel as if I am the one being hunted rather than on the hunt myself. Well, I cannot deny the truth of that statement, Your Grace, Lady Louisa agreed. You are a single, able-bodied, high-titled gentleman. I expect you will get more than your fair share of mothers inflicting their daughters upon you. And what of you, Lady Louisa? the Duke asked, turning to face her head on as they started to clear the woods. Should I expect your mother shoving you my way? Should I prepare now for your impending hunt? No, not at all, Lady Louisa responded quickly. She saw his shocked look. Though, of course, he wouldn't expect her to agree with his teasing. Obviously, a fast and loud denial wasn't what he had in mind either. I only mean, Your Grace. Lady Louisa quickly corrected, that I am sure you have many fine choices already before you. It wouldn't even be worth throwing my number in the hat. Plus, my mother has chosen to stay behind in London, so I am without a matriarch to encourage me to do so. Well, there is always Lady Hendrickson, the Duke responded as he turned back to the road, satisfied with her explanation. I believe she is primed and ready for the task. With two single daughters of her own, I suspect my aunt will have ample choices to steer you into her grasp, Lady Louisa said back in teasing fashion. Rightly so. Perhaps, though, the Duke asked as a thought came to his mind, perhaps I could turn to you for rescue when the lioness seems too much. After all, you have proclaimed no interest in me. If you were willing, I would be most grateful if I could take refuge behind you from time to time, Roland said with a sideways wink. Lady Louisa seemed to consider this for a moment. She wasn't sure how happy her aunt would be if the Duke turned to her for a confiding friendship during his time looking for a wife. That being said, it was also a more significant connection to be used for her cousins.
perhaps she could use her influence on the Duke to direct him in the right path. Her head seemed to rattle with the wheels of the gig as she let these thoughts turn in her mind. It was so difficult to build plots for connections when it was not in her nature at all. She truly was not the matchmaker at heart, finding these games all too much for her taste. Nonetheless, she would do whatever seemed right to see to her aunt's happiness. If she were to influence the Duke towards them, her aunt might then forgive the rift in the family and let bygones be bygones. I didn't mean to embarrass you or impose, the Duke said after a few moments passed without Lady Louisa answering. No, not at all. I would be happy to help your grace, in any way possible. I must admit my mother was rather hopeful that I find a gentleman who would be interested in me. I would be happy to allow you to, how did you say it? Take refuge behind me in order to protect you from the matriarchs if you don't mind me writing to my mother and telling her that I have had conversations with the Duke of Rowland. Well, it seems to be the perfect situation for both of us then, Rowland said, much satisfied with his new acquaintance. Chapter 9 Was that the Duke of Rowland I saw? Miss Hendrickson said with her eyes narrowed on Lady Louisa. Lady Louisa had barely said goodbye to the gentleman and walked in the door before her cousin pounced on her. Lady Louisa suspected from her entrance into the foyer that she had come from the drawing room. It had a rather large window that opened to the front garden and with that a perfect view of the road and any who might ride on it. Why, yes, it was, Lady Louisa said calmly as she ignored her cousin's dagger stare. He was on his way home from the market and came upon Bess and me. He was most gracious to offer us a ride home. Lady Louisa delicately removed her walking gloves and bonnet and gave them, along with her basket, to the waiting Bess. Well, what did he say? Did he speak of me? Miss Hendrickson said with her hands on her narrow hips. We spoke about many things, Lady Louisa answered, not wanting to specifically say how the Duke had detested the idea of ladies flocking around him in hopes to snag a marriage contract. Don't be so forthcoming all at once, Miss Hendrickson said with a flick of her chestnut hair before turning and entering the drawing room. Lady Louisa had rather hoped to retire upstairs and freshen up some after the day's events. She knew dinner would be served soon and was so used to the custom of dressing for it. It was more than habit that caused her to want to retreat to her room. She was still in her walking dress and rather unclean from the day's journey. She could only imagine the state of her chignon as she could already see the small grey blonde ringlets that had once encircled her face now, just laying long and limp along either side of her cheeks. Louisa, her aunt called from the drawing room, Louisa, come here right now. Lady Louisa did her best to ignore her aunt's tone or the way she called her so informally when Louisa was technically her superior. Yes, Aunt Sarah. Lady Louisa said, making a point with her own informality. Lady Hendrickson, if you please, her aunt said hurriedly as she waved her fan before her. Elizabeth tells me it was the Duke that gave you a ride home. Yes, Lady Louisa said. Most times Lady Louisa could have been said to have ample amounts of kindness and charity towards others, no matter their own manner of treatment to her. At this particular moment that was not the case. Lady Louisa was tired hungry and worn from the day's journey. Lady Louisa took a seat in an embroidered high-backed chair, seeing that she would not get the luxury of retiring to her room before dinner. She looked around the room, waiting for what was to come. All three ladies seemed to be seated comfortably in the drawing room and, from the state of dishevelled ribbons, tea dishes and books, Lady Louisa didn't expect they had left since she saw them this morning. Lady Hendrickson was still garbed all in black, though Lady Louisa noticed it was the new dress she had just carted from town. Unlike most in mourning who wore simple black frocks, Lady Hendrickson had chosen a current style cut with a high empire waist, capped sleeves, and a black lace trim around the edges that matched the one on her black sheen mourning cap. Both Miss Elizabeth and Miss Mary were also wearing their new dresses. Lady Louisa knew these very well as she was the one to hem the bottoms over the last week. She had had a terrible time with Miss Elizabeth, 
who had opted for a dress with a pleated back to her skirt. Though they were both cotton dresses used for morning and day wear, as was their mother's, both were done with intricate detail. Miss Elizabeth had chosen a garment in the most exquisite cream, with blue corn stripes running down the length of it. It did wonders to accentuate her long, perfectly shaped form and make her brown curls and cream skin beam against the lightness of the colour. Miss Mary, on the other hand, chose a lemon-yellow dress with a simple large pink silken ribbon at her waist. Unlike her sister, who sought contrasting colours, Miss Mary's dress colour perfectly complemented her warm skin and hair. Lady Louisa looked down at her hands folded in her own walking dress. Though it wasn't threadbare and not too terribly stained at the hem, it was still plain, with a matching Spencer jacket in the colour of a hen's rustic feathers. Suddenly seeming completely outshined by every other member of this room, Lady Louisa lost all nerve to speak boldly to her aunt. Lady Hendrickson seemed to see the defeat for her satisfaction reflected in her blue eyes. She held her chin up high and snapped her fan promptly shut. Well then, out with it. We must know every word spoken between you and the Duke. I don't want him surprising us with some conversation you had on our part or worse, words you may have offended him with. I am quite able to hold a civilised conversation, Lady Louisa said reassuringly. When she saw that this was not satisfying enough, she did her best to retell the short ride home in the Duke's presence. She made sure to skim over any information her aunt and cousins might not be particularly happy to hear. So the Duke is feeling the pressure of making a match, Lady Hendrickson said to her daughters when the narration was over. That means there are several other ladies already making their move. No doubt you have higher precedence over any commoner in the area, she said, waving away the idea like it was an irritating insect. However, several lesser peerages may find a reason to settle in nearby residences for the opportunity to secure his hand. She looked between her two daughters, who were both listening intently. Lady Louisa suspected that such educational lessons from their mother were a frequent occurrence. What do you propose we do, mother? Miss Hendrickson said, sitting at the edge of her seat. She was far beyond ready to do anything that her mother might deem necessary to attain the goal set before her. Lady Louisa saw her hungry eyes and thought that setting up such a man with her cousin might not entirely be in his interest. Had she not just promised the Duke to do what was possible to help him separate the wheat from the chaff? She honestly felt no loyalty to an aunt who had continually shown her contempt during her presence. But she did have a responsibility to her mother. The Dowager Countess was desperate for some kind of reconciliation with her sister. Her mother knew it would very likely not happen at her hand, but at Lady Louisa's. For the second time that day, she felt racked with turmoil. Well, it is good that he came here of his own accord the other day, Lady Hendrickson said with a wink and a knowing wag of her fingers. We have made connections to those close to him, this Colonel Jasper. Lady Hendrickson stood and paced the room while she thought the matter over. I am told he lives with a single uncle as well. I believe it was his father's younger brother. Yes, Lady Louisa chimed in. His grace told me how his uncle raised him after his parents' untimely death. All parties in the room seemed to ignore her helpful comment except for Miss Mary, who gave her a sideways glance and a half-smile. Any interaction between the two of them at this time was wholly disregarded, as the other two were bent on their scheming. It wouldn't be unwise to continue to cultivate this friendship with this colonel and the uncle, Lady Hendrickson said as her mind was made up, though she waved off their names as if they mattered little. There is the public ball tomorrow, Miss Elizabeth chimed in. She had sat bolt upright in the excitement of the idea, but then quickly looked over at Lady Louisa, as if she had not meant to speak of such things in her presence. Contrary to what Miss Elizabeth thought, Lady Louisa was aware of the event. At least every person who came to the market stall that day had spoken excitedly of it. Lady Louisa had been a bit surprised not to hear of it from her own aunt and relations. Certainly social events were not as common as they were in her hometown, and each one would be a wonderful opportunity. 
Lady Louisa had finally surmised that perhaps her aunt was refusing the attendance of such gay events on account of her mourning. Naturally, the Duke would not attend such an event, Lady Hendrickson spoke as she put the plan together. But no doubt at least the Colonel will. It would be a ripe opportunity to suggest a more intimate setting in which we may get Elizabeth closer to the Duke's acquaintance. I would be more than happy to suggest a family dinner with the Colonel, and of course the rest of his party should we find ourselves on the dance floor together tomorrow evening, Miss Elizabeth said with all the charm of a snake. The only thing that Lady Louisa detested more than the prideful air of her cousin's speech was the sorrowful effect it had on Miss Mary. Miss Elizabeth undoubtedly expected to be the belle of the ball, and able to get any gentleman to agree to any suggestion she made. Why she had fixed her eyes on the man with whom Miss Mary had shared a most wonderful afternoon was beyond Lady Louisa's comprehension. But then she didn't have a sister of her own, and perhaps it was the natural course of sibling rivalry. Splendid, Lady Hendrickson said with a clap of her laced hands. You will encourage the Colonel to join us for a family meal. Oh, let us make it a picnic. They are quite fashionable these days. Then, Lady Hendrickson continued, they will have no choice but to section off the whole of a day to our family. The Duke will scarcely forget my daughters after a whole afternoon in your presence, she said, looking first at Elizabeth, then at Mary. Oh, I do hope you won't be so sullen, Mary. You always look like you are about to cry out of those do eyes. Do try and appear happy, her mother scolded her. Lady Louisa looked over at Miss Mary, who did look like she was about to cry. Lady Louisa wasn't sure if it was just her delicate nature or the fact that her sister had just announced her intention to set herself on Colonel Jasper. We will need new dresses for the event, Lady Hendrickson announced with a nod of her head. But surely that won't be possible by tomorrow night, Lady Louisa said aloud. Her aunt's eyes fell on her as if she had altogether forgotten her niece was still present in the room. For the picnic, of course, Lady Hendrickson responded, as if Lady Louisa's misunderstanding was just ridiculous. Blue for you, of course, Elizabeth. It is a most becoming colour on you, Lady Hendrickson began to list off more to herself. And I suppose Mary shall get one in rose. Perhaps that will bring some cheer to your face. I will get one too. She looked down at her newly made black gown. Such a shame to still have to wear such a colour. Lady Louisa was utterly shocked at her words. Surely, whether there was affection in the marriage or not, to speak so disrespectfully of one's mourning was more than Lady Louisa had ever heard. We must plan our outfits for tomorrow's ball as well. I had not put much time into it, Miss Elizabeth said, standing up. Now that there is a purpose for it, other than the enjoyment of the dance, I will need to search my belongings for a proper outfit. It was decided that, for that night, supper would be brought up to Lady Hendrickson's room as each girl went about finding the proper gown to wear for the event. Lady Louisa couldn't have been more irritated at the lack of meal for the evening after such an arduous day, not to mention the fact that she had yet to actually be invited to attend the public event with the other ladies of the house. Nonetheless, Lady Louisa also went upstairs, following behind her aunt and cousin. She was promptly put to work hemming, pinning, and adding suggested alterations to various dresses indicated by Lady Hendrickson or Miss Elizabeth. Lady Louisa regularly told herself that she had done such sewing many times before in the cause of charities for those less fortunate. Though it was a bit degrading to be asked to be a seamstress for her relations, she did the task without complaint, hoping it would attest to her good character and kindness of heart. Chapter 10 Why are you not dressed? Miss Mary said as she came into the drawing room of the small house. Lady Louisa looked up from the book of poems she had been reading to see her young cousin dressed in a beautiful cream dress with a green ivy pattern along the hems. Oh, Mary, you look stunning, Lady Louisa said as her eyes looked over her cousin. Not only was Miss Mary's dress of the most delicate silk, but her hair was also intricately placed in beautiful cascading ringlets down her back, with single pearls pinned into several decorative braids. One would hope so. I think Bess poked me so many times in the head I feared I might start bleeding, 
Miss Mary said with a touch of her long white glove to her hair. But you, Lady Louisa, here you sit, and we must leave within the hour. Lady Louisa found herself utterly exhausted after yesterday's events, then an evening full of dress altering and then a morning of sewing to complete the gowns in time. She hadn't even considered her own outfit, or even the fact that she would have the energy to attend the ball. I don't think I shall attend, Mary, Lady Louisa said delicately. I am much too tired now. Nonsense, Miss Mary said, tugging on her cousin's hand to get her to stand. You must come. We could introduce you to our little society here. Plus, you did such a wonderful job on this embroidered hem that my mother insisted on. I have to have you by my side. That way, when I am complimented on it, I can say it was all your skilled hands doing. That is very kind, but I shan't be ready in time, Lady Louisa responded. She had to admit, however, it did feel nice to be appreciated and wanted. It seemed like the first time since her arrival. She suspected Miss Mary had many more occasions where she felt such gratitude towards her but feared speaking so in front of her mother and sister. I shall help you. Bess will too now that she's done with me. I'm afraid Suze still has quite a bit of work to do on my sister, but she would help too if she could. You have been such a help to us all, even in just the short time you've been here. We all want to see you out tonight and having a bit of fun, Miss Mary encouraged as she led her cousin up the stairs and to Mary's own room. For the next hour, the two girls, along with the maid, stayed in Miss Mary's room while Lady Louisa tried on various dresses that she had brought with her and had her hair done. The latter was particularly tricky, as Lady Louisa's hair rarely cooperated. Bess was doing her best to give Lady Louisa a unique look, with various braids wrapping around her chignon and several ringlets flowing out. It didn't work out well when Lady Louisa's hair was so limp and flat to her head. It will be just fine, my lady. I have found when hair is not doing as it should, there is always one perfect remedy. And what is that, Bess? Lady Louisa asked from her seat in front of the mirror. A turban, Bess replied. Oh no, Bess, Miss Mary chimed in from her seat on the bed. That is far too old for her. Well, I don't mean in the actual sense as some of the aged ladies might wear it. Instead, we will leave these bits in front. Stuff some of the turban under your hair so that it looks so much fuller and nice. Then we will wrap it here. Bess spoke as she worked. By the time she was finished, Lady Louisa had to admit it was probably about the finest her hair had ever looked. Lady Louisa had chosen a cream dress with a rose-embroidered ribbon at her waist. The fabric wrapping around her hair and highlighting each flowing curl was a matching pink colour with green stripes throughout. The lines gave an even better illusion of more curls than before, and Lady Louisa could swear the pink even brought out the gold tone her hair had once had as a child. Mary, where are you? Lady Hendrickson called. You silly girl, we are going to be late and it will be all your fault, she huffed as she entered the room. She stopped in surprise to see Lady Louisa there, and not only that, but readied for the ball. I was just helping Louisa, mother. Oh, my dear, she said to Lady Louisa. I had no idea you planned on attending tonight. What with your recent travelling, I expected you would want the night to rest, she stated as she wrung her black-gloved hands. If it is all right with you, Lady Hendrickson, I would like to join you tonight. Lady Louisa suspected if she had any chance to go tonight, which she had a growing desire to after all of Bess's hard work, she would first need to please her aunt. There was a moment of silence as Lady Hendrickson thought over the possibility of not allowing her. There was the fact that she had no honest reason to prevent her from attending. It was purely because she didn't want her to. In terms of beauty, Lady Hendrickson was sure that her plain niece was no match for either of her daughters. There was the matter of title, however. She would not risk her two daughters losing a chance with the Duke over the plain, silly little girl of her husband's stealing sister. Finally, she saw no agreeable way to deter the child, without it reflecting poorly on herself. It would make no difference. Her plans would still go accordingly. 
Perhaps if she was lucky, this ignorant city girl would get herself overwhelmed by the customs of a country public event and decide to return home discouraged. Lady Hendrickson already suspected that her sudden arrival had little to do with her own husband's passing, and more with a desperate attempt by her conniving sister to steal the Duke away from her daughters. She was on to Lady Louisa's scheme, as well as her backstabbing mother's. She would show them both who would win this final battle. She formed her face back into its present smile and looked down on her deceitful niece. Of course, Lady Hendrickson said, waving her hand like it was a silly question to ask. I was only thinking of you when I didn't suggest such a thing, naturally. That was very kind of you. I believe I will be quite up to the task, though, Lady Louisa said. Lady Hendrickson had to stop herself from saying that she highly doubted a delicate flower such as herself was ready for the high energy that accompanied country public affairs. Instead, she merely motioned for both her daughter and niece to exit the room. The carriage ride into town was a quiet one. Lady Hendrickson and her eldest daughter had few words to exchange. Miss Mary seemed again to concentrate on the hands in her own lap and refused to make contact with anyone else in the party. She suspected, in her youthful excitement to include Lady Louisa, she had somehow upset her mother. It was something that Miss Mary found she often did. Unlike her older sister who was always pleasing to their mother, Miss Mary had to struggle to find herself in Lady Hendrickson's good graces. At the same moment, Miss Elizabeth was intensely occupied with going over every possible outcome of every action to happen in the near future. This was her one and only chance to secure a rightful place among the ton. She would leave nothing to chance. Having her cousin Lady Louisa there in the carriage and also on her way to the ball was of little consequence to her. In fact, she considered Lady Louisa much like one would consider a fly buzzing around. It was a slight annoyance, but nothing to really take notice of. Lady Hendrickson was already making a mental note of all the new things she could plan for her niece to do. She had to admit, for such a simple-looking town girl, she did seem to have the spirit and work ethic of a mule. She had taken her trips on foot without complaint and done all the tasks that Lady Hendrickson had come up with. She was sure those chores over the last week would have been enough to send the girl home. Instead, Lady Louisa seemed to show the same stubborn determination as her mother. She never once complained about the tasks, no matter how demeaning. Lady Hendrickson was quite unprepared for that. In fact, she was unsure what to do next. Perhaps she hadn't been as hard on Lady Louisa as needed. Surely she could find more degrading things for her to do. If that were not enough to send her crying back to her mother, then at least Lady Hendrickson would have some much-needed servant work done for free. Yes, she smiled at that thought as she watched the trees pass by with every rotation of the carriage wheels. She was sure to get her long-awaited revenge on her sister. Lady Louisa, on the other hand, settled into the pregnant silence and focused out her own window instead of on the three other passengers. In all honesty, she was very exhausted after such a tedious day. In fact, she had almost fallen asleep, as Bess had delicately placed each lock of hair and wrapped the fabric into place. She held her chin up high now, though. It had been clear by her aunt's actions that the lady had meant to exclude her from the event. And this was after all the extraordinary ways that Lady Louisa had tried to please her with. Perhaps it was purely the exhaustion talking, but she was feeling particularly vindictive as she sat and thought about her aunt. How could she have asked so much of Lady Louisa and then turn and snub her at every chance? Certainly it was all due to her ire towards the Dowager Countess Lady Gilchrist. Lady Hendrickson seemed to have no desire to make amends with her sister. It was most puzzling since Lady Hendrickson had sent the letter stating her struggling with her husband's departure from this world. Lady Louisa was deep in thought, wondering what Lady Hendrickson could have possibly wanted from such a letter. It was apparent that help from Lady Louisa's family was not its purpose. Perhaps she had hoped that. Lady Gilchrist would have sent the money that Lady Hendrickson had refused in the past instead of sending her daughter instead. Before she knew it, they had reached their destination. She laughed a little to herself, realising the trip was much quicker when done in a carriage. 
It was Lady Louisa's first experience at a public event in a country setting, and part of her wondered if she should have been surprised at their stop. But after seeing the town inside and out over the week, she really found it a reasonable location. Instead of the usual halls that generally were attended in London, their carriage pulled up in front of the public barn that housed all the livestock as they came to and from town. Their own carriage was shuttled away into a stall just after the ladies exited the vehicle. Lady Louisa wanted to ask where the event would be held. As of yet, she saw no room big enough besides this barn to host even such a humble town as this. She feared her question would only be returned with a scoff, however, so she walked silently behind her aunt and cousins. They made their way around the barn. The smell of its present occupants caused the ladies to hold handkerchiefs to their noses. Finally, on the other side, Lady Louisa saw the group making their way in one direction. It was a church building just behind the barn. For a moment, Lady Louisa thought this gay event might be held in the Holy Sanctuary, but then she saw it. Just behind and to the right of the church steeple was a large canvas tent. It reminded her of a revival tent she had once been told about. All along the front of it, leading from the church to the canvas flap doors, was a row of lanterns in the otherwise dark. Lady Louisa could barely contain her excitement at seeing it. She had never expected to attend a public dance in a tent. It seemed so exhilarating that she forgot her struggle against exhaustion earlier. Is it normal to hold events in such a way? Lady Louisa couldn't help but ask. Her aunt turned to her, already prepared with her response. I am sure it seems very insignificant to the glorious events of London. I do remember them well myself from my own childhood. If you don't think you can handle attending such a meagre event, I suggest you begin the walk home. There was a reason, after all, why I didn't tell you about the ball in the first place. I didn't mean it that way at all, Lady Hendrickson. In fact, I am most excited to see the inside. It does look rather magical with its glowing lanterns and billowing walls. Like a dream. It could be here one moment, and in a blink, it would be gone, Lady Louisa said as her eyes looked over the spectacle. She caught the smile on Miss Mary's lips before Lady Hendrickson huffed and moved quickly to enter, dissatisfied with Lady Louisa's reply. Chapter 11 When Lady Louisa entered the room, she was taken aback by several sensations all at once. First was the brightness inside the room. It seemed that every inch was lit with lanterns and tables lined with candles. Along all the walls were chairs for the participants to rest. The main portion of the tent was opened into a dance floor with temporary wood planks on the ground. At the far back of the tent, a platform had been raised to host the night's musicians. Though Lady Louisa was used to orchestras of various sizes, she had never seen one quite like this. It was just four gentlemen, each tuning their instruments for the first set of the night. Other than the violin, she had no idea what the other instruments were. One was a rather large bag with several wooden flutes protruding from it. Another sight to behold was the mass of people. Even on market day, Lady Louisa had not seen so many people in this little village. She wondered if perhaps this was a main event of the year, drawing participants from both near and far. The smell of all the bodies in such a close and confined area was a little offensive to the nostrils. Lady Louisa was determined not to raise her handkerchief to her nose, however. She had to guess at least three hundred bodies had crowded themselves inside the tent. The three Hendrickson ladies walked in with chins held high, even Miss Mary. Often crowds parted and many greeted Lady Hendrickson. For her part, she mostly nodded in the direction it suited her as she waved her fan casually before her. Lady Louisa suspected that up until the appearance of the Duke, the Hendricksons had been the closest members of society to attend this village's public events. She let herself ponder on the thought of the Duke for just a moment. She wondered if he would, in fact, come to the event tonight. It would be understandable if he chose not to, as Lady Hendrickson suspected he would. On the other hand, there was a small piece of Lady Louisa interested to see him again, and to see him in this setting instead of the side of a road. Lady Hendrickson, 
It is always a pleasure to have you and your beautiful daughters join us, a grey-haired man with a decorative cane said, coming up to her. Lady Hendrickson held out her lace-gloved hand for him to take. Lady Louisa did her best to hide the shock on her face, that her aunt seemed to flaunt her ladyship over all present. Well, you know how much my girls love this type of thing, she said rather bored, with a wave of her fan in the direction of the three young ladies behind her. I believe you have an added member to your party as well. I don't believe I have had the pleasure yet, the man said, hoping for an introduction. Lady Hendrickson looked back as if she was checking to see if her niece was still there and not halfway down the road towards home. Yes, this is my niece, Lady Louisa Fraser. this is Mr. Druton. He is the vicar at the church and often hosts many community events. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Druton. Are you Lord and Lady Gilchrist's daughter by chance then? He said with a bright smile, warming his aged face. Lady Louisa had to do her best to keep her eyes on his, and not the large, wild, white whiskers protruding from either side of his cheeks. I am, sir. I knew both your mother and father very well. Perhaps you don't remember, but your father did, in fact, spend some time in his county seat when you and your brother were very young. They too would often join us from time to time, what with your mother having such close connections to this area. How wonderful! I had no idea, Lady Louisa replied, happy to be conversing with the man. Why, your presence tonight is actually quite providential. Why is that, Mr. Druton? Lady Hendrickson interrupted, not happy with the vicar's words. Well, as I am sure you are aware, the Duke of Rowland has returned from his worldly travels. Upon hearing of our humble festivities, he graciously donated the cornucopia spread over at the far table. You really must go look at it. I have never seen such a wonderful spread of meats and pies and dried fruit pies. That is very kind of his grace, Lady Hendrickson interjected again quickly before the man could continue. I suspect it is a very kind way for his grace to send well wishes since he won't be attending himself. Oh no, Lady Hendrickson, he is to attend. I heard the news with my very own ears from his grace himself. That is what makes your niece's presence so perfect. In what way? Lady Hendrickson said with a snap of her fan and narrowing of her tiny eyes. Well, we, of course, made the Duke the honoured guest of the evening. It is only right that he opens the dancing himself. It was a sensitive subject, as he would have no lady in mind to open the dance with. I feared to ask one lady over the other here, as it might cause contentious feelings, he said, waving his cane to the crowd. But with Lady Louisa in our presence, it would only be right that she opens the festivities at his side. Lady Louisa was just as startled at the announcement as her aunt no doubt was. Lady Louisa did understand the vicar's natural progression into that train of thought. At the same time, she feared what consequent thoughts it conjured in her aunt and Miss Elizabeth's minds. How interesting for you to suggest such a thing, Lady Hendrickson said after a beat. I'm afraid my niece is very shy, however. I don't think she would take to being paraded around before everyone here, she added with a little chuckle. Lady Louisa was quiet by nature and certainly not confrontational. She would never go against her aunt's words, however untrue they were, in front of another. In fact, most of her life she was healing problems, not causing them. She was rather fine giving up the dance to mollify any enmity. Nonsense, the matter is settled. I will go and find the Duke and inform him now, the old man said before turning and leaving the group. That ridiculous old man, Lady Hendrickson said under her breath. He thinks that just because he is a man, he must have the final say in every situation, the impertinence. She then turned to her two daughters. Miss Mary had been waiting quietly by her side. Miss Elizabeth, on the other hand, had found a friend of her own that she was conversing with. That had stopped at the announcement of the Duke's presence. What shall we do now, mother? she asked with a bit of a squeak in her voice. Of all the situations she had planned for on their trip into town, the presence of the Duke was not one of them. To start, my dear, you may calm down. Certainly making a scene will not help in the least. Let us take a turn around the room and see who else is present tonight. 
It may work considerably to our advantage to have the Duke here after all, Lady Hendrickson said in a calm, demanding tone. However, before they began their turn around the room, they were overtaken by Colonel Jasper. As soon as the man saw the small gathering of ladies he knew well enough, he made a line straight to them. Good evening, Colonel Jasper, Miss Elizabeth said with a flutter of her dark eyelashes. A quick glance over at her younger cousin caused Lady Louisa sadness. Miss Mary looked rather pitiful. All you ladies look magnificent tonight. If one didn't know better, one would think I was standing with the Queen herself, he said with a charming smile. Yes, my daughters do have a very sophisticated air about them, Lady Hendrickson proceeded. I am often told that they could easily be mistaken for countesses or, say, duchesses. I couldn't agree more, the colonel said, smiling politely. I myself consider such a thing not just a matter of breeding. I believe parentage alone is not sufficient to create a proper lady. This also requires the right education, Lady Hendrickson continued. Well, then it should be no surprise to you why I have come to seek you ladies out, Colonel Jasper replied cryptically. And why is that, Colonel? Miss Elizabeth asked with a flash of her own sweet smile. Well, Mr. Druton just informed me that Lady Louisa and Roland will introduce the first set. I was rather hoping to place my name on some dance cards as well before all the sets had been scooped up, he answered. Though Colonel Jasper did not speak of a specific lady from the group, his eyes falling directly on Miss Mary told a different story. Lady Hendrickson's mouth broke into a gallant smile. Do you mean to fill Lady Louisa's card? How very thoughtful of you. How very interesting that you felt the need to come here straight away, Lady Hendrickson announced. Clearly she thought that the Colonel had set his eyes on Lady Louisa. Perhaps she thought it a proper match, and at the very least a way to keep Lady Louisa from distracting the Duke any more than she already would with their first dance. The Colonel, not wanting to seem rude, didn't correct her, though disappointment could be felt from three of the five present. I am not sure if I will have the energy to dance two sets in a row. Perhaps you would allow me to defer your invitation until the third or fourth set. I do hate to disappoint you so, however. Perhaps if my cousin Mary would be willing, she could take the place of the second set in my stead, Lady Louisa said smoothly. The Colonel and Miss Mary exchanged a quick look. Mary was overcome with happiness and embarrassment at the same time. I would be happy to step in if it would suit you, Miss Mary replied, barely above a whisper. I would like that very much, Colonel Jasper said with a bow before excusing himself from the group. Well, it looks like our cousin has an admirer, Miss Elizabeth said in teasing fashion after the Colonel left. He was just begging to get his chance to dance with you. A little poetically too, if you ask me, she added with a sniff. Lady Louisa was confused as to how her elder cousin could change so easily from false flattery to utter despise in a matter of moments, as well as by the fact that both she and Lady Hendrickson seemed utterly unaware of how Mary and the Colonel seemed to have eyes only for one another. Chapter 12 Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Druton called from his place on the raised platform, I would like to officially welcome our distinguished guest, his Grace the Duke of Rowland, as well as his party including his uncle, Mr. James Vaughan, and his Grace's very good friend, Colonel Hugh Jasper. We are deeply honoured to have you in our midst this night, and unspeakably grateful for your generous donation, he added with a wave to the food table. Loud applause erupted around the room. Lady Louisa was finding that this type of public event was vastly more energised than what she was used to. Now that we all have sufficiently visited and had our fill, I believe it is time to invite the band to start playing, Mr. Druton said amid more cheers from the crowded room. Now, he continued, naturally we wish our most esteemed guest, His Grace the Duke of Rowland, to open the dance floor for us. I am happy to announce that joining him on the floor will be the lovely Lady Louisa Fraser. All eyes searched around the room for the lady mentioned. Lady Louisa rather felt like hiding underneath the buffet of food. The Duke, ever the efficient man in his duties, stepped out onto the dance floor. His eyes scanned the room for just a moment before they fell on Lady Louisa. 
She couldn't help but feel the flutter of excitement as his face relaxed into a smile. In just three steps, he seemed to cross the whole of the dance floor and stood before her with an outstretched hand. Rather reluctantly, Lady Louisa took it. It was hard to distinguish the surge of emotions in the room right at that moment. For her, it was embarrassment and a new tingling sensation in her stomach she had never experienced before. For the ladies next to her, and Louisa dared think, the rest of the room, it was indignation and jealousy. She took his hand despite the silent prayers around the room that she wouldn't, and allowed him to lead her to the centre of the room. It was probably the first time in her life she found herself in such a place with so many eyes upon her. I do apologise for drawing you into this predicament, the Duke said softly for only Lady Louisa's ears. Had I considered the reaction my presence would cause, I would have been more adamant in my absence. Both parties readied themselves for the first set, and the band began the music. For the most part, it wasn't much different from the sets that Lady Louisa had danced back home. Ordinarily, first dances were lively music, and she was sure the present song playing was of the fastest she had ever heard. On his part, the Duke held his head up high and smiled graciously to all around him. Lady Louisa was a little shocked by how different his whole countenance seemed to be in this setting. Even his smile didn't seem to match the few she had seen in their last two meetings. Instead, it seemed to be painted into place and without much feeling. Finally, others were invited to join in on the jig dance and happily did so. Lady Louisa did notice that Miss Elizabeth had already secured a partner for this first dance and managed to find a way right next to the Duke and herself. You don't look as if you are enjoying this much, Lady Louisa said, after the dance settled back into the rhythm of the steps with the floor now crowded. Why would you think such a thing? I am very much enjoying myself, he responded, though he never seemed to look directly at Lady Louisa. Instead, his eyes moved over the crowd, and his speech was very diplomatic. She studied the man before her as if she was seeing him for the first time. He stood the height and dressed the part of a duke in his elegant black jacket and perfect cream knot. His black hair was combed back perfectly and tied with a ribbon. Whereas before, on the road, his eyes could have pierced to the very core of her. They seemed now milked over and shaded by a facade. What swayed you two come tonight? Lady Louisa asked. My uncle, the duke replied honestly. He gave a smile of relief and for the first time since they started the dance let his eyes drift over his partner. I am afraid he is most insistent that I begin my search for a match. Tonight. He even gave me a long list of dance cards to put my name on. So you are here to appease your uncle? In a way, yes. In another, I suppose I do need to begin my search for a companion. A dance is a choice place to start. You have already won over so many with your donation. I suspect no girl will deny you her card this night. He looked away shyly. Lady Louisa was unsure if it was embarrassment or shame, though. It was just one of those things expected of me. You know how it is, you must behave in a particular way when in public. I suppose to an extent that is true, Lady Louisa agreed. However, is it not also important to be yourself when looking for a life companion? I may only have had short meetings with you in the past but I fear that the man before me is not the one I chanced to run into before. Well, of course not, he blurted out. I can't be. A duke has certain expectations put upon him. I cannot be myself. I understand the necessities of polite society, Lady Louisa pressed, but surely you can't say that you feel the need to alter your person so much. Certainly that is no way to find a wife. How would she know the man she is intended to marry? I'm pretty sure it is the only way. No lady wants the true man. They want the title, status, and they expect the man attached is their ideal duke. You must be doing the same. Surely you find yourself acting in a vastly different manner between casual and public settings. Not at all, I must confess, Your Grace. I don't know if I would like myself much if I were ashamed to show my true self in public, Lady Louisa said in honesty. 
She supposed the Duke must have taken her words as a slight since his eyes seemed to narrow down on her. She, in fact, was just speaking the truth of her nature. She was a plain, shy girl, and no matter her circumstance, she had long since learned that hiding her person was not a worthy cause. I would have expected a woman to understand my meaning, but perhaps not. Is it not true that a woman's whole existence involves putting on a different face than the one God gave? For certainly that must be what the hours of embellishing are for, not to mention the accurate uses of coy language, all in the hopes of ensnaring one's goal. I beg your pardon, Your Grace, but I no more speak coyly than I embellish myself. Perhaps you have the wrong idea of the female sex, or are in the market for a lesser breed. Do you think so highly of yourself, then? Too good for the tactics used for hundreds of years by your foremothers? He shot back. I neither think highly of myself, Your Grace, nor do I lower my standards to that of superficiality and lies of illusion. The song was finally coming to an end. She was very disappointed to learn the true character of the Duke. At this moment he seemed no better than Miss Elizabeth. Clearly he was just as manipulative and deceitful, wearing a mask in order to trick a lady toward his end goal. I wish you the best of luck in your endeavours, Your Grace, but I fear this is where we must part ways. I don't think I would be much help to a gentleman who insists on presenting a lie. The Duke's mouth opened in shock at her accusation. His eyes grew cold and hard as he looked down at her. I believe that must be for the best. I dare say I could not find company in someone so critical. Honesty may be critical, but it is still that. Honesty, she shot back with more vigour than she normally possessed. He was truly irritating her. How he could live such a duplicitous life with one seeming so deceitful and the other so enjoyable was unimaginable to her. Perhaps it was the folly of a handsome member of the ton to feel the need to be so conniving. That indeed was the case for Miss Elizabeth. For the first time in her life, Lady Louisa saw her plain, humble features as a blessing. It may have caused her years of torment in her youth. It may have robbed her of any chance of making a match herself. But at the very least, it pushed her through the fire and brimstone of life. She had been moulded into a better lady for it, known who she was, who she was not, and had no need to pretend for the sake of others. The Duke of Rowland was utterly thrown by the woman before him. She seemed so hypocritical in his eyes. Being a lady of society proved in itself that she behaved just as he was behaving this night. In fact, it was how any human being acted. Certainly every person in the world catered their attitude to fit the company they were presented with. She, however, had gone even lower than that. She had lied about her identity altogether when they first met. That would certainly warrant more vicious words than his behaviour. At the beginning of the dance, he had such high admiration for Lady Louisa. Now he was seeing her in a new light. She was just as pompous as all the other ladies he was required to choose from. As the dance finished, he bid her a final good evening without so much as a soft glance, and she scarcely did the same before he deposited her back at her aunt's side. He suspected that Lady Hendrickson was eager for him to stay and chat with her a while, and in truth, he probably should have for politeness' sake. He was in a rather cross mood. He had a feeling it had less to do with his kindled anger against the lady, and more to do with his wounded pride. She had pointed out a fact that had already been an irritant to him. He dispeased the mask he was required to parody around in. It was one of the reasons why he had stayed away from England for so long. Naturally, they had first left in his early boyhood so that he could gain some experience of the world. In his young age, however, he had already experienced much of the duplicitous nature of those around him. They seemed only to say the things he wanted to hear. It was infuriating that he couldn't possibly trust anyone apart from his uncle or his close friend Jasper for the truth. Perhaps it was just the fact that it was a lady that had spoken words that he had not been expecting in a place such as this, or perhaps it was because it was a woman he could not quite understand. He knew deep down that her words were the truth, however. They were words he would have spoken himself to another, had the situation been the same. Nonetheless, his hurt pride was too much to forgive this night. 
He didn't stay to speak with Lady Louisa or her aunt, but instead excused himself promptly. Chapter 13 Lady Louisa had been right when she said he would not be short of partners this night. In fact, he wasn't entirely sure he had ever been pressed upon to dance by so many matrons with single daughters ever before. With each false smile a lady flashed at him, with each shallow conversation, he only saw the reflection of his own shallowness. It was very disconcerting and made it very difficult for him to at least appear to enjoy himself. Something is bothering you, Roland, his uncle said from his side as the Duke took a moment to refresh himself with some punch. More people had managed to squeeze into the room, though it scarcely seemed possible at the beginning of the dance. The continuous dancing, combined with the warmth of that many bodies, had started to turn the tent into a hothouse. Nothing at all, uncle, Roland lied. Well, I do hope you are better at convincing ladies of love than that. Why try to convince someone of what one doesn't feel? Would it not be better to give up this whole charade and wait for the real thing to come along? My dear nephew, please take the advice of an old man. All love is a charade. Even my parents' love? Roland asked with a raised brow. Since their death, he had spent his childhood begging his uncle to provide him with any detail about them. Being a boy of such a young age, he had so few of his own memories of them. His uncle had painted a picture of good and honourable people who cared for each other. You are not a boy any longer, his uncle said with a bit of hesitation. They were good people, your mother and your father. Their marriage, however, was not one of choice but of obligation. They made the best of it, as most do. I had no idea, the Duke said before settling into the thoughts this brought about. I am sure they found joy in each other, however. If they had lived longer, I am sure you would have had siblings. Roland rolled his eyes. Why was it that affection and intimacy always were one and the same? In James Vaughan's mind, the only type of love was the physical kind. It was also why he had never found a permanent companion of his own. Relationships based solely on physical attraction were never destined to go very far at all. His uncle had settled into this mentality of shallow, quick romances in any country they might find themselves in. That was partly the reason why it came as such a shock that his uncle suggested and strongly insisted on their current venture. Roland had fancied the two of them living the rest of their days much how they had the first twenty-six years of his life. It had been fun, energetic, carefree, and without the added weight of a spouse giving her opinion on matters. Though Roland didn't see relationships in the same light as his uncle, he also didn't see the necessity of acquiring one. Perhaps there was a chance for actual love out there for him, but why waste his time looking for it when there was so much more he could be doing? The night finally ended, and other than the mishap with Lady Louisa, it evolved without any defect. He made the acquaintance of several young ladies all amply ready to be married. Some sort of arrangement might be made with one of them, perhaps. Choosing a bride out of country ladies and untitled gentlemen's daughters meant they would be more willing to go along with any arrangement he set, all for the sake of his title. It wasn't like he had a terrible idea in mind. After all, if his uncle was going to force his hand in marriage, it would make sense to do so in a way most convenient to him. If he could find an agreeable lady to wed, she would stay at Basson Park and he would be free to travel as he pleased like before. Naturally, the time would come to produce an heir. Once that was taken care of, however, he would return to his old life. She would stay and take care of the heir. It was a win for both of them. It would mean little change in his ways except for the years necessary to produce an heir, and she would get the fortune and prestige that she was searching for. He had hoped that Lady Louisa would have been a willing friend in his search. She would have been a necessary companion in the task, to help him weed out the women most willing to take him up on his offer. Apparently she would no longer be a part of the equation. He thought of her again at his morning meal the following day. She was such a vexing conundrum to him. Though she was no great beauty like her cousins, she still had her own pleasant look that he rather enjoyed. She seemed so simple and straightforward. 
But then there was that confusing side of her. First, she chose to lie at their first meeting. Roland had assumed it was purely over embarrassment. After all, he had assumed her to be of a lower class. In a way, Roland supposed that whole situation had been a result of his own actions. But then there was that irritating conversation they had had the night before at the public dance. She had seemed so cross with his manners. How else did she expect him to behave in such a setting? He had a name and title to think of and represent in a way that would bring respect to his predecessors. Lost in thought over there, old chap, a voice roused Roland from his thinking. He looked over to see his companion at the breakfast table, looking at him with a raised brow of interest. Perhaps it was a lady from last night that has finally caught your attention, Colonel Jasper suggested. Well, she certainly caught my attention, but not in the way you were thinking. And who would that be? Let me guess. The very lovely Miss Elizabeth. I know Lady Hendrickson is very set on you finding your way to her eldest daughter. No, actually I was thinking of Lady Louisa. She said some cross words to me last night while dancing. Cross? Really? Now I've only spent a couple of afternoons and conversations with her, but I never quite pictured her as the cross type. Roland looked over at his friend, surprised by his words. Jasper was much older than him, perhaps by eight years. They had only shared a few years in school, but they had quickly grown to be friends during those. Like himself, Jasper had never married. It wasn't for lack of desire, but lack of opportunity and the ability to support a wife. Rowland had been happy to sponsor his friend's commission as an officer. The early years of a militiaman didn't offer much by way of wages. On top of that, it was a job with considerable travelling. These were both in opposition to finding his own happiness. She said I was putting on a very lordlike show, in many more words than that. Well, were you not? Of course I was, I'm supposed to be. It is what is expected of me. It comes with the title. Perhaps she didn't mean it in an insulting way. You only took it so, he suggested. You seem to be defending her very determinedly, Roland retorted. Your Lady Louisa claimed that I was behaving in a way as to hide my true personality, all in hopes to trick one of her female companions into finding me agreeable. Well, were you? Jasper asked. Of course not. I mean, not really. I mean, you know how it is, Roland gestured irritatedly. I do have to behave a certain way in public. That is just the way things are. There are certain expectations of me. Of course, I also would want to put my best foot forward when meeting several ladies that could have potential. I'm not going to flaunt my worst traits in such a situation. Like how you pick at your cuticles or your atrocious handwriting, Jasper teased. Roland rolled his eyes. I am simply saying I might have been putting my best foot forward, but she accused me of altering myself altogether to deceive and create an illusion of lies, he added, quoting her words exaggeratedly. Perhaps you were, Jasper retorted with a shrug. Now I know for certain you are on her side. My dear friend, when it comes between you and a pleasant lady, I will always choose the latter. Besides, he said with a laugh, the Henry Vaughan I knew from days past would have never even tried to put on a mask before ladies. In fact, he would have made fun of those who did so in his presence. Yes, well, that Henry Vaughan was a child and not the Duke of Rowland. Now I must play the game as well as any other. I need to acquire the wife and the heir so that I may return to my own life. The sooner it gets done, the better. My dear friend, Jasper said, setting aside his plate of boiled eggs and toast. If you actually think you can go back to your old life, you are sadly mistaken. What I wouldn't give to be in your shoes. I would happily find a woman to love and spend my days with. You apparently already have in Lady Louisa, Roland responded in a teasing fashion. Actually, I might already have in another form. I rather hoped you would help me with that old chap. Happy to help, Roland said, interested to hear the name of his friend's interest. As we said, Lady Hendrickson is most interested in you marrying her daughter, Miss Elizabeth. Roland thought on Miss Elizabeth. He had danced with her last night and made pleasant conversation. 
She was very lovely to look at and seemed to know all the right things to say. She rather did remind him of those shallow misses that his uncle enjoyed company with. There was nothing beyond the surface with that kind. And you wish to marry her in my stead, I hope? Unfortunately not. But I have found great interest in Miss Mary. She was charming to talk with, and I spent much of last night in her company, if you didn't notice. Rowland had noticed that now that he thought back on the night. I wonder if you could use your influence over Lady Hendrickson and invite them here an evening. It would be a great opportunity to get to know Miss Mary better. I doubt it would be hard to arrange. In fact, if I said the words, I would expect to find all four ladies right here on my doorstep, Roland said with a satisfied smile at his wit. As much as I wish to help you, my friend, I don't know if I could stand another night with Lady Louisa and still be civil, Roland added. I really think you might have judged Lady Louisa a bit harshly. And if she really felt so poorly about you, I doubt she would come at all, Jasper added as an afterthought. I suppose I could hope for that. Yes, you might have to. I suspect we will be seeing a lot of them over the coming months, at least I hope so. I would guess Miss Elizabeth hopes the same. The addition of her name again in the conversation made Roland think critically on the miss. It would be a reasonable choice for him, and an easy one at that. He was sure with Lady Hendrickson at the lead of her daughter's search for a husband, she would move things along at a fast pace. Though he found Lady Hendrickson's behaviour very irritating, Roland tried not to think too harshly of the lady. He had been told that she mourned over the recent death of her husband. Certainly, a woman alone with two daughters would feel a sharper pang to see them settled right. She had the use of close relations to help her, though. Why else would Lady Louisa be in present company? No lady would choose to leave London during the height of the season unless it was to aid a relation that they had great affection for. Well, I am sure I have little say in the matter. I suppose I will be putting my poor handwriting to work today to invite the ladies over for a dinner party at their earliest convenience. That's very nice of you, old chap, Jasper said with a smile across his face. You know... Miss Mary is at least ten years your junior, if not more. I would guess closer to fifteen, actually. I don't think age matters much when you find the right one. And she is your right one? You are certain of this already? Not certain, no, but I intend to find out. Chapter 14 Mother, mother, come quickly, Miss Elizabeth called down the hall. Lady Hendrickson left the comfort of the drawing room to see what her daughter was shouting about. It is from the Duke, was all Miss Elizabeth said before handing over the letter. Mary, Lady Hendrickson shouted, after her eyes ran over the parchment. Mary, come in this instant, she called again to the back of the house. Miss Mary and Lady Louisa were outside tending to the garden when the shouts came. Luckily the house was small enough that any voice shouted could be heard. Miss Mary, upon hearing her mother's call, got up instantly and brushed off her gloved hands. Lady Louisa followed closely behind her, wondering what the excitement could possibly be about. She was rather reluctant to leave the small sprouts of plants just barely beginning to show their heads above the soil. It is a letter from the Duke, Lady Hendrickson announced to the group once seated in the drawing room, and tea had been called. He has invited us over to an intimate dinner at Basson Park. How wonderful, Lady Louisa said, while Miss Elizabeth was bouncing in her seat with excitement, having already read the news herself. She turned to Lady Louisa as if remembering her presence. Oh, and there was this letter for you too, she said, handing over the parchment. Miss Elizabeth secretly hoped it was of so much importance that Lady Louisa would excuse herself from the room. Instead, she opened and read it right there announcing she didn't recognise the hand it was written in. My dear friend Lady Louisa, I am sure that along with this letter your household has also received an invitation from the Duke of Rowland for a dinner party. Rowland expressed to me that your last meeting was less than favourable, and for that reason you might hesitate to attend. I am writing you to implore you to join our event, 
and give Roland another chance. He is a very admirable gentleman once you get to know him well. I greatly enjoy your company and want to assure you that you are a welcome guest at Basson Park. Please do join us for our evening of society and enjoyment. Your friend, Colonel Hugh Jasper. Well, what is it? Lady Hendrickson said when Lady Louisa read the letter a second time and still didn't speak. It is very rude to read correspondence in front of others and not speak on it, she added, fluttering her own letter. Lady Louisa went rather pink on the cheeks. She wasn't exactly sure what to tell her aunt. She couldn't very well say that she had chastened the Duke at the public dance, and Colonel Jasper was only encouraging her to come to the dinner despite that. Her aunt would be furious to know that Lady Louisa did anything that might offend the Duke. She would be sure it would hurt Miss Elizabeth's chances. The proof of the letter, however, relieved Lady Louisa of that fact, one that she herself had wondered about these past few days. Well, it is just a small note from Colonel Jasper, Lady Louisa finally answered in a soft voice. From the Colonel? Is it about the dinner? Well, what does it say? Why on earth would he write you? Lady Hendrickson seemed to spew questions out without control. I believe he wanted to ensure that I would also be attending. Why ever would he do that? Miss Elizabeth said. Then her honey eyes lit up like a candle. Why, Lady Louisa? I believe you have a true admirer. I promise I won't be cross that you have stolen him away from me, she continued in a playful manner. Lady Louisa wanted to say that Colonel Jasper had as much interest in her as he did in Miss Elizabeth, which was exactly none. She also wanted to tell her wretched cousin that it was awfully prideful to think after just a few interactions, where she shamefully flirted with the man that he would have fallen deeply in love with Miss Elizabeth. In fact, Lady Louisa would have rather liked to tell Miss Elizabeth that if she had any eyes at all, she would see that the only growing affection for the Colonel was from her own sister, Miss Mary. Lady Louisa looked over at Miss Mary at that moment. Again she held her hands tight to her apron and her gaze held fast to her hand. Lady Louisa suspected she was hoping not to give any of her thoughts away. Assuredly, living in this family with these female companions, it would not be safe for Miss Mary to announce her own feelings to them. I am sure it is only because the letter was addressed to the Hendrickson family, and I am not of that family. I am sure it was a kind afterthought to clear up any miscommunication. Then why are you blushing? Lady Hendrickson asked with a raise of her brow and purse of her lips. I do believe you have a small crush on the Colonel, she finally concluded. Yuck, Miss Elizabeth said with a shiver. He must be at least fifty years old. Apparently it was assumed that he would have an interest in Miss Elizabeth, but not that she should ever have an interest in him. Lady Louisa suspected that she was undeserving of even his friendship, so shallow were her thoughts. Hardly, my dear, her mother said, waving her off. I suspect he could not be more than thirty-five. That is about your age, is it not, Lady Louisa? Lady Hendrickson said with a narrowing of her cat-like eyes. It was meant to be a slight, Lady Louisa was sure of it. Actually, I am only twenty-six, Aunt Sarah, Lady Louisa retorted. Scarcely a year older than you, Elizabeth. Isn't that right? She added, turning her head to her offending cousin. I suppose that is true, Miss Elizabeth said, brushing at her petticoats. Oh dear, I didn't mean offence, Lady Hendrickson said with a laugh, though she clearly did. I only meant that this might be a very promising match for you. Surely you must come, for it would be a wonderful opportunity. I don't know if I like that idea. Miss Elizabeth chimed in, not liking her mother inviting what Miss Elizabeth thought of as her biggest competitor for the Duke's heart right into his home. No, it will be perfect, Lady Hendrickson said in a manner that meant the matter was settled. She can help influence the Colonel our way. In turn, the Colonel will have a chance to influence the Duke. This will work vastly better than our previous plan that was muddled by the Duke's appearance at the public dance. Lady Louisa was astonished at her aunt's manipulative ways. Even something that might have been of little consequence to her was formed and shaped into a way to preserve her daughter's claim on the Duke. Of course you would be more than happy to speak to the Colonel about Elizabeth, wouldn't you, dear? 
Lady Hendrickson said down her nose at Lady Louisa. She took a steadying breath before answering. Never in her life had she felt such a strong desire to borrow the personality of her best friend, Isabella, and speak at that moment exactly what she was thinking. Instead, Lady Louisa remembered her promise to her mother, practically chanted it in her head before answering. I would be more than happy to, Lady Louisa said with as steady a tone as best she could. The dinner party was set in four days' time. Miss Elizabeth spoke incessantly for the next three days on why it had been arranged so far in the future. The logical answer would be to first give the ladies time to respond and then allow time for the hosts to organise the event. Miss Elizabeth would hear none of this. She was completely convinced the real reason was because the Dukey would be having several similar parties with other families in the county to find his best fit. It was deeply offensive and troubling to her that the Hendrickson invitation was so far in the future. How could he possibly have other ladies to see of more importance than her? Every day for the next several days, all conversation circled around this fact, with Miss Elizabeth's mother doing her best to assure that, to the best of her knowledge, no other families had attended to Basson Park. Lady Louisa often wondered if Lady Hendrickson sent one of the servants to watch the street. Now that Lady Louisa knew that Mentheath House was one of only a handful of houses that led down the road with Basson Park at the end of the lane, Lady Louisa would not have put it past her aunt to do such a thing. With each daily and sometimes hourly report that still no other carriage had yet passed by their house on the way to Basson, Lady Louisa was almost sure that a sentry was posted at the head of Mentheath's private lane at all hours, day and night. I went to visit with the Jensen sisters yesterday, and Dorcas would not stop her incessant chatting over the public dance, Miss Elizabeth said, over dinner on the night before their invite to dine with the Duke. She claims the Duke danced with her twice. I assured her that I was the only one that he danced with twice. I am sure if propriety had allowed it, he would have danced with me a third time. How preposterous of her to claim such a thing, Lady Hendrickson agreed. Lady Louisa did her best not to roll her eyes as she dug yet another article of clothing from the darning basket at her feet. She looked over at Miss Mary to her right. Miss Mary, like Lady Louisa, was of few words. Lady Louisa didn't mind the silence from her younger cousin, but would have preferred it to be filled with anything other than more discussion from her aunt and eldest cousin. I assured her as politely as I could that it wasn't possible, as I already knew every lady he danced with that night, and that I was the only one he danced with twice, Miss Elizabeth said, lifting her chin. Well, what did she say to that? Lady Hendrickson encouraged, much to Lady Louisa's disappointment. She had the nerve to produce her dance card and show me the Duke's name on it twice. I can't believe it, Lady Hendrickson said with audible shock. Do you believe it to be valid? Absolutely not. The second signature was the last dance of the night. I can scarcely say it resembled the first, which I can confirm the Duke of Rowland did dance with her. She had the nerve to put his name on the last dance. Miss Elizabeth ended with a laugh. Lady Hendrickson joined in with her daughter's merriment. What a wretched thing, Lady Hendrickson added, when they both had regained composure. I bet she sat all alone for that last dance and was too ashamed to admit such a thing, so she forged a name in its empty place, Miss Elizabeth suggested. It is sad, really, Lady Hendrickson said as she opened her fan and began to cool herself after such an episode of joy. Some people will lower themselves to such shameful things, all in the name of securing something they had no right going after in the first place. Lady Louisa laid down her work at her aunt's words. Her mouth audibly dropped open. She checked herself quickly, however, and only exchanged glances with Miss Mary for a small second. She could see in her young cousin's eyes that she had thought the exact same thing at the exact same moment. They smiled wryly at each other, both feeling a little guilty for thinking such an unchristian thought about Lady Hendrickson, but also satisfied that each of them had not been the only one to think such a thing. For surely if at least two or more people drew the same conclusion about a person's character, wasn't it more likely that the conclusion reflected the truth? Chapter 15
All three Hendrickson ladies were dressed in their finest as they left the carriage in front of Basson Park. Lady Louisa, who had taken the time to dress in her lemon-coloured silk dinner gown, couldn't believe the sight of the estate upon exiting the carriage. She had only seen one other great house, and that was Wintercrest Manor. Basson Park seemed to rival it in grandeur. She supposed that was the look of most estates outside of London, and wondered for a moment if her brother's county seat not too far away from her current residence had the same majesty. They were welcomed up the stone steps by a waiting footman who opened the door for them to enter. Waiting just inside the hallway was another footman to show them to the hosting party in the library. Lady Louisa watched each shut door they passed by as they made their way deeper inside the estate house. She was amazed by the number of rooms and bustling people all around. She wondered what each oaken door held behind its thick barrier. Perhaps some were fine drawing rooms or offices. Others might have been massive dance halls like the one she was shown by Isabella at Wintercrest Manor. Though she had a hard time imagining any spectacle as wondrous as Wintercrest's dance hall. Each lady was announced in order, much to Lady Hendrickson's displeasure, before they entered the room. Inside they found a warmly lit vast space full of books and various arranged sitting areas. Though there was not much chill in the night air, a fire glowed in the large fireplace for comfort. As each lady entered, all three gentlemen stood to greet them. Lady Louisa only stole a look at the Duke for a second before promising herself not to look again. The effect of his dress had already done its damage, however. The Duke of Rowland was meticulously dressed in a navy coat with cream undershirt and tan pantaloons with high black boots. His black hair seemed to reflect the firelight like ebony glass, and his eyes seemed all the fiercer green as he bowed respectfully to the welcomed ladies. His eyes only met Lady Louisa's for a second, but he couldn't help but hold his gaze on her long after she had looked away from him. She looked rather breathtaking in her soft-coloured dress that shone in the light. Next to her simple beauty, her aunt and cousin seemed well overdone in their elaborate frocks and frills. He reminded himself with a clearing of his throat that he was not to speak to this lady again. In fact, he was supposed to be disappointed to see her after their last exchange. For some reason, however, in the time they had spent apart since the public ball and that night, he had entirely forgotten why her words had seemed so offensive to him. He decided that if she were to speak to him this night, not only would he be as cordial as he was raised to be, but he would also be willing to brush away old opinions and start anew. With that sentiment, he invited the whole party of ladies to join them on some sofas for light refreshments before dinner was served. I have set up a table for a nice game of cards, if anyone should wish to join, Colonel Jasper said, after all parties were comfortable and settled in the room. I am quite sure that Lady Louisa would be happy to, Lady Hendrickson said. She does love a good game of cards, don't you, dear? Lady Louisa looked at her aunt with a bit of surprise. Not once had she entered into a game of cards at her aunt's house. Though she was in no way averse to the game, she was, however, irritated that the purpose of her aunt's words was only to tease her, because of the mistaken opinion that Lady Hendrickson had formed about the Colonel's affections. I would be more than happy to join you, Lady Louisa said with a smile at the Colonel. He was a very kind man, and she did enjoy being in his company. It would be a pleasant diversion for her, and at least keep her from having to converse with the Duke. Perhaps Miss Mary could join us as well, Lady Louisa asked, turning to her youngest cousin. Lady Louisa was quite sure that Miss Mary would not have volunteered to do so on her own. At the same time, it was easy to see that she had a growing affection for the Colonel, and was rather hoping for the chance to spend time with him. A splendid suggestion, the Colonel said approving the idea as he looked over at Miss Mary. She blushed shyly as their eyes met, and in that instant Lady Louisa was sure that the growing feelings were mutual. Roland looked over at the seated trio as they quietly moved cards around on the table with occasional giggles and conversation. He was happy to see his friend in such high spirits as he enjoyed the game with Miss Mary. He had wondered at Lady Hendrickson's instant suggestion that Lady Louisa join Jasper 
when it seemed so clear to him that both Jasper and the youngest Hendrickson daughter had eyes only for each other. He turned back to his own party. Currently, his uncle was deep in conversation with the two ladies, discussing the vast property and various amenities that it held. He rather felt like a horse for sale at that moment, as his uncle outlined all the benefits of his purchase. He wondered if soon he would be made to bear his teeth for Miss Hendrickson's inspection. Would you say that you have found your return to England very pleasing then, Mr. Vaughan? Lady Hendrickson asked, to keep the conversation going. It is always good to return home, Mr. Vaughan said, though Roland knew it to be a blatant lie. I do miss the entertaining distractions of foreign lands, however. I haven't found the same excitement here. Please do tell us a tale of some of your adventures then. I do find the idea of travelling to distant lands rather thrilling, Lady Hendricks encountered with a lie of her own. As Roland's uncle wove a tale of elephant rides and exotic dancing, Roland's eyes strayed back to the card table. He wondered if perhaps he could excuse himself and join them. The trio seemed to be enjoying themselves far more than he was. I dare say we have just as many wonderful distractions here in England, especially for you, Your Grace, who has spent such little time in your homeland, Lady Hendrickson said, encouraging him into their conversation. Really, Lady Hendrickson? Roland turned and answered obediently. Perhaps you would be kind enough to give me some pointers on the matter. As you said, I left the country just after my schooling and know so little of the land. Well, to start with, there are the hunts. I know fine gentlemen find those very exciting. Of course, there is also London during the season. It might be a wonderful event for you to attend next year. Though I do find it more exciting when one has a partner to share it with, she added with a smile towards her daughter. My Elizabeth was sent to London for improvements in her skills from Masters and found it most pleasing, didn't you, dear? She added to initiate a conversation between the Duke and her daughter. Quite so, Miss Hendrickson said without delay. The musicals and plays during the season are wonderful to watch, Your Grace. You really must try to watch a few before returning to your adventures. I suspect it will be some time before the Duke returns to adventuring, if at all, Mr Vaughan interjected. Yes, the Duke agreed, though his heart was not in it. I rather feel an extended break would suit me fine. I have found the country very diverting thus far and enjoy the idea of spending many more years getting to know my homeland. Many find an open-air carriage ride around the town a wonderful opportunity to get to know the land better. Have you done such yet, Your Grace? Miss Hendrickson asked, fluttering her honey eyes at him. I have been to Market Day in the village, but other than that I have not seen much of the county beyond my own estate. Perhaps you would be willing to join me and guide me around the best sites one day? The Duke asked, knowing this was the purpose of her question. Miss Hendrickson gifted him a seductive smile and waved her fan before her, as if the thought was a little embarrassing to her. I would be more than happy to, Your Grace, she replied. The Duke studied Miss Hendrickson then, considering that she could very well be his intended wife. She indeed was nice enough to look at. She seemed to have the grace and poise of a duchess and would quickly find her way into society. There was something about her, however, that unnerved him. He realised somewhat reluctantly that it was the same quality that had discouraged Lady Louisa when last they spoke. She was limited to only what was expected of her. He told himself just as there was more to him, there had to be more to Miss Hendrickson. Yes, she was behaving a very certain way in such settings because she felt the need to say the things he wanted to hear. He only needed to give her a chance to be more. If he could find the time, perhaps really take her on a carriage ride later this week, he could learn who the real Miss Hendrickson was and no longer find her wanting. He had rather hoped in such a private setting that she would have relaxed and shown more of her true self instead of being the same lady he had danced with at the public ball or had been upon their first introduction at Menthith House. Roland considered the overbearing presence of her mother at her side, though. Perhaps if he got Miss Hendrickson without her mother's presence, she would be more willing to let her mask down and be who she actually was. Even in the few visits he had with Lady Hendrickson, 
Roland had already seen how clearly overbearing she could be with her two daughters. He would have to bide his time yet again, and wait until he could get to know Miss Hendrickson on her own, before he was ready to make up his mind about her. Finally, dinner was announced, and the Duke couldn't be more relieved to leave the room and the meaningless chit-chat for a new location. Chapter 16 Lady Louisa sat down at the table with the Duke at the head on her left, his uncle on her right, and Lady Hendrickson across from her on the Duke's left. She could tell that Miss Elizabeth was rather irritated that Lady Louisa was on the Duke's other side instead of her. It was custom, however, to seat oneself by rank, and so Miss Elizabeth was placed beside her mother with her sister on the other side. On Lady Louisa's right was Mr. Vauhan, and next to him was the colonel. Lady Louisa was satisfied with the fact that the colonel sat across from Mary so that they could continue their somewhat intimate conversation that had begun during the card game earlier. She was quite apprehensive, however, to be so close to the Duke. After their last meeting, they had agreed that neither had more to say to the other. What could she possibly do now, seated next to him? It would be rude not to at least make light conversation. You must have my Elizabeth play for you after the meal, Your Grace, Lady Hendrickson said during the third course. She is very practised, and you will find her music and voice beautiful. That would be a wonderful delight, the Duke said, as he looked down the table at the expectant Miss Elizabeth. Satisfied with his answer, she whispered something over to her sister. Do you also play, Lady Louisa? the Duke asked, hoping to include her in some conversation. She had been very quiet for the whole meal, having only exchanged a few polite words with Mr Vaughan. Up until this point, most of the talking had occurred between the Duke, Lady Hendrickson, and Mr. Vaughan. Lady Louisa looked over at the Duke, shocked that he'd posed her a question. I do, Your Grace, she finally said, glancing at her aunt before looking back down in embarrassment. But I fear not as well as my cousin. She far surpasses my abilities. Nonetheless, perhaps we will make a concert of the night, he suggested. It was clear that Lady Louisa was being intimidated by her aunt to stay far out of the picture for the evening. He thought it a rather silly thing. Of course, Lady Hendrickson wanted her eldest daughter to be the centre of attention for him, but that was no cause for him to ignore his other guest. What a wonderful idea, Lady Hendrickson said. Mary shall sing for us as well, then. She doesn't have her sister's skills on the instrument, but she has a rather agreeable voice to hear. It was clear that Lady Hendrickson was keen on keeping the focus on her own daughters at all costs. Of course, her eldest was preferable to her cause, but she would choose either over Lady Louisa. I am not terribly skilled, but I can pluck a few keys, Colonel Jasper announced a bit bashfully. Perhaps I might accompany you, Miss Mary. I would like that very much, Miss Mary said with a rose to her pale skin. Lady Louisa smiled too clearly seeing the intent between the two. Her eyes flashed to the Duke, and she was surprised to see him just as satisfied with their interaction. They had a brief moment of silent civility as they both shared the knowledge of Jasper's and Miss Mary's secret feelings for each other. May I ask, Lady Louisa, if it is not music that you find yourself drawn to, what talents do you enjoy practising instead? Perhaps taking long walks? After all, I have caught you doing so twice now, he added with a playful tease. Lady Louisa saw her aunt's eyes fall on her in frustration. She didn't like the fact that the Duke had apparently met her twice and not just once on the road, as Lady Hendrickson had previously thought. I can't say that I had enjoyed the exercise extensively before coming here, Your Grace. But the fresh air of the country has been so invigorating, it is so much different than London. Had you spent most of your time in London then and never returned to your father's county seat? My understanding is that it is not far off from this county. No, it is not far, Lady Louisa confirmed. But my mother enjoyed town so much we rarely left it. I have been to the Duke of Wintercrest's estate on a few occasions to visit with a very good friend of mine, but outside of that, I rarely left London. And you didn't find that part of the country very enjoyable? He continued conversationally. Well, it wasn't that it was miserable. The weather didn't afford leaving the house much when I was there. 
I may have just arrived during bad parts of the season, though. So now you are finding the area here most exhilarating, Roland assumed. And have you been to visit your brother at all, since he would be so close? Or did he also choose to stay in town as your parents have? He is actually in the colonies right now, or I suppose what used to be the colonies with his new wife. Really, the Duke said, his eyes sparkling with interest. I have yet to see that land. Pray tell, what does your brother think of it? He is very much of the adventurous mentality, much like yourself, Your Grace. He and his wife went to oversee some property my father had acquired there before his death. In the course of the trip, Abigail had a boy, and so they are choosing to stay until he is strong enough for the voyage. His wife went with him? the Duke said with surprise. I know it might have been a little unorthodox, but they were newly wed at the time and quite unwilling to separate. Moreover, Abigail is just as stubborn as my brother. I believe if Colton had tried to leave without her, she would have found a way to board the ship anyway, Lady Louisa added with a fond smile. You seem to have great affection for Lord Gilchrist. You two must have been very close growing up, Roland said with a bit of longing for the companionship of a sibling in his younger years. Yes, we were always very close. Colton was sort of a protector of mine growing up. I couldn't be happier for him, of course, and I do love Abigail dearly as well. It is hard to see one marry and separate themselves from their family, to create one of their own. Lady Louisa was overcome with sadness at that moment as she thought about her brother and how long it had been since she had received a letter from him. She knew that change was always inevitable in life, but still, it didn't make the process any less painful. Well, you have yet to expose your great talent, for you must have one as all ladies seem to, Roland said, sensing her sadness at the thought of her brother and wanting to distract her. Perhaps I am one of the few that has no great talent, as one has yet to come to mind, Lady Louisa said modestly. Certainly, it is your seamstress ability, Miss Elizabeth joined in. She spoke with admiration for Lady Louisa but Lady Louisa knew that there was no sincerity behind it. For truly, since she has been here, she has done wonders with clothing repairs and embellishments. She is quite diligent at her work as well. One could say she was just as hard-working as one of our maids. There was the slight that Lady Louisa knew would come. Miss Elizabeth announced that her skills in life were that of a servant and nothing more. I could see how such skills could be a very useful talent, Roland countered feeling a sudden strong need to protect the lady. I only mean to be useful when I can. I don't believe I'm any better than most ladies. Oh, do speak of the garden that you and Miss Mary have been working on so well these past weeks, Colonel Jasper chimed in. Miss Mary informed me earlier that you both have been out there every day tending to its needs. I feel that I have learned more from Miss Mary in that respect, as it is a new skill to me, Lady Louisa countered. I have found great interest in reading books on medicinal plants, and Miss Mary has shown me the way to put that reading into practice. And what plans do you have for your medicinal garden, then? The Duke asked both Lady Louisa and Miss Mary, when all your hard work comes to fruition, of course. The two ladies looked at each other, neither having actually thought about that. I'm afraid we are not entirely sure, Your Grace, as I suspect this is new territory for the both of us. Miss Mary replied. Well, then I must introduce you to Mrs. Vance. She is my cook, and I know is very knowledgeable about such things. Oh, I know of Mrs. Vance, though I have never met her myself, Miss Mary continued. Bess has spoken of her on occasion to me. She must have been a midwife of sorts in the village before coming into your employment, Your Grace. Yes, Roland concurred. She is such a wonderful lady and has often told me that she struggles to keep up with those she helps now that she is so far away and busy here. I'm sure we both, Lady Louisa said, looking at Miss Mary, would be happy to assist her and her patients in any way we could. I know Mrs Vance would greatly appreciate that, and I am rather indebted to her, so any way to lighten her labour I am encouraged to try. Indebted how, Your Grace? Miss Hendrickson inquired not liking that she had had no input in the conversation for some time. Well, 
I had trouble acclimating to the country when I first arrived and hadn't been feeling very well. She seemed to know all the right medicines necessary to get me back on my feet. That is how I learned of her unique skill set in the first place. I find it is such an admirable career for a working woman, Your Grace, Miss Hendrickson continued. How providential you had her here in your house when needed. Surely it is important knowledge for any and all, Miss Mary interjected, for we will all take ill sometimes or know someone who will be in need of such aid. I dare say it is a life skill all should learn. Miss Hendrickson shot a sideways dagger at her sister for the contradiction. It was a momentary lapse on her part, and Miss Mary quickly corrected it by abandoning the conversation. Lady Louisa seethed that her young cousin, who had so much in her and plenty to say, was always being intimidated by her mother and sister to stay within the boundaries they insisted ought to be preserved. It was also clear to Roland that the train of conversation had displeased Lady Hendrickson and her eldest daughter, most likely because it was not in praise of Miss Hendrickson herself. He reminded himself that he was here to begin relations with the Miss, and that this should be his sole focus. Miss Hendrickson, please do tell me what songs you had in mind to play for us tonight, he said to return the conversation back to a dull topic where no real discussion could be made or honest opinions might surface. Chapter 17 Doesn't she sing beautifully? Lady Hendrickson whispered to Roland as they sat in the drawing room. He was actually surprised to see it dustless and ready for them. He didn't think he had entered this room at all since arriving at Basson Park. Yes, it is very relaxing, Roland said for lack of a better word. He had been listening to Miss Hendrickson impressing him with her skills on the pianoforte for the last twenty minutes. Though she did play fine and sang well, it was all very slow and boring to him. Plus, being after such a filling meal, he was slightly struggling to keep his eyes open. Roland looked at the other guests, sitting and listening. He caught his uncle yawning and smiled inwardly that at least he wasn't the only one being bored. His eyes fell on Lady Louisa then, who sat next to Jasper in her golden dress. She was smiling at something Jasper had just told her before she passed it along to Miss Mary. He wished he knew what they were saying. He felt so detached from the others and really exhausted from trying to please Miss Hendrickson and say the words that she wanted to hear. I was so glad that your friend, Colonel Jasper, wrote to Louisa and personally invited her tonight, Lady Hendrickson whispered to Roland, noticing his distraction from her daughter. He did what? Roland asked, surprised. After the rake convinced him that Lady Louisa would not want to come any more than he did, Jasper wrote to her and insisted she came. For what possible reason? Yes, I believe he is charmed by her. I'm sure he wanted to make sure that she knew she was included in the invitation so that he wouldn't miss a chance to get to know her better. What? No, forgive me, but I don't think that is correct, Roland began. How was he to tell her that Jasper had already informed Roland of his desire to get to know Miss Mary better? Don't worry, Your Grace. I made sure to encourage such affection to Lady Louisa, Lady Hendrickson tried to assure the Duke. She no doubt thought his negative remark was on account of Jasper's lower status. I assured Louisa she would be lucky to have such a man. I know we are all new acquaintances, but I can already see that Your Grace has impeccable taste in friends and after all, I am sure it is realistically her only chance. She should take what she can, Lady Hendrickson added with a sly, gossipy tone to her voice. And just think, she continued before he was able to respond. It will give more opportunity for us all to meet again and again. I know your grace can agree that this evening has already been most enjoyable. Yes, of course, Roland agreed without any heart behind it. He wasn't sure what irritated him more, that Jasper had acted without his knowledge and insisted the one lady he rather not see be here this night, or the fact that Lady Hendrickson had just systematically insulted that lady. If she spoke like this to him, he could only imagine what she said to her in person. Again he felt the strong desire to protect Lady Louisa from the harsh conditions of her aunt's house. Later that night, as things were finally winding down, 
Roland thought he might get some relief from the constant pretend interest he had in Miss Hendrickson. His uncle approached him. I find her a very promising prospect, Mr Vaughan said. I can also tell she is most willing. I suspect if you proposed here on the spot you would be married in a fortnight, he said with a jolly smile on his aged face. I don't doubt your theory, but I can assure you that no proposal will be happening tonight or any other night. Why ever not? She is a perfect specimen. She will serve our purpose well. Forgive me, uncle, but I am not yet settled on the fact of a spouse serving a purpose well and nothing more. I would like to also have at least some admiration for the lady. Miss Hendrickson has many admirable qualities, Mr Vaughan retorted. Yes, I am aware. I have heard of nothing else all night long, Roland said half under his breath. The scolding look from his uncle told him it wasn't quiet enough. I know you are insistent on this matter. Very insistent, in fact. I only said I would withhold your inheritance until you married because I wanted to give you incentive. And because my parents' will states you ought to do so. I shall either get married or receive my inheritance when I reach the age of thirty. Look, I understand you are a bit reluctant to take on a wife. It is necessary for you, unfortunately. I wouldn't be doing your parents justice if I didn't do all that I thought they would want me to do on your behalf. I just think I need more time, Uncle. I want to find someone that I can feel compatible with. Though Roland said this, it wasn't the truth. In truth, he wanted someone who was willing to accept the marriage and let him go his own way. He had originally thought that Miss Hendrickson would be the one. She seemed so desperate to marry his title at all costs. A night with her, however, drastically changed things. She was so self-centred, he didn't think he could stand being in a room with her for long, let alone produce an heir with her. Both men stopped their conversation when they saw Lady Louisa making her way towards them. Its continuation would have to wait for a more private setting. Forgive me for interrupting. I wonder if I might have your permission to ask a footman to show me to Mrs. Vance. I hope to set up a time to perhaps learn from her when she is not otherwise engaged. I will be happy to take you to her myself, the Duke said, glad to remove himself from the conversation with his uncle. Oh, that is not necessary, Lady Louisa assured him, not wanting to be any more bother to the Duke. After all, had they not agreed that they would not be in each other's company when it could be helped? Surely this situation qualified. I insist, he said with a smile, offering his arm for Lady Louisa to take. She hesitated for just a moment before taking it. They walked silently out of the room and down the hall with all eyes on them. Lady Louisa felt scandalised and had a feeling she would pay for this later from her aunt. Sorry, but I just needed to get out of there and breathe some fresh air the Duke said in a hushed whisper when they were out the still open doors. Frederick, Lady Louisa was wondering if she might have an audience with Mrs Vance if she isn't terribly busy. I'm sure that Mrs Vance would be more than happy to, Your Grace. Shall I have her meet you in the breakfast room? Frederick asked with the astute air of a seasoned butler. That sounds perfect. I will escort Lady Louisa there now. He walked her silently across the hall and through another door. It was easy to see why this was called the breakfast room. It had large windows with floor-length curtains drawn back. Out in the darkness, Lady Louisa could just make out the rose bushes she had seen coming in. She expected it was a beautiful view every morning. He walked Lady Louisa over to sit on a sofa, while a footman came in to light candelabras around the room. I feel you are going through too much trouble for me, Your Grace, Lady Louisa said a little uneasy. Nonsense, I would have taken any opportunity to leave that drawing room in truth. She looked up at the Duke, who had yet to take a seat. He did look very irritated from this angle. It didn't seem like you were not enjoying yourself, Lady Louisa said in honesty. Yes, I suppose it is all that false representation of myself that I apparently am so good at, and you detest so vehemently. I don't detest you, Lady Louisa said. He looked down at her with disbelief written on his face. If it were so, Lady Louisa continued, 
I simply would not come at all. I believe life is too short to spend it on things that only bring you unhappiness. I believe the reason you are here tonight is that Jasper insisted you should, though I have no idea why he would care to do such a thing. Lady Louisa was surprised that the Duke was aware of the letter she got. Lady Hendrickson informed me that you received a note from him. She is under the impression that he has an interest in you, he added with a chuckle. Lady Louisa was a little dismayed by his laugh. Was it really so abhorrent that the Colonel could have an interest in one such as her? Lady Louisa did her best to control her hurt feelings. Colonel Jasper had asked her to give the Duke a second chance. She had come at his request. It would seem, however, that the man was everything she had thought, and perhaps more. It was one thing to politely pretend to enjoy an evening you weren't enjoying. It was quite another for him to suggest that she was unworthy of affection from anyone in his acquaintance. She cleared her throat before speaking. I am terribly sorry for the confusion, Your Grace, she said rather coolly. Perhaps I should have corrected my aunt right there, but she would not see things any other way. I was unwilling to explain to her the true reasoning for my hesitation to come tonight. I probably should have. I will be sure to correct my aunt's gross miscalculation that any man might have an interest in a lady such as me at my earliest possibility. He looked down at her with narrowed green eyes and opened his mouth to speak. Before words could escape, the door opened and Mrs Vance walked into the room. Mrs Vance's hair was frizzed around her cap and her plump cheeks were flushed no doubt from rushing to the breakfast room as quickly as possible from all the way downstairs in the kitchen. Your ladyship, she said with a curtsy, I was told you wished to speak to me. I do hope that the meal was to your liking. Yes, Mrs Vance, Lady Louisa said, standing and turning all her attention to the cook. I was actually wondering if we could perhaps discuss another matter that you might help me with. I would be happy to help you in any way I can. Mrs. Vance said, standing as tall as she could muster for her robust size. I shall leave you two ladies to business then, the Duke announced. He turned to Lady Louisa and bowed politely. I bid you good evening. Before any more words could be uttered, he took three long strides and exited the room. He stopped for just a moment in the hall to tell Frederick to convey his apologies to the guests. He couldn't bear to go back into that room and pretend to enjoy himself after having received yet another hard hit from Lady Louisa. She always seemed to do her best to see nothing but the worst in him. Having given his message to the butler, he hurried up the stairs and to the privacy of his own quarters. He knew he would be reprimanded by his uncle on the morrow for such rude behaviour, but he cared very little for that at the moment. He was ready for this whole ordeal to be over and his life to go back to the way it was. If only he could find a way to make that a reality. Chapter 18 By the next morning, Lady Louisa was quite sure that she might have been a little quick to take offence. After such a long and tedious evening like the one before, a night of rest always seemed to clear things up. She was confused by his bidding her good night when he left her with Mrs Vance in the breakfast room. All was made clear after her discussion with the cook and returned to the drawing room. The Duke had never returned, stating that he was suddenly not feeling well and to please excuse him for the night. She then proceeded to be pestered by her aunt and elder cousin about what she could have possibly done or said to him to offend him so. She was still determined that if anyone should be hurt by their time in the breakfast room, it should be her. Perhaps he didn't mean the words to come out as they did, but he still said them. It had nothing to do with the jealous feelings welling deep down inside her every time she heard him compliment Miss Elizabeth. Lady Louisa had to admit that she was a bit relieved when they first spoke alone in that breakfast room, and he told her of the tedium he too felt over the night. She couldn't believe all that he had been subjected to from Miss Elizabeth, and then to take it with such an air of appreciation and flow of compliments. It was astonishing to Lady Louisa at first. But then it also solidified her opinion that the Duke was no more than a spineless creature who did and said anything to please others. How could someone like that ever be trusted when the fact of the matter was, they would say anything, 
disguise themselves in any way to get the desired result. Lady Louisa was determined to shake all ideas of the Duke promptly out of her head. This would be a complicated matter, as she would be seeing his cook later that afternoon. Mrs Vance was all too ready to help Lady Louisa with her medicinal garden endeavours. She even suggested that Lady Louisa return the following day from their discussion in the afternoon, so that she might show her around Mrs Vance's own medicinal herb garden. Perhaps if Lady Louisa had not been quite so exhausted at the time from listening to Miss Elizabeth's high-pitched singing all night long, she would have had the clarity of mind to suggest they meet elsewhere. As it was, the meeting was set, and Lady Louisa could not cancel it. I must confess I was very disappointed with your behaviour last night, Roland's uncle announced upon finally finding him sitting in the library. Uncle James, I know you are but I fear I have no way to make you feel better about the matter, Roland said, finding himself feeling decidedly defeated at the moment. He had spent the whole night in his room tossing in his bed, wondering how he could have said things in such a wrong way to Lady Louisa, and on two separate occasions. Even worse was the fact that he cared so much about it and didn't know why. I suggest you find one, Mr Vaughan said, sternly looking down at his nephew. It strongly resembled the way he had scolded him as a child. You could start by telling me why on earth you left your own dinner party without so much as a farewell. It was very embarrassing for me to see the ladies off after such an event. I couldn't bring myself to return to the room, Roland simply answered. Why ever not? Because I was sure that if I did, I would have told Miss Elizabeth Hendrickson what I truly thought of her incessant chatter about herself. Ugh, he said getting up from his seat and pacing the room. I could bear it no longer. I am tired of these stupid superficial games. If this is what it takes to get my inheritance, then I am quite ready to wait until my thirtieth birthday, uncle. You could force me to be a beggar on the streets until then, and I wouldn't care in the least. I cannot bring myself to marry at this time. I will not be subjected to pretending that I care when I don't. I have no desire to have a wife hold me down and I don't know that I ever will. My boy, Mr Vaughan said in a softer tone as he took his nephew's place on the cushioned chair. It is my fault, really, that you feel this way. I influenced you against such a thing. You must know that I am the exception to a rule that must be followed. Then perhaps I will follow it, perhaps I will not. Why does it matter so much that I am not an exception also? Because you have a title to think about. With no heir of your own and certainly none from me, there would be no one left. Do you really want your father's legacy and your grandfather's and great-grandfather's legacy to end in such a way? It is not always easy, these responsibilities we are born into, but this is yours and you must find a way to bear it. The sooner you do this, the better. There are certainly worse things in life, he added with a lopsided smile. Roland didn't answer, but instead stared into the unlit fireplace as he thought over his uncle's words. Listen, Lady Hendrickson suggested something last night, and I rather like the idea. Let us have a private ball here at the estate. We will invite all the ladies and respectable families in all the counties surrounding the area. Perhaps then you will find a girl who piques your interest. The problem is that all these ladies see is the Duke and not the man I am. They will not be themselves, and I won't be able to be myself. How am I to discern an agreeable match in such a situation? His uncle contemplated this for a few moments. It was clear that Roland was looking for that elusive fairy tale that children were fed, that he would find love. James Vaughan knew it to be a fantasy, and nothing more. We shall make it a masquerade ball, Mr Vaughan announced after a few moments of contemplation. No one will know one from the other if so one desires. In that way, you can find the truth and realise that your silly dream of a perfect match is nothing but that, a dream. And if I don't find someone to my liking, will I be forced to choose anyway or suffer the consequences? Roland asked his uncle with a weary look in his emerald eyes. His uncle gave a long huff. 
If I place you in a room full of eligible, beautiful women all hoping to marry you and yet you fail to find one to your liking, I will have to surmise that all my years influencing you have rotted you to the core, and there is no hope. I will be liberated from any guilt, knowing I did all I could for the sake of your parents. Your soul will be in your own hands, Mr. Vaughan announced, before rising from his seat and leaving the room. The arrangement seemed agreeable to Roland. It would give him a proper chance to search out a possible companion in earnest, and also free him of the obligation if he was unable to do so, which he found very likely. He thought if he would be able to hurry with the proceedings, then perhaps he could be done with the matter and set sail for the Indies before the winter storms settled in. With that hopeful thought in his head, he at once began to organise the preparations needed. Lady Louisa was very hesitant as she arrived at Basson Park. It was a massive estate, however, and the likelihood of her actually seeing the Duke was no doubt very small. It was an interaction she didn't want to deal with. In all honesty, she wasn't even entirely sure how she would deal with it. Luckily, when the butler, whom she recognised as Frederick, opened the door, he showed her straight to the kitchen without any interruption. There, all her attention was given to Mrs Vance, and all apprehension left her. The afternoon was first spent walking the gardens directly behind the kitchen. They were vast and glorious to behold. Though Mrs Vance couldn't grow everything she needed, she endeavoured to grow as much as possible right there on the property. She was sure that it made the produce that much sweeter to the taste. While they talked of various plants and herbs and their medicinal properties, Mrs Vance also shared a lot about herself. Mrs Vance had not grown up far from Basson Park, and her father even was a gardener of the property before the house was closed down for an extended time. Even after that, he still came to tend to the gardens and park in proximity to the estate. It was because of this dedication that the Duke sought her family out immediately upon his arrival. Though her father had passed, he had also given Mrs Vance all his knowledge of the land and the ability to produce incredible nourishment from it. Up until the Duke's return, she had solely used that knowledge to help others with any ailments in the village. Lady Louisa learned that the nearest doctor was at least a day's ride away. Mrs Vance was very often the only source of help in situations of illness, accident or birth. You must be very busy all the time, Lady Louisa remarked. I do feel poorly to know that I am taking up your free time when you must get so little of it. I don't mind it at all. In fact, I rather like having someone to pass knowledge on to, as I have no children of my own. I must admit, Mrs Vance said, looking around as if she was about to reveal a deep, dark secret. I have a bit of a selfish reason for it as well. And what is that? Lady Louisa asked. I was hoping if I showed you a thing or two, your ladyship wouldn't mind tending to those in need when I can't. It wouldn't be anything horrible. Just perhaps if a child goes sick or the like. I could show you what to do, and it would be a great relief to me knowing that someone was available when I couldn't be. Mrs Vance, I scarcely think you could have asked a more willing participant. Mrs Vance gave a sigh of relief at her words. Now, it seems you know enough about the various uses of plants, Mrs Vance said, while she rubbed her hands together as if they were truly now getting down to business. Yes, I have been studying the different herbs and their uses for a few months now. It is what inspired me to plant the garden here. I'm afraid I know nothing past what I have read in books, however. That's quite fine. Let's come inside. She waved and started the way back into the house. I will show you how to dry and press what needs it. Then we can move on to extractions and teas. Lady Louisa happily followed behind her teacher as they made their way back into the kitchen for the rest of her lesson that day. She promised herself to pay close attention to all the knowledge that Mrs Vance could impart so that she could also pass it along to Miss Mary. She was sure her youngest cousin would also find this work most interesting. Chapter 19 Over two hours later, Lady Louisa was making her way back down the Duke's gravel road, with her basket now full of dried herbs and various bottled concoctions, and a list of names to visit over the next week. She was feeling a little apprehensive about the task, 
but also relished actually having some use beyond adding embellishments to her aunt and cousin's clothing. Lady Louisa, she turned at the sound of her name being called. For a second she tensed at the male voice, thinking that it might be the Duke. Upon turning around, however, she was pleasantly surprised to see Colonel Jasper hurrying over to her. Good afternoon, Colonel, she said as he finally reached her. I'm so glad I ran into you. I was hoping to ask if your opinion of the Duke changed after last night. You two seem to be getting along well during the meal. Lady Louisa hesitated a moment longer. She wondered how much of the disaster that was the end of the evening she actually wanted to share with the gentleman. Unfortunately, though I can say that I have found a great many friends in the Duke's circle, I don't believe the Duke and I are ever destined to get along. May I ask why you concern yourself with this so much? Colonel Jasper looked down at her out of the corner of his eye as if the answer was so obvious. However, Lady Louisa suspected he would not speak the thoughts in his mind. I only wish that all of us can get along well to encourage more time together. For Miss Mary, no doubt, Lady Louisa added, nudging him with her shoulder. The Colonel joined her as she continued to walk down the lane, and when she teased, he gave his own youthful nudge in return. Though he was much older than her, and very much older than Miss Mary, Lady Louisa thought the two of them made a very fine match indeed. Perhaps being able to enjoy Miss Mary's company as often as possible is part of the reason. Well, you can do that easily enough without me. In fact, I might encourage such a thing, Lady Louisa added thinking about how Miss Elizabeth and her aunt still insisted that the Colonel nurtured some affection for her. Well, I said, it is only part of the reason, the Colonel stated without further explanation. Lady Louisa looked up at the Colonel, hoping to glean other reasons from his facial expression. All she caught, however, was the shimmer of light off of the grey hair at either side of his temples. She rather thought it made him look very distinguished. I suppose you plan to keep your other reason a secret from me. I do. Well then, I'm not sure if I can condone your courtship of my younger cousin, and in fact may have to protest to Lady Hendrickson as well, Lady Louisa said with her chin out sarcastically. I don't think a fine lady such as yourself would ever do such a thing. I may have to, I mean, Lady Louisa continued, as if the ideas were all coming to her and seemed rather appalling. Not only do you seem to have secret agendas, you are also a military man. Does that not mean that Miss Mary would move around often with you as the militia stations are changed? How would Lady Hendrickson feel to lose her youngest daughter from her presence? Well, I am happy to inform you that since meeting Miss Mary, I have been considering selling my commission and staying here in the area. Lady Louisa stopped for a moment, surprised. You are. I had no idea. I was only joking. I never meant... She seemed to stumble on her own words in embarrassment. I know, he simply replied. Honestly, I was considering it from the start. Rowland is really my only family, so if I am to sell my commission, this is where I will stay. I guess it all depends on Rowland and his decision to leave or stay at Basson indefinitely. Why would he not stay? I suppose he would go to town for the seasons, but don't most lords settle in their county home upon marrying? I don't think Roland has quite got the adventuring bone out of his body yet. In his mind, he will marry and then return to his travels, leaving his wife here. I don't think any wife would enjoy that prospect, who would marry him while knowing this intention of his. A woman not caring if he was around or not. A woman looking for the elevation in status more than the man, I suppose. Even still, Lady Louisa hesitated to agree with him. I still can't imagine anyone marrying within such parameters. She thought back to when he had initially spoken to her and asked for assistance. Had he hoped she would seek out a desperate lady caring more for her own elevation in position and not having any desire to have companionship with the man? Trust me, I have tried to talk him out of his madness. He has yet to see reason. I have a feeling that until he actually meets a maiden that interests him truly, he will have no desire to change his previous lifestyle. He looked down at Lady Louisa with a knowing eye. Men are a fickle species, 
we tend to find things that work well for us and then like to stay that way. When change is pressed upon us, we fight it until we realise the value of it. Roland has yet to see the value. Or, I suppose in his case, find the value. Precisely, Colonel Jasper agreed. Colonel Jasper was kind enough to walk Lady Louisa all the way back to Menthieth House. Much to Miss Mary's delight, he also agreed to stay the afternoon for a light picnic luncheon. Lady Louisa couldn't help but watch the two interact with each other, knowing that very likely they might be joined together. The age difference seemed inconsequential. Miss Mary was very mature for such a young lady, and he was quite youthful at heart. Lady Louisa was amazed that her aunt could not see the blossoming romance between the two. Lady Hendrickson still insisted on recommending Lady Louisa to the Colonel at every opportunity, and even couldn't help but whisper to Miss Elizabeth that she wasn't surprised that he had walked Lady Louisa home. Lady Louisa was inclined to let the illusion play out for the benefit of her youngest cousin, however. Lady Hendrickson and Miss Elizabeth never truly painted. Colonel Jasper in a good light when they spoke of him. Though Lady Louisa couldn't see how they found fault in such a gracious and kind man, they seemed to find a way to do it. Lady Louisa was sure that Lady Hendrickson would not approve of the man for her daughter at this time. Lady Louisa only hoped that, if she bought some time for the two of them to grow a relationship together without her aunt being aware of it, then Lady Hendrickson would come around afterwards when the opportunity to know him better presented itself. The rest of the week went on quite smoothly. Lady Louisa went to town four more times with her basket of herbs and list of patients. At first she was timid and shy as she knocked on each door. By the beginning of the next week, she felt she knew most people in the village well enough that she was no longer filled with trepidation when she stood on each threshold. Miss Mary happily went with her as many times as Lady Hendrickson would allow it. Unfortunately, that was not often, and when it did happen, it would be preceded by a lengthy discussion on who they would be attending to. Apparently, Lady Hendrickson only found specific people in the village acceptable for her daughters to associate with. While Lady Louisa could understand wanting to see to your daughter's safety, she also thought some of her aunt's objections were a little silly and uncalled for. On the afternoon of the following week, Lady Louisa returned from her trip to see little Jemmy, who was in bed sick with a rather nasty chest cold and was hoping to spend the rest of the day in the garden and away from her aunt. Instead, she entered the house to find great commotion and excitement. Instead of heading straight back to the garden like she had wished to, she removed her hat and gloves and made her way to the drawing room. Inside, she saw all three ladies standing and talking excitedly. Even Miss Mary, who often kept her cool when the others didn't, was joining in the merriment. Whatever is going on? Lady Louisa asked, intrigued. All three ladies' pairs of eyes turned and looked at her. Oh, you're back, Lady Hendrickson said, deflating. We have all been invited to a masquerade ball. Miss Mary said. The two older ladies looked at her, not necessarily happy that she shared the news, though there would have been no way to help it. Really, Lady Louisa said, catching on to the excitement, I am sure it will all seem rather dull for you. You must attend so many balls during a season in London. I wouldn't be offended at all if you didn't wish to come, Lady Hendrickson added. Lady Louisa was really starting to feel tired of her aunt's dislike. She had started feeling that she had given this family relationship her best efforts for her mother's benefit, and that she had no desire to do it any longer. If it were not for the people whom she had been helping in the village, no doubt she would have returned to London already. Actually, I have never been to a masquerade ball before. It sounds entertaining, and I do wish to attend if you would allow it, Lady Hendrickson. Oh well, I suppose if you want to so badly she said with an exaggerated look to her face. Will it be in the public tent again? Lady Louisa asked. It is even better, Miss Mary said. The Duke of Rowland will be hosting it at Basson Park. Aren't private balls just wonderful? I have also heard that he has invited every fine family in three counties. Yes, Lady Hendrickson said, now turning to her youngest daughter, something she didn't often do. 
That means that not only will your sister have an opportunity to win over her match, but you too may find a lord worth your while. I can't say that I need a chance to win over the Duke. I am sure I have already done so, Miss Elizabeth said haughtily. If that were the case, my dear, her mother retorted, then he wouldn't be having the ball at all. Clearly he is still looking, and you have not done enough to impress him. Miss Elizabeth sat down in a sulk. She was not accustomed to being chastened by her mother or being told that her charms were not working. We must order dresses right away, Lady Hendrickson announced, ignoring her daughter's pouting. And then there is the costume aspect that we must consider. I suspect most ladies will make them costumes, so we must begin to think of the same before we order the garments. I do hope that they will be ready. The ball is on such short notice. How short, Lady Hendrickson? Lady Louisa asked, still having not actually seen the invitation. Only two weeks. I am not sure if even Mrs Esquire at the dress shop can complete three dresses in such time, especially since she will no doubt have many orders, Miss Mary chimed in. That is a concern, Lady Hendrickson said as she too sat and began to ponder the problem. She absent-mindedly fiddled with a lace ribbon on her black dress as she considered the predicament. She certainly would not like to attend in a gown worn in the past, no matter the cost and the fact that the house was already short of funds. She would have her daughters shine that night. Lady Hendrickson did feel she shone the most in the type of situations where the skill of mind had to be employed in order to solve problems in a unique way. Perhaps we could have her make us the basics of the garments and send them to us to embellish on our own. After all, Lady Louisa is so good at her sewing skills, there is no doubt that she could turn them out perfectly in time. I would be happy to help Lady Hendrickson. My only concern would be the time I spend in the village helping the ill in Mrs Vance's place. I'm not sure I will have much time for sewing. Well then, you will just stop going to the village. It is as simple as that, Lady Hendrickson replied. I don't mean to offend you, Lady Hendrickson, Lady Louisa said as delicately as she could, but I feel their needs far outweigh the needs of embellishing dresses for a dance. Miss Elizabeth scoffed at her words. She glanced sideways at her mother, apparently looking for any chance to get back in her good graces. Lady Hendrickson had raised herself to her full-seated height and narrowed her already small eyes on Lady Louisa. I did hope that having you here in my home would be a great relief to me in such a time of need. I am sorry if that is an inconvenience to you. Though now that I look at the invitation, she continued, glancing over the parchment in her hand. It is only addressed to Lady Hendrickson and her two daughters. Your name doesn't seem to appear on it at all. Of course, I would be happy to take you as my guest, and surely the Duke would not mind such a thing, but I cannot fathom I will have the ability to entertain you as a guest if we cannot have our garments made in time. Lady Louisa gave out a deep and long sigh. It was just the type of manipulation she greatly detested. She wondered if the ball was really worth going to for all of this. Yes, it was an exciting idea to go to a masquerade ball. It was less enticing to find out it was at the house of the Duke. Nonetheless, she couldn't deny the excitement over the event, and after all, the purpose of visiting with her aunt was to help in any way she could. So, with great reluctance, she agreed to focus all her attention on assisting the ladies as they prepared for the quickly approaching event. Perhaps, if she were lucky, she would also find a way to sneak into town and see to her patients as well. Chapter 20 The night of the masquerade ball finally came, and not without its difficulties. Not only was the dress shop fully booked with orders, but also there seemed to be no way for new gowns to be made. This, however, didn't deter Lady Hendrickson. Instead, she bought bolts of fabric and insisted that Lady Louisa should work tirelessly to create a new gown for each lady. Many nights, Lady Louisa stayed up late, working on the garments. Though Miss Mary wouldn't dare to do so in her mother's presence, after the others went to sleep, she too would often stay by Lady Louisa's side and work to create the garments. 
It was a good thing, too, for Lady Louisa was sure she would never have finished three dresses otherwise. During their quiet nights together, Lady Louisa also learned many tidbits of information about her aunt. Not only was she choosing to live beyond her means, but this was also causing a problem for the two daughters. If Miss Elizabeth or Miss Mary were not to marry off well and quickly, they would be destitute until the year's end. It was for this reason, and to be sure many others, that Miss Mary had kept her feelings about the Colonel a secret. Only when Lady Louisa brought up the matter, and after several minutes of denial, did Miss Mary admit that she did feel very fondly for the man and hoped he would ask her to marry him soon. I feel like such a deceiver. Miss Mary said the night of the ball as they were both getting ready in Miss Mary's room. Colonel Jasper has no idea of my mother's disapproval of him, or the fact that it is predominantly because she wishes me to marry a man that can take care of her acquired debt. I know Colonel Jasper cares for you deeply as well. I don't think it's deceptive of you to keep your mother's dislike for him a secret. Certainly he can decipher her character. And of the debts, could the colonel even help in such a situation? Lady Louisa responded as she handed some pearls to Bess, who was stringing them in Miss Mary's hair. I don't know, honestly. But even if he had the means, I would not want to ask such a thing of him. It doesn't seem right to me. Nor to me, Lady Louisa agreed. But perhaps if, after you are properly engaged, of course, you tell your mother he doesn't have the means, she will be at peace and hopefully curtail her spending. I cannot bear to tell my mother things she will not like. You have only seen a small portion of how severe she can really become. My only hope, I hate to say, is if Elizabeth does secure the Duke tonight. If she is able to accomplish this task, my mother will not care who I marry, knowing she will be secure with Elizabeth's choice. Lady Louisa found the logical truth in Miss Mary's words, but she still didn't like it. No matter how much she rather detested the Duke's methods and ideas for marriage, she still would not wish her cousin Elizabeth even on him. Miss Elizabeth had been nothing short of insufferable the last two weeks. Twice she changed her choice of fabric, and once she had insisted that Lady Louisa completely remove a hem of her skirt and redo it with smaller stitches. She had claimed it was nowhere near the quality that she was used to. It was infuriating. But all the while that Lady Louisa worked, she did so with her mouth clamped shut. She would do all that she could to please her aunt and cousin. At the end of the ball, she would return home to London knowing that she had done everything in her power for the sake of her mother. Now that the night of the ball was upon them, Lady Louisa couldn't help but expel a sigh of relief that this whole ordeal would finally be over. She would be sad to leave Miss Mary and Mrs Vance and the Colonel. But outside of those few new friends she had made, there was little that she would miss of her time in the country. She was sure that if she were to live in her family's London house the rest of her days, she would be more than satisfied. She had also considered the words of the solicitor about her brother. Perhaps he would stay in the colonies permanently. If that was the case, then she would brave the wild ocean and join him there. Travelling to the Americas was something she would have never considered in the past. The one great thing that came out of her time here in the Lake District was all the things she had accomplished on her own. She rather thought of herself as a very independent woman now and had little fear about crossing the ocean on her own. And now for the mask, Bess said, waking Lady Louisa from her thoughts. She lifted the white silk mask and placed it on Miss Mary's face, weaving the ribbons through her hair for secure placement. Delicate white feathers and a black outline of swan eyes decorated the mask. She looked absolutely exquisite in her delicate matching white silk dress gathered and ruffled to match a swan's plume. I would not be surprised if the colonel proposed on the spot tonight when he first sets eyes on you, Lady Louisa exclaimed. Do I really look all right? Miss Mary asked as she spied herself sceptically in the looking glass. Mary, you look like an angel. Now hop on out of that chair so I can work my magic on Lady Louisa's hair before you have to leave, Bess said in a playful tone. Do not worry yourself too much. If you can make it half as beautiful as last time, that would be sufficient for me, Lady Louisa said as she took Miss Mary's place in front of the looking glass. 
Lady Louisa hadn't had much time to prepare herself for the ball. For that reason, she had chosen to wear the same golden yellow dress that she had worn to Basson on her last visit. She quickly created a mask by covering it in feathers dipped in golden paint. She didn't care much to stand out at large parties or events, and was sure she would be the least dressed up guest of the night, but she was quite all right with that. Her only wish was to enjoy the night and the final ball before she returned home to London. Finally, she was ready. Bess had performed her magic yet again and had wrapped a length of white linen fabric with a gold print of fleur de lis in her hair. Between the material and the golden mask, Lady Louisa could scarcely recognise her own self. Both ladies came downstairs and waited for just a moment before they were joined by Lady Hendrickson and Miss Elizabeth. Though Lady Hendrickson was technically still in mourning, she had chosen to wear a cream silk dress with green silk embroidered ivy all along the front of it. Lady Louisa's fingers tingled as she looked at each intricate embroidery stitch she had used to make the gown. Her mask was a compilation of green and blue ribbons folded to look like leaves. Behind her, Miss Elizabeth stole the focus of the whole room with her dress. It was made of the most elegant blue, green and purple silks, all layered and ruffled on top of each other. Around her lace-trimmed neckline was an array of ostrich feathers, encircling her like a halo. Her mask was all gold, and unlike the others who couldn't remove theirs, hers was on a stick for her to hold to her face when desired. She wanted to make certain that the Duke would single her out and know for a surety that it was Miss Elizabeth Hendrickson who would be taking his breath away this night. Along with the gold mask and stick was another plume of ostrich feathers she held in her hand to complete the look. Before we leave, let us all have a sherry. I fear my nerves are quite unravelled from the stress of all this preparation for tonight, Lady Hendrickson announced. Mr. Johnson quickly appeared with four small glasses of sherry wine, and each was taken in turn. A wonderful idea, Mother, Elizabeth said. I'm so nervous, I've been shaking like a leaf, she added. Lady Hendrickson, who stood between Miss Elizabeth and Lady Louisa, leaned over to her daughter to give her a pat of comfort with her hand. While doing this, she ever so subtly reached out her glass in the opposite direction and tipped it down the front of Lady Louisa's dress. Lady Louisa, who hadn't noticed the movement, jumped and gasped as the cold red liquid ran down the front of her, soaking and staining her yellow dress. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry, Lady Hendrickson said, writing her cup again as if she had not noticed the motion while comforting her daughter. Please do forgive me. As I said, my nerves are just all over the place. I am beside myself. Immediately, Mr. Johnson reappeared with a wet rag. That won't do at all, Lady Hendrickson said. Your dress seems to be stained. We can wait while Louisa changes, Miss Mary chimed in, almost completely sure it was not an accident. Her mother had no desire for Lady Louisa to attend this ball and contend with the Hendrickson daughters for eligible bachelors. I'm afraid the carriage is already waiting. We can't be late. The night is far too important. I'm sorry, Louisa, Lady Hendrickson said. I suppose you can't go. We can give her just a few minutes to change, Mother, Miss Mary insisted. How can you be so selfish? Miss Elizabeth accused her sister. This could very well be the most important night of my life, and you wish to ruin it. Forgive me, Your Ladyship, Mr Johnson who still held the rag, said. Perhaps I could take Lady Louisa in the cart once she is ready. He turned to Lady Louisa. I know it would not be a fine carriage, but it would do the job of getting you there, he added humbly. Lady Hendrickson opened and closed her mouth a few times, having not anticipated her own staff turning against her plan. Do whatever you want, she said, handing over her now empty cup to the butler and waving for her daughters to follow her. Hurry and change, Miss Mary said in a whisper. I have plenty of dresses in my room to choose from if you didn't bring any more. You may have your pick of them, she reached forward and gingerly hugged her cousin without their dresses touching. Lady Louisa, though still shocked by it all, was at least a little relieved to have Miss Mary there and the butler to fight on her behalf. 
She couldn't imagine having gone through all the work these past two weeks to prepare for the ball, given up so many of her trips to the village to help any sick in need, all to not be able to go to the masquerade herself. Chapter 21 the Duke of Rowland couldn't have possibly dreaded this night any more than he already did. That was until the guests started to arrive. With every greeting and introduction standing in the foyer, he was growing more and more dissatisfied with the whole silly plan that his uncle had concocted. On the contrary, Mr. James Vaughan was very proud of himself as he watched lady after lady enter the house. He was sure that tonight his nephew would feel that quick and temporary rush of love. It would be enough and Mr. Vaughan would finally be able to rest easy, knowing he had done right by his brother and sister-in-law and preserved the dukedom. Lady Hendrickson, Miss Elizabeth Hendrickson and Miss Mary Hendrickson, the footman announced as the three ladies walked up to greet their host. Roland was a little surprised to see that their cousin, Lady Louisa, was not accompanying them this night. He rather thought it had much to do with the conversation they had shared. Strangely enough, he was disappointed by her absence. Good evening, Lady Hendrickson, Miss Hendrickson, but Miss Mary, he greeted each one in turn. Is Lady Louisa not here with you tonight? He couldn't help but ask. Unfortunately, she was not feeling well enough to come, Lady Hendrickson replied, not at all happy that the first words out of the Duke's mouth inquired about Lady Louisa. Roland had to forcibly stop himself from opening his mouth in shock when Miss Elizabeth stood before him, and he set eyes on her for the first time. He had seen his fair share of overdone women this night, but surely Miss Elizabeth had surpassed them all. You look very lovely tonight, Miss Hendrickson, he said, in as steady a voice as he could possibly muster. He waited till the trio had moved out of hearing range before leaning over to his uncle. Perhaps it was a right thing to pass on Miss Elizabeth, Mr Vaughan said before Roland even got a word out. I swear I thought I was looking at a painting of Queen Elizabeth dressed as a giant bird, Mr Vaughan added, as his eyes followed the trio of ladies while they entered the rest of the throngs of people. Once a man far too close to her turned and got a face full of feathers. It was a struggle for both the Duke and his uncle not to laugh. Lady Louisa was feeling rather shaken and still hadn't quite caught her breath from the rush of everything. After Lady Hendrickson left the house, Lady Louisa immediately ran up the stairs with tears of frustration stinging her eyes. She was sure that the few months living with her aunt had far surpassed any teasing and taunting she had received as a child. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour, hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. For a few moments, she had entertained the idea of just staying home. It was, after all, what Lady Hendrickson intended with her little stunt. It was also what she was expecting. Lady Hendrickson was hoping Lady Louisa would be spineless and stay home. She would not do so this time. For once, Lady Louisa would not wait for her brother to come to her rescue and stand up for her. She was going to stand on her own two feet for herself. Perhaps it was because Colton was so far away and she no longer had the luxury of knowing he would come to her aid. Perhaps it was because, after all these weeks of visiting the village on her own and making use of herself by treating the ill and injured, she had gained more courage. More than likely, she had finally been pushed too far by her aunt. Lady Louisa no longer cared if her appearance at tonight's ball would upset her aunt. She would not even consider the ramifications it might have for any future relationships between her family and her aunt's family. She was tired of being used by Lady Hendrickson and then discarded as if she didn't matter. With strong determination, she rushed to Miss Mary's room. Seeing the commotion, Bess was already there, getting another evening gown prepared. It was dark forest green with matching ruffles along the hems. Under the silk along the neckline and flowing from the sleeves was delicate cream lace. It's not Miss Mary's. It's Miss Elizabeth's, actually. I snuck it out of her room when I saw what Lady Hendrickson did to you. Just horrible. This will look beautiful on you. It will match perfectly with the gold and bring warmth to your skin. Now hurry, let's get you changed. 
Lady Louisa didn't say a single word, only took the maid's hand and squeezed it tight in gratitude. It was an exquisitely made dress, though they both agreed to remove several silk ribbon bows that were found at every hem and cross section of the dress. Miss Elizabeth did tend to do things on the gaudy side of things. With her new dress on, and a cloak to protect her from the night air during the cart ride, Lady Louisa descended the stairs for the second time. She found the butler seated in the cart, which was already hitched with a horse and ready to go. I fear I will arrive so late that I will make a spectacle of myself, she said to the butler as they started their way towards Basson Park. Oh, I dare say you will be a spectacle tonight, your ladyship. I don't think it will have anything to do with the time, however, he said, giving her a fatherly wink. Lady Louisa received no comfort from his words. She would have rather not made a spectacle of herself in any way. She certainly did look like an entirely different person in Miss Elizabeth's dress, with her hair done so beautifully by Bess. He pulled up to the front of Basson Park, where the door was already shut. Nothing but silence seemed to permeate the night air. The glow of the house was the sole light. No longer were guests filtering in. She took a deep breath. Mr. Johnson wished her luck, and she gingerly exited the seat next to him on the wooden cart. Lady Louisa walked slowly up the stone steps, wondering if it was wise to arrive so late. Before she had a chance to change her mind, however, the doors opened for her. At least she took solace in the fact that a butler was still present to welcome the last few straggling guests. Good evening, ma'am. She nodded politely to his bow and entered the room. With the opening of doors had come a burst of light and the sound of rapid speech from all sorts of people. She found the foyer empty, and the butler motioned with his hand for her to continue forward. Lady Louisa timidly made her way towards the noise permeating the large double doors in front of her. Through the noise, she could still keenly hear the sound of her silken dress rustling as she walked. She finally entered the largest room crowded with guests. It was an elegant dance hall worthy to rival the one at Wintercrest Manor. Off the main dance hall were several more doors that opened into side rooms. Each one seemed to be just as filled as the dance hall. Lady Louisa had a hard time even fathoming the number of people in this house. She guessed there had to be at least a thousand between all the offshoots of rooms and steady crowds moving in and out. Immediately, her unannounced entrance brought stares from those just next to the door. Lady Louisa quickly looked down, embarrassed. She wondered if she should find her aunt and cousins. She was sure her aunt was not expecting her to actually come and may, in fact, once again resort to a horrid act like the one earlier. It might be best for her to keep her presence a secret from them. She walked close to the wall and observed the party-goers as she proceeded from one end of the hall to the other. She had rather hoped to get a glimpse of Miss Mary. She felt no fear in letting her youngest cousin be aware of her presence. It had seemed that just before Lady Louisa's arrival, the first dances had begun. Still, only a few couples could be found on the dance floor, with most still choosing to socialise instead of dancing. Lady Louisa instantly spotted the Colonel dancing with Miss Mary. Lady Louisa stood for a few moments and watched as they looked deeply into each other's eyes and made their way together and apart in time to the music. She couldn't help but feel the excitement that her little cousin must have been feeling while dancing with the man she cared so deeply for. Lady Louisa was so lost in enjoying the magic before her that she completely forgot she was supposed to be avoiding her aunt and other cousin. After a few moments of watching Miss Mary, her eyes were drawn to the large peacock feathers floating along the side of the wall in her direction. It wasn't hard to spot the elaborately dressed Miss Elizabeth and the sight of her animated Lady Louisa. She pushed back against the wall, fearing that Miss Elizabeth might recognise her, or worse, her own dress. With her back against the wall, she sidestepped until her hands brushed over a doorknob behind her. She turned it and thankfully found it to be unlocked, not caring what or who might be on the other side. She pushed the door open and as quickly as possible slid into the room. Chapter 22 Lady Louisa shut the door as quietly as she could, 
hoping that no one had noticed her escape. The last thing she wanted was for someone to follow in after her. Before she turned, however, she realised that she was already not alone in this dimly lit room. At the sound of a man clearing his throat, Lady Louisa reluctantly turned to find herself in some type of office. The walls had various bookshelves stuffed with books. A small fireplace was built against the left wall and next to it was a door, no doubt leading out into the main part of the house. In the far back corner of the room, next to some long draped windows, was a large oak desk. On it stood a single candelabra that shone light on a masked face behind the desk. Forgive me, I didn't think this room was open to guests, Lady Louisa said quickly. Then why did you enter it? the gentleman asked. Lady Louisa laughed at her stupid remark. I was trying to escape someone. I was just hoping to slip in and out for a second. Might I ask you the same thing? Why are you in a room that is not for the public? It's a fair question, he said, rubbing his chin. There was something about the way he walked that seemed familiar, but she hadn't yet recognised him. He was wearing a large death mask with the long pointed nose and a large skull cap that went over the front part of his hair. Other than his mouth and square chin, Lady Louisa could see nothing of his face. Roland had stood up at her sudden entrance and now walked around the desk to come closer to her. His breath had been taken away by the sudden appearance of this angel. Everything about her seemed enchanting, and he ascribed that to the mysterious gold mask that hid her identity from him. Rowland was sure he would have remembered her entrance into his house. She had not been an announced guest that he had greeted at the door. I was seeking a little break from the festivities, Rowland finally explained to the lady, not yet wanting to expose his identity. I suppose we both came into this room to hide. What part of the festivities did you feel the need to hide from? The lady asked him as she edged along the room. Roland wanted to get closer for a better view of the lady. She seemed to edge farther away, hoping not to be recognised. Well, you see, I was hoping this mask would keep others from recognising me, he said, thinking back to how he had not donned it until after greeting all the guests. But unfortunately, I was still rather easily recognisable by almost everyone here. And your identity must be kept a secret for what reason, pray tell? Perhaps you are a notorious villain, she asked with the hint of a smile on her soft pink lips. Roland gave a soft laugh at the thought. No, my lady, I can assure you I'm no villain. Are you here uninvited then? Lady Louisa continued, genuinely intrigued by the mysterious man. I am nearly sure that I was invited, he said slowly. Are you saying you don't know who I am? He added, a little surprised. I'm sorry to say that I don't, but I am not from this area. I don't mean to offend by my lack of knowledge. I'm not offended at all. In fact, I find it very refreshing. Does that mean you don't plan to tell me your name? Lady Louisa asked, while inside her she craved to discover this man's identity. No, I don't think I will, he said with a slightly wide, sparkling grin. But perhaps you would share yours with me, as I must have missed your introduction when the ball began. Lady Louisa seemed to consider this for a few moments before turning away from him and towards the bookshelf closest to her. She didn't want to explain that she had arrived late, or worse, the reason behind it. I can't see why I should tell you mine when you won't tell me yours, she said, as her fingertips glided over the spines of the books. I can't say that is unfair, though I don't like it. Perhaps I can guess your identity then, he said, excited at the idea. She looked back at him, and Roland was sure his heart caught in his throat as her clear blue eyes sized him up. All right, I will allow you five questions and one guess, she said with a sly smile. She was rather enjoying this game. He nodded in agreement before placing a hand on his chin and rubbing it thoughtfully. I would guess by the fine quality of your dress, you are a lady he asked, and stated at the same time. That is true. My father was a lord with a seat in the House of Lords, Lady Louisa encouraged, knowing that in this crowd that would not limit his options by much. Was, he asked. He passed away a few years back, she said sullenly. I'm so sorry, he said, 
taking a step closer to her and closing the gap. Though she could scarcely make out his eyes behind such a large mask, she heard the sincerity in his voice and thanked him for it. That's two questions down, Lady Louisa said, wanting to move on from the subject of her father's passing. That hardly counts, the man protested. It was more like a follow-up question. Unfortunately, you don't get to make the rules. I do, and I say it counts as two, Lady Louisa said, feeling braver in the anonymity. All right, then, he said, rubbing his chin again. Then I suppose I will have to be more careful. Let me think. Three questions left, he added to himself. Roland was rather enjoying this little diverting game and found this mysterious woman quite perplexing. Are you here tonight with family? Lady Louisa thought over the question. She technically had been invited along with her aunt's family, but then they had no idea that she was present at the ball. That's actually a hard one. I would have to say yes and no. Yes and no, the man retorted with a laugh. I have a feeling you are being very difficult on purpose. I don't mean to be, honestly. I guess I will say that I was invited with family members but came on my own. A brave maiden to come to such a place on such a night alone, he said. He thought over the guests again. He was sure he had not greeted a single lady into his house. Are you asking me if I am brave? Lady Louisa teased with a playful smile. She took a couple more steps in the direction of the books, turning her attention back to them when he quickly shook his head no, in fear of giving away another question. It rather felt more like a game of cat and mouse. Both seemed to take steps from time to time, first farther away from each other, then closer together, and now again, Lady Louisa put distance between them. I can already deduce you are a brave lady. The fact that you didn't immediately leave the room and that you came alone tells me that. You must be quite bold and outspoken in life. Lady Louisa couldn't help but laugh. Nothing could have been further from the truth in describing her. The gentleman watched her laugh with merriment in his own masked face. I take it this is not a true statement then. Yes, that is my next question, he asked when Lady Louisa questioned him with her own blue eyes before answering. As a fourth question, you are correct in that I am not a very outspoken lady normally. Yet you experience a change tonight. You seem quite radiant and defiant as you continue to float away from me in this very room, the Duke said, putting words to the frustration he felt. He was sure if he got close enough he would recognise her, but she always seemed to stay in motion. He pondered his last question carefully, in dire need to know this woman now more than ever. So, you are a lady normally reserved, but quite emboldened by the anonymity. I am sure from your manners and speech you attended the finest schools in London. Is that all you know so far? Lady Louisa teased. You also have a fondness for Percy Bysshe Shelley, Roland stated boldly. The lady looked back at him, surprised. I have watched you run your hand along each shelf, but only when it fell upon a book by Shelley did you stop and let your fingers trace the binding. She looked down shyly. She couldn't believe she had done so without even realising it. Let me see if I can remember this correctly, he said softly while he thought. The sunlight claps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What are these kissings worth if thou kiss not me? Lady Louisa looked down at the ground shyly. She was surprised by his ability to quote Shelley, and also the brazen quote he chose. Did I get it right? he asked, almost thinking to himself. Yes, Lady Louisa replied. Love's philosophy. It is actually one of my favourites. His smile widened at her words. He took two more steps closer, and this time she didn't take any away. They were now standing so close that the nose of his mask could almost brush against the top of her head. She would have to look up to see into his eyes, but she couldn't bring herself to do so. Tell me your name, he whispered. I fear I will never guess it and shall not survive the night without knowing it. I hardly see how I could now, she said with a playful smile. I find myself alone in a closed room with a man I know nothing of, 
reciting romantic poetry to me. I fear it is best we never exchange names after such an intimate encounter that could ruin us both if it were known. Perhaps you are right. We are in quite a compromising situation. If you told me your name, I suppose I would have to do the honourable thing. There was silence between them for a few moments. I don't know that I would mind that terribly, Roland finally said. He was satisfied to see her raise her shocked face. Roland bore deep into the blue eyes that looked back at him, willing some recognition, but none came. I should go, Lady Louisa said, utterly embarrassed now. She had experienced and participated in more flirtation than she had ever done before in all her seasons combined. May I ask my last question first before you leave? All right, after all, you do have one left, Lady Louisa said, hoping the playful banter might remove the heavy weight that seemed to tie them together. Would you do me the honour of a dance? Lady Louisa hesitated and looked towards the door she had entered. I don't suggest we walk out of this room together. You can exit this way, he motioned to the door behind him. There will be fewer people out in the hall. I will take the door leading back into the ballroom. We could meet in there, let's say, by the punch table for the next set. Lady Louisa considered this. She did have a desire to know this charismatic, tall, angular man as well. All right, she finally said softly. She stepped around him and made her way to the door leading out of the room. She hesitated for just a moment and looked back. See you very soon then, Roland asked the mysterious enchantress. She nodded once and then slipped out of the door. Chapter 23 Lady Louisa stood in the fairly empty hall for just a few moments. No one had noticed her exiting the room. She was sure if she had been the one to open the other door and enter the ballroom, all eyes would fall on her. Why would he not care that entering the ballroom after she had left from the same door would cause suspicion by any of the matrons in the room? Those ladies never missed a thing. Perhaps men did not realise such things. Lady Louisa straightened her skirts and touched her hair to make sure it was still perfectly in place as Bess had arranged it. She had never experienced anything like that in her life and rather felt like she was waking from a dream. Never had a gentleman shown any interest in the plain wallflower that was Lady Louisa. Perhaps if she had attended a masquerade ball sooner in life, she would have found this more daring side of herself. Taking steadying breaths, she made her way down the hall and back towards the sound of voices and music in the magnificent ballroom. She was already feeling the butterflies of anticipation at meeting the man again. He would be easy to spot. He was likely to be the only one in such a full mask. Though death masks with their long pointed noses were a popular choice for men, even if someone wore the same one as he did, she would still be able to easily spot that tall frame and square chin. She entered the room and surveyed it for just a second. She wanted to make sure she could see her aunt and cousins and stay far away from them for the dance. She finally laid eyes on the large array of peacock feathers. However, her attention was drawn to the table of punch almost immediately. There he was standing, waiting for her arrival. She couldn't help but notice several people watching him and whispering. Had her entrance and exit from the room been noticed? She hesitated to approach him, though her body protested the inaction. It was visibly obvious that people were taking notice of him. Then she watched as an elderly gentleman walked up to him and spoke in a quick, quiet tone. Lady Louisa recognised the man at once as Mr Vaughan. Then the masked man put a reassuring hand on Mr Vaughan's shoulder and seemed to laugh off his words. Lady Louisa was beginning to see a familiarity between the two that made her stomach turn. With each passing second, the puzzle pieces were coming together. She had seen that tall frame before, heard that deep, luxurious voice. What dispelled any doubt was when the gentleman turned to speak to a man introduced to him by Mr Vaughan. He had long hair that seemed to shine black like ebony in the light, tied back with a simple ribbon. She was sure. The mysterious man she had just spent the last half hour flirting with was none other than the Duke of Rowland. She couldn't believe herself. How had she not seen it before? His gait, his mannerisms. 
she ought to have recognised him. She started to panic and back out of the room. In the process, she accidentally backed into someone. A loud yelp resounded that caught the attention of those around them. Lady Louisa turned and apologised profusely to the young lady that she had stepped on. Turning back around, she saw the Duke too had noticed the act, and when her eyes reached his face, he smiled in satisfaction. She shook her head in dread. Instantly, the smile that had spread on his face faltered. He took a few steps towards her, seeming to know that she was about to run. Run, she did. She turned on her heels and as quickly as she could, she removed herself from the room. It was not an easy task to accomplish for a lady with so many skirts. She was sure that the Duke would overtake her. She would not look back, however. She couldn't bear to let the Duke know who she actually was. He would be so appalled to know. She was sure she should have felt shocked at the knowledge as well. Instead, she was sure her heart was breaking with each step that she took. This had been the first and only time in her life she could honestly say that she felt the excitement of budding romance, and now she was going to run from it. She was almost at the front door when she heard the pursuing steps behind her. She couldn't stop, however. Luckily, a man was at the door and opened it for her. Only once did she hear the Duke call out, Wait! before she was out in the clear air of the night. She didn't stop there, either. She had assured Mr Johnson she would take the carriage home with her aunt, not wanting to make him wait with the cart all night. Now she was regretting that decision. She stepped quickly down the stone steps and turned sharply right to hide behind the line of bushes on the side. She had just made it behind the rose shrubs when a figure burst out from the doors. The Duke of Rowland removed his mask to see unobstructedly into the night. He took a few steps down the stairs and looked over to the stables of waiting carriages. Perhaps he would see her vehicle go by and stop her. He could see his own breath in the chill of the night as it came in and out in short bursts. Evidently the lady had realised who he was when she entered the ballroom. The recognition was spelled all over her face. Why had that made her run? For the first time in his life he had met someone that brought such a turmoil of emotions and simultaneously she was the only one to run away from him. He waited on the steps a few moments longer, sure that she couldn't have gone too far. Inevitably she would appear at any moment, but it never happened. Roland, a deep husky voice called from behind him. Roland turned to see his uncle in the doorway. First you disappear for almost an hour, then right in the middle of Lady Ludlow's words you bolt from the ballroom. What is going on? I saw someone, Roland responded, still half-dazed by it all. Someone? What do you mean, someone? Not just someone, Uncle James, the someone. I believe I have found her, Roland said, gripping his uncle by both shoulders. You are acting quite mad tonight, Mr. Vaughan said, concerned by the outburst. I'm trying to tell you, Uncle, I have found her, the girl I'm destined to marry. Well, then where is she? She left. Left? Yes, she ran. Why would she run? Mr. Vaughan asked sceptically. I don't know, Roland said in a voice that trailed off. Well, what is her name? Perhaps she got scared or had to leave. We can certainly call on her on the morrow, Mr. Vaughan said, happily seeing this lovesick look in his nephew's eyes. I don't know. Roland repeated. He turned to his uncle and looked him straight on. She never told me her name. You are talking nonsense, nephew. Come inside. There is a hall full of eligible ladies more than willing to run towards you, not away. Mr. Vaughan shook his head at his nephew's confusing actions. With an arm around Roland's shoulders, he urged him to return to the house. She was the one. I am sure of it. Roland whispered before donning his mask back on and returning inside with his uncle. Lady Louisa waited hidden behind the shrubbery until she was sure that the Duke was gone. She had heard every word of that conversation. Undoubtedly the man was mistaken, she thought, as she unclasped her mouth. She had feared that her own breath could give her hiding spot away. Timidly, she stepped out from behind the bushes, 
checking to see that she was indeed alone at the front of the house. With little word or fanfare, she began the walk back to her residence. In the beginning, she turned several times upon hearing sounds. She so feared that the Duke might reappear and discover her true identity. Soon she turned a bend blocking her view from the house, and in the still darkness, she concentrated hard on the ground before her. There was little moonlight to guide her. Luckily, she had already made this walk several times when she came to Leon at the side of Mrs. Vance. Even still, there was the need to remove her mask which obscured her own view a bit. She puzzled as she walked briskly in the chilled air. How didn't she realise it was the Duke from the moment she had slipped into the office? It was so obvious now that she knew his identity. More puzzling was the fact that he had confused her with a beautiful enchantress and not the plain lady that he greatly disliked. She reminded herself that she had exceedingly disliked him as well. How that had changed when she spoke with him with no pre-knowledge of his character. In fact, she had quite fallen for him at that moment. It was a fleeting emotion, she tried to remind herself. Nothing more than a mistake. She also didn't need to be reminded that her sole purpose of coming to the country was to make amends with her aunts. Though she had not been successful in this task, she strongly doubted that informing the Duke that she was the woman he had just vowed to wed would bode well with either Lady Hendrickson or Miss Elizabeth. For that reason alone, she was determined to keep her identity this night a secret from the Duke. Certainly the emotion would be fleeting for him as well. No doubt he had already found interest in another upon returning to the party. No, there would be no reason to inform the Duke that she was the woman in the green dress when it would only cause more strife and turmoil between her family and her aunts. Instead, she would return to Menteith House and pretend like the encounter had never occurred. She would swear Bess and Mr Johnson to silence. They would never speak of her absence from the house this night if she asked them not to. She would continue the plan she had made before the disaster with the Duke had ever occurred. Within a week's time, she would return to London and leave every memory of this place behind her. Chapter 24 Lady Louisa retired to bed long before the other ladies of the house returned from the ball. Consequently, she also rose much earlier than the others. She enjoyed the peaceful breakfast she had alone in the morning room and then settled herself in the drawing room to do some mending while she waited for the rest of her relations to awaken. Lady Louisa had already begun to make her plans to return to London that very morning. First, she sent a letter to her mother, informing the Dowager Countess that she would be coming home shortly. Next, she asked Mr Johnson to procure coach times so as to ascertain her earliest departure. She would have been quite fine if she could have left that very morning. So much was she dreading seeing her aunt and Miss Elizabeth again. Not only did Lady Louisa still feel a great amount of animosity towards them for the ridiculously rude behaviour before the ball, but she also had no desire to hear the two talk incessantly about the night. Lady Louisa was still in the process of reconciling with what had occurred to her at the ball and making sense of the swirl of emotion it had caused within herself. Unfortunately, leaving before the rest of the house was even awake was not something that Lady Louisa could do. For starters, it would take much more time to prepare for such a trip. Secondly, though she didn't feel much gratitude towards her aunt as host, Lady Louisa's upbringing would not allow her to leave without a proper goodbye to her hostess. So it was that by mid-afternoon the rest of the household was fully awake and breakfasted. Even at such a late hour of the day, all three were still quite groggy from the night's adventure. It was one of the quietest afternoons that Lady Louisa had ever experienced in Menthieth House. I want to know who this supposed mystery woman is that everyone kept gabbing on about last night, Lady Hendrickson said after a time. Lady Louisa was just about to excuse herself from the group and see to the needs of the garden. She decided against it when the conversation turned to the ball and the unknown guest. Someone of little consequence, if you ask me, Miss Elizabeth said with a flick of her hand. I would not be so quick to brush the event off, Lady Hendrickson scolded. It is rumoured that the Duke was quite taken by her. He even chased her out the door. 
Chaste is my point, mother. Whatever lady is mental enough to run from the Duke of Rowland is not worth the discussion. Colonel Jasper said that the Duke spoke of nothing else but finding her identity the rest of the night, Miss Mary chimed in. He even told me that the Duke has vowed to marry the lady when he learns her name. I can't believe such things. And why would the Colonel tell you anyway? Miss Elizabeth said in an accusatory fashion. Miss Mary's gaze fell immediately to her hands in her lap. Don't be so cross with your sister, Lady Hendrickson scolded her daughter. It brought a shocked look from every member of the room. She did us a great service last night, Lady Hendrickson continued. She kept the attention of the Colonel since Louisa was sadly not able to attend, she said, without even looking in Lady Louisa's direction. She has even secured the promise of a family dinner with the Duke and his house guest here at Menthith House. How wonderfully exciting for you all, Lady Louisa said. It sounds like the night was a most eventful one. I wish you could have seen it, Miss Mary said, gaining back some of her will to talk. The house just looked marvellous. The dancing was divine too. When the Duke ran out after that lady, she trailed off. I dare say it was the most romantic thing I have ever seen, she finished. Hardly, Miss Elizabeth scoffed, though softer now after her mother's scolding. I bet you anything it was simply an uninvited guest and the Duke was chasing her off. Even Lady Hendrickson gave her daughter a look that said she highly doubted it. Frankly, my dear, Lady Hendrickson said with her chin up, I think you are underestimating the problem this little mystery can cause us. Up until last night, it was almost clear that he was nearly about to propose. Now his mind has seemed to turn elsewhere. What am I to do about that? Miss Elizabeth said in a whine. It's really simple, my dear, Lady Hendrickson replied. You simply must remind him that the real one in front of him is far superior to a fantasy girl that he concocted in his head. Concocted? Mother, you saw her just as the rest of us did, Miss Mary chimed in. Yes, we all saw the rather unremarkable thing, Lady Hendrickson replied with a roll of her eyes. Clearly she was back to the habit of finding her youngest daughter a nuisance. It was no doubt the mystery of a lady without a name or clear face that inspired his reaction. He will not go to great lengths to discover her once the influence of last night's mystery has passed. I wouldn't be surprised if she was nothing more than a silly servant in her mistress's dress. Why else would the girl run upon the threat of discovery? The truth of the matter will come out in the end, it always does, Lady Hendrickson continued. Until then you must be present and remind the Duke that no fantastical creature of his own making can compare to you. Then, when the lady is discovered, he will not only realise she was nothing compared to the one in his head, but also holds not a candle's flame to you. The lady finally finished. Lady Louisa felt very conflicted by her aunt's words, though she felt comfort in her aunt's opinion that the Duke was surely making more out of the encounter than there really was. She also was a little disappointed to hear those words spoken out loud. It shall be our new goal, Lady Hendrickson said with an air of importance, that we discover the identity first. If it is another invited guest who turned and fled, then we must befriend and encourage the discouraging feelings within her. If it is a servant or other unworthy creature, we will expose her as such to the Duke. In the meantime, Lady Louisa can use her connections to Colonel Jasper to tell us of the Duke's decisions on the matter, Lady Hendrickson said without so much as a look in Lady Louisa's direction. Miss Mary and Lady Louisa did exchange glances at the statement. It was apparent that Miss Mary was still not ready for her mother to know the truth about where Colonel Jasper's affections actually lay. Also, since you go into town all the time and speak with the servants and the like, you can find out what others are saying about this woman, Miss Elizabeth said with a dismissive wave in Lady Louisa's direction. Are you referring to my time spent with the sick and injured? If you remember correctly, you asked me to stop and I have already given my apologies to Mrs. Vance and several of those I tended. Well then, you will just go and tell Mrs. Vance that you changed your mind, Lady Hendrickson said, exasperated that Lady Louisa didn't see that point clearly. 
I would be more than happy to visit my patients as I have already learned so much about the practice, but unfortunately, I can't see how that will be possible. Oh, why ever not? Lady Hendrickson retorted as she flicked her fan, irritated. I fear that my mother has grown quite lonely in my absence, and I have begun the process of procuring transportation home. I wanted to tell you as much this morning. I worry that my presence here is too much of a burden, and, though I am grateful for your hospitality, I wish to absolve you from it. Don't be ridiculous! The one time you could actually be of use, and of course you wish to leave, Lady Hendrickson said to the room as a whole. Lady Louisa bit her tongue. She had only called herself a burden out of humble politeness. It was rather annoying for her aunt to claim that up until this point she had served no purpose. I do beg your pardon, Lady Hendrickson, but I have tried to be of as much use as possible these last several weeks, Lady Louisa said softly. She felt rather miserable at that moment. If you truly wish to be of help, Lady Hendrickson retorted with a shake of her jowls, then you will stay and do as I ask. Certainly your mother is capable of sparing you longer. After all, you had planned to stay through summer. Is it really so much to ask for you to keep your word? Lady Louisa did hate how her aunt always seemed to have ways of manipulating words to get her desired outcome. She wouldn't be able to deny her aunt now after speaking in such a way. If you find my presence a benefit, Lady Louisa said rather reluctantly, then I shall be happy to stay. The conversation continued with more speculation and plans to ascertain the identity of the mystery woman. Lady Louisa feared her face might give her away at any moment, so she politely excused herself to tend to the garden before sunset. Not long after Lady Louisa began to trim, weed and collect ready specimens for drying, Miss Mary joined her. I know mother can be unusually difficult to live with, Miss Mary said as she came to take her place at Lady Louisa's side but I do hope you will stay. I know this sounds horribly selfish of me, but without you here, I don't know that I will find a way to see the Colonel much. Lady Louisa thought the matter over. She wondered if perhaps she had been the selfish one. After all, hadn't she hoped to bring the Colonel and Miss Mary together? Now she had chosen to leave due to her pride and had thrown away any help that she had promised to Miss Mary. I don't think it is selfish of you at all, Lady Louisa said to her, squeezing her hand. I know the two of you will be very happy together. Any way I can help to make that a possibility, I will be happy to do so. But what of your own mother? I feel so awful to ask you to stay away from her if she truly is lonely. Lady Louisa laughed at the thought. Even with her in the country and Colton far away in the colonies, there was no chance of her mother being lonely. She had a vast array of people and projects to keep her quite occupied. I promise that Mother is more than entertained. I only said that by way of excuse. I rather didn't want to give Lady Hendrickson another chance to pour sherry down my dress. Oh, that was so awful, Miss Mary responded. I was so shocked. I had no words to say. I couldn't believe she would stoop to that level. All that Mother cared about was one less titled lady at the ball that night. I find her scheming so exhausting at times. Yes, she does seem quite duplicitous when it comes to my presence. I'm sure that most days she would rather not have my company, and then, when I suggest leaving, she insists on me staying. Lady Louisa shook her head, wondering if she would ever truly understand her aunt and her motives. It's simply this, Miss Mary said, brushing her skirts with a little more force than necessary. If one can be useful to her, she is willing to allow their presence. However, if one should ever disagree with her, or, heaven forbid, work against her prerogative, she can be quite vindictive. Lady Louisa had a feeling that Mary was speaking more of her own relationship with Lady Hendrickson. She was sure that it couldn't have been an easy thing for Miss Mary to grow up under such a demanding and forceful mother. Lady Louisa might have suffered under her aunt's displeasure these last several weeks, but Miss Mary had suffered so her whole life. It was no wonder that Miss Mary more often than not chose to keep her thoughts to herself, rather than share them with a mother who always seemed to disapprove. 
Lady Louisa was willing to stay as long as it would take for the sake of Miss Mary. If she could somehow help her aunt see the good character in Colonel Jasper and accept him as a prospect for her youngest daughter, Lady Louisa could at least feel she had helped in accomplishing something beyond the darning of stockings and fixing of hems. Chapter 25 A week after the ball, and Roland was still no closer to discovering the identity of his lady in green, as he had come to name her. Twice he had orked his uncle and Jasper to peruse the list of invited guests and account for each one's whereabouts during the time in question. Roland had now reduced his hunt to a small list of five possibilities. Each one of these ladies had not been seen by any three of the gentlemen as best as they could remember, had the possibility of matching the limited description, and were titled, Perhaps it is time to abandon the search, Mr Vaughan said as he stood up to look out the study windows and soak in some sunshine. We have been at this for days. Would it not be better to just forget her altogether? Your uncle does have a point, Jasper also spoke up. If the lady in green wanted to be found, we would have found her by now. It was no secret by the end of the night that you had been enchanted by her. I won't give up until I find her, Roland said with resolve. How can you ask any less of me? She is the one, the one that you, uncle, insisted I find upon returning to England. I didn't insist on you finding the one, just a one, anyone in fact he said with a smile of pride at his ingenious play on words. Yes, and what happened to selecting the easiest option so as to return to the Indies? Jasper asked with a raised brow. He had always contradicted Roland's schemes from the beginning. That was before I met her. Now everything has changed. How can one settle for a dimly lit cage when one was allowed to run free in the sun? Colonel Jasper smiled in a knowing fashion, he had suspected something like this would eventually happen to his friend. Jasper was a little disappointed that it was not with the woman he had thought would be a good match for Roland, but Jasper was just glad that he had found someone to be passionate about. You sound quite ridiculous when you speak like that, Mr Vaughan said, turning back to his nephew. No amount of lightning striking would ever be enough to prove to the older gentleman that finding interest in the opposite sex was more than just a fleeting moment. He walked back over to the desk and held up the list of names for inspection again. If you would pick but one name on this list, I can assure you, Roland, you would find sufficient happiness for your needs. I don't want just sufficient for my needs any more. Uncle, I want to find her. Well, I am finding that possibility more and more unlikely as the days pass, my dear nephew. Choose one or let us be done with this, Mr Vaughan added smacking the paper. I can't do that. I cannot find solace until I know who the lady in green is. She has quite bewitched me, Roland added with a lopsided smile as he looked at the names. For all he knew, he was staring at the written manifestation of his future wife. Clearly she has bewitched you, Mr Vaughan said with a scoff, before excusing himself from the room. I'm sure you find me just as maddening as Uncle James. Roland said to his friend after Mr. Vaughan left the room. I do, Jasper stated simply, but maddening is far better than indifferent in my opinion. Roland's uncle continued to encourage the Duke to focus on something real and tangible. Instead, Roland spent many sleepless nights replaying the encounter in his head. He was sure that if he did it enough times he would remember something he had missed so far. Some kind of clue that would give away the lady's identity. Sadly, this was not the case. Instead, he became more and more frustrated as the memory seemed to slip between his fingers. Lady Hendrickson has invited us over for a dinner party, Mr Vaughan said over dinner two weeks after the ball. Roland waved off the idea indifferently. It might be a good idea. If nothing else, it would be worth getting you away from Basson Park for the night. You are beginning to turn into a recluse, dear nephew, Mr. Vaughan added. And how would spending the night listening to Miss Hendrickson drone on about her accomplishments improve my standing in society? Well, I am sure we will not be the only ones to attend a dinner party. Even a small gathering will have a few other guests. The society might brighten your mood some. 
you have been very cross as of late. There are also the other ladies of the house to consider. Who? Lady Louisa, who despises me, or Miss Mary, who has her eyes set on another, Roland said in reference to the colonel who was not present that night for dinner. Where is Jasper? I believe Lady Louisa and Miss Mary went to town to tend to some of Mrs Vance's business. Colonel Jasper offered to be their transportation. Those two have really taken quite a liking to one another, Mr Vaughan said in a whimsical tone that was not normal for him. It was enough to catch Roland's attention. I suppose it would be a kind thing to do for Jasper. After all, it would give him another chance to win over Lady Hendrickson. The woman seems so against Jasper, and I can't fathom why. I agree that Jasper is a gentleman of great character. He is also a commissioned officer, Mr Vaughan reminded him. He has already informed me of his plans to sell his commission and settle down, Roland countered. Surely that isn't Lady Hendrickson's only objection, though. It would be a ridiculous thing to deny two people in love simply because his means of support involved moving away from one's home. She has some other objections to him, though I don't know what they could be. Perhaps she doesn't relish the fact of the youngest marrying before the eldest, Mr Vaughan said, giving his nephew a look that said far more than his words. I won't even dignify that innuendo with a response, Roland said, trying his best to sound irritated, but in fact, knowing that his uncle was only teasing. No, Roland said with a heavy sigh. As much as I would rather not, I see we must go. I will send my acceptance with the morning post. I am willing to suffer the night at the hand of Miss Elizabeth's insufferable conversation and Lady Louisa's disdain, but only because Jasper is such a good friend. Mr Vaughan nodded his approval. And just think, he added after a moment of silence, your lady in green may very well be a guest as well. This could be the moment you have been searching for all these weeks. Roland rolled his eyes inwardly at his uncle's teasing. He had, in fact, created his own method of discovering the girl. He still had the list of ladies from the three counties that were being considered as the lady in green. Roland had already acquired invitations to two of the five estates and would not encounter any obstacle in securing the last three. He would visit with each lady and her family. He was sure if he could only speak with the lady in green once more, he would know in an instant it was her. A simple visit to each house was all he would need to exclude ladies from the list one by one, until the lady he desired was found. To Roland, it was worth suffering through one unenjoyable night at the Hendrickson's home, if afterwards he would be able to find the lady in green. Roland had never considered his life could change so much in only a moment. Perhaps it was as Jasper had said, simply the fact that the lady ran from him that made him so obsessed with finding her. Deep down, he knew that there was more to it than that, however. There was something about that lady that was so familiar. Chapter 26 Lady Louisa was rather reluctant to join the small dinner party this evening, though there would be no proper excuse for her not to at least make an appearance when it was, after all, held in her own aunt's residence. Along with the lady and Lord Hartford, there was also their daughter, Lady Juliana, who was the same age and very good friends with Miss Elizabeth. Lady Louisa had made the acquaintance of Lady Juliana on a few occasions amid her many seasons with the Tun. She had had no opinion about the lady, good or bad, but in her presence she ultimately discovered she was similar to Miss Elizabeth. It was quite disconcerting to have two Miss Elizabeths in the same room. Lady Louisa was happy to hear that Mr Henderson, the solicitor her brother employed, had also accepted an invitation to the dinner. It seemed that Lady Hendrickson's husband had also used his services. Lady Louisa's biggest fear, and her aunt's greatest satisfaction, was that the Duke had also accepted the invitation to dine. He was, of course, the target of this event. Lady Louisa was still filled with uncertainty over the encounter with the Duke at the ball. She was conflicted by the fact that her excitement that night had not yet left her as she had hoped it would. In fact, contrary to her wish not to be, she was undoubtedly nervous about seeing the Duke again, not only because he might recognise her for the lady in green, 
she had an even greater fear that he would and recoil at the truth in front of everyone. But before she knew it, the night in question was upon her and guests were beginning to arrive. Lady Louisa hoped that if she did her part to avoid the Duke, he was sure to do the same. In that way, she would preserve her secret. She chose to spend the time before the meal in the drawing room, in the company of Mr. Henderson. He happily told her tale after tale of his own time in Virginia and what her brother must be experiencing right at that moment. Soon his fantastical tales were so wondrous, they caught the attention of the majority of the group, including the Duke's small trio. You say this all happened in the colonies? Roland asked, entranced by the tales of adventure and dangerous savages. Yes, Your Grace. I was lucky enough to travel there several times on behalf of the Earl of Gilchrist, Mr. Henderson informed him. He owns property in Virginia. I was just giving Lady Louisa a rendition of some of the adventures since her brother is currently there with his wife. Yes, Lady Louisa did mention something about that to me once, Roland said, looking over to Lady Louisa. It did seem such a wonderful adventure. I would say it is, Your Grace. Are you one for adventuring then? Mr. Henderson responded. I have been in the past. I spent most of my youthful years in the West Indies and Asia. Well, you must share some of your own tales then, Your Grace. Lady Louisa and I were just talking on her own longing for an adventure, Mr. Henderson said, tipping a glass in Lady Louisa's direction. Is that true? The Duke asked Lady Louisa sceptically. It was his understanding that up until recently she had never even left the city. Well, Lady Louisa said shyly, I don't know if I will manage travelling the world as you have, Your Grace. I'm sure you can imagine things are not quite as easy for the female sex when it comes to these things. I wouldn't mind seeing more of the world if that is possible. Perhaps I will visit my brother in the Americas if they continue their stay in the land though Mr. Henderson has frightened me some with talk of savages, Lady Louisa added with a joking smile. You surprise me, Lady Louisa, the Duke said. I would have never considered you able to do something as unconventional as crossing the Atlantic on your own. Well, have no fear, I don't think my mother would ever allow me to do so. It is just wishful thinking, I suppose. I believe my time away from home, if nothing else, has encouraged more independence and bravery in me, something I don't think I ever would have found in myself otherwise. Funny, I would never consider independence an admirable quality in a lady, Miss Elizabeth chimed into the conversation. Up until that point she had been rather irritated to have been forced to listen to Mr Henderson's incessant chatter, but now that the Duke found interest in it, she did too. Of course, she would never miss an opportunity to demean Lady Louisa. On the contrary, Colonel Jasper responded, taking up Lady Louisa's cause. I rather wish we let women have more independence, to see the improvements that Lady Louisa has made in the lives of so many here as she has made her regular marches alone into town, only testifies to that fact. If we were to consider it more acceptable, I believe a great many ladies would have more means to help and support so many more in need. Lady Louisa blushed and looked away at the Colonel's compliment. I couldn't agree more, the Duke concurred. I am sure the world would be a better place if we gave women a little more freedom to make it so. Thank you, Your Grace, Lady Louisa said, surprised at his honest remarks in her defence. He shrugged it off. It is only my personal opinion on the matter. I was once advised to express those, even if they didn't agree with those of the majority. I believe the words were that it is better to be yourself than to be a falsehood to please others, he countered with a playful grin. Lady Louisa immediately recognised it as the same playful, flirtatious smile from the night of the masquerade. She did her best to hide this knowledge, though she felt it was written on her face. It is a shame that she will be leaving us soon, Miss Elizabeth announced. Who is? Colonel Jasper said, confused. Why, Lady Louisa, of course, Miss Elizabeth said in an innocent tone that was genuinely unbecoming of her. Lady Louisa felt all eyes of the group fall on her, and she had nothing to say. Had her aunt not just insisted that she stay? On top of this, 
she had also just promised to do so to Miss Mary. Now here was Miss Elizabeth announcing the opposite to her decision. I was meant to stay the whole of the season, Lady Louisa started. But I feared my mother may have started to grow lonely in London with both my brother and me gone. But you will not leave so soon. I feel as if you have only just arrived, Colonel Jasper said. This conversation was not going at all the way Miss Elizabeth had wanted. Instead of everyone accepting her departure and forgetting Louisa altogether, they all seemed to clamour around Lady Louisa and insisted that she stayed. Miss Elizabeth reminded herself that this was the exact reason why she always tried to play out every move on the chessboard of life before playing it. This unplanned action had only hurt her own cause. My mother has assured me she is quite fine in my absence, Lady Louisa said with a shy smile. I had rather hoped to stay the whole season, though, to acquire a better understanding of how to tend the medicinal garden from Mrs. Vance. Mary and I have already learned so much from her, but there seems to be so much we still don't know. Yes, Miss Mary constantly speaks of your time with Mrs. Vance and in the medicinal garden, Colonel Jasper said. It sounds like the education is a great enjoyment to both of you. He looked over at Miss Mary, who was listening intently to something that Lord Hartford was saying. Colonel Jasper had the soft glow in his eyes of someone greatly in love. It was the first time that Miss Elizabeth had realised it. Her mouth visibly dropped at the sight. For the rest of the conversation until dinner was announced, Miss Elizabeth kept a steady glare at Colonel Jasper. Though the Colonel was either unaware or chose not to make notice of it, Lady Louisa was all too aware of the unhappy looks. During the dinner, Lady Louisa found herself seated between Lady Hartford and Lady Juliana. It wasn't a terrible situation to be in, as they both kept up steady pleasantries of conversation. In fact, Lady Louisa was rather surprised at how successfully the night had gone thus far. Even her aunt seemed to be enjoying herself at the head of the table. She always found some bit of information to tell the Duke on behalf of her daughters, who were seated down at the far end as propriety necessitated. Lady Louisa had to admit that she did feel a little sorry for the Duke. She was sure she had judged him too harshly at first. Though it was clear he had little interest in Miss Elizabeth's abilities in painting fans, he did politely listen and even asked questions when it was appropriate. He was ever the proper Duke and for once Lady Louisa didn't view this as a disadvantage. After all, he had not chosen this role in life any more than a blacksmith's son might. He had taken on his responsibility, however, and was doing it with the respect and dignity that the title deserved. Lady Louisa had to admit that she did owe him an apology for her crosswords during their first few meetings. Though she could admit to herself that their quarrelling was probably just as much his fault as hers, she knew she was the one who would owe him compensation for her words. For this reason, once the meal was finished, Lady Louisa hoped to seek the Duke out for a private conversation. A very private conversation would not be possible, but she looked for a moment when she could perhaps speak with him with no one else nearby. Until such moment arrived, she waited patiently by her youngest cousin's side. The Colonel had in fact been aware of Miss Elizabeth's acknowledgement of his feelings for her younger sister. He had shared the concerns with Miss Mary, who in turn had told them to Lady Louisa upon entering the drawing room after dinner. Miss Mary did fear her sister so. She was sure that Miss Elizabeth would tell their mother right away, and moreover, ensure her mother was turned against the man. Don't worry, Mary. We will find a way to sort it all out in the end, Lady Louisa assured her cousin. I do hope so. You see, Colonel Jasper has already asked me to marry him, and I have accepted, Miss Mary whispered. Lady Louisa's mouth opened in shock. It happened at the ball. We both agreed to keep our engagement a secret for now. That is, until he can sell his commission and procure work nearby. Only then do I feel my mother will be willing to accept him. Oh, Mary! Lady Louisa did her best to smother her excited squeal. I am so happy for both of you. I am at a loss for words. You will keep it a secret, won't you? Only you and the Duke know of this secret. Of course it goes without saying, Lady Louisa assured her. But what of my sister? If she tells Mother she suspects something, we will be discovered, 
and all plans could be ruined. I am sure we will find a way to ensure that doesn't happen, Lady Louisa said, with as much of a convincing tone as she could muster. Chapter 27 Lady Louisa wasn't very skilled in the art of keeping count on a gentleman through the whole of a night. It was something she was sure either Lady Hendrickson or Miss Elizabeth could enlighten her about, as they seemed to have perfected that talent. Finally, however, she saw a chance when the Duke was finally relieved from Lady Hendrickson and came to sit down next to the unlit fireplace. Lady Louisa quickly excused herself from the group she was with and walked straight to him to speak with him while there was still a chance. Your Grace, Lady Louisa said. He looked up and Lady Louisa thought he was rather relieved it was her and not her aunt. Lady Louisa, have you come to inspect the delicate hyacinths that your cousin has painted so perfectly on this fireplace screen? He said in a low voice, his words dripping with sarcasm. No, Lady Louisa said, taking the seat across from him. I can assure you I have been required to look at it many times already and know her painted floral arrangements well, she answered in the same tone. I actually wanted a moment to speak with you for two reasons, Your Grace, Lady Louisa said in a soft whisper. And what might those be? the Duke asked, leaning back in his own chair away from the screen and looking at her with a question in his emerald eyes. Well, first, I suppose I owe you an apology. Lady Louisa said with her eyes on the carpet. An apology, the Duke responded sternly. Yes, I believe I might have judged you too harshly the first few times we met. It was wrong of me to claim that you presented a façade to others. In all honesty, I think I was a bit offended you thought so little of my gender to think we could be easily deceived by a title and an agreeable disposition. I see now that you are a good man who takes his position in life very seriously. I appreciate the compliment and apology, Roland said, never having expected that speech to be what came out of Lady Louisa's mouth. I must admit, however, that though your words might have seemed taxing at the time, there was some truth in them. I have done quite a bit of soul-searching these last few weeks, and in part, I have grown and changed because of the things you said to me. I don't need to wear a mask to please another. It is much more worthwhile to find a companion who will accept me as I am. Lady Louisa sat back in her own chair and blinked a few times in wonderment. She was surprised to hear such words come from his mouth. I am sure I had very little part in any growth you may have done in your life, Your Grace, Lady Louisa finally said modestly. You seem to surround yourself with very fine friends and family members who are great supports in life. This is true, the Duke said looking over at his uncle, though I wouldn't have agreed a month ago. My uncle had actually put me in quite a precarious position, and I was not very happy about it. You see, he continued when Lady Louisa was clearly interested in what he meant, the only reason for me to come here and hunt for a wife, as it were, was because my uncle had quite literally threatened to remove all my funding. Though I am the Duke in title, he is still the holder of my parents' estates until he deems me fit or I reach the age of thirty. Mr Vaughan is so kind I can't imagine him doing such a thing. Lady Louisa said, a little surprised. Oh, the Duke said. I don't think he would have ever actually gone through with it. Well, now I can safely say that. I wasn't so sure at the start of the year when he first told me. I believe he was just looking for a little incentive to get me to grow from my youthful years as a pup to the man I should become. He also felt that included not just a change in my priorities, but also the necessity of a companion. And you believe now his methods have worked? Lady Louisa asked, actually enjoying the time they spent together in conversation. Ironically, it was only after he assured me that he would cause me no ill will if I was unable to complete his requirements that I found the inspiration to change. You see, he continued, I wanted to accomplish his tasks and then go back to the way I once was. But I now see that is impossible. One can never go back to the person they were before. You, yourself, must agree with this statement. Did you not say that after your time here in the country, you feel more bravery and a willingness to try new things? Yes, I believe before my time here, I would not have understood what you're trying to tell me. But now, having also experienced it myself, I do. 
Lady Louisa agreed. It really became obvious to me the other day, the Duke continued. I was reading a book of poetry by Percy Bysshe Shelley. Do you know him? Lady Louisa smiled inwardly, knowing where he had received the inspiration to read from this poet. I believe I have heard of him, she said, trying to show indifference to a writer she deeply admired and respected. In one of his poems, he says, Man's yesterday may ne'er be like his morrow, nought may endure but mutability. It is a beautiful line, Lady Louisa agreed, knowing the verses of that particular poem well. Not only was it in Shelley's book of poems, but it was also quoted by his wife in her rather controversial book, The Modern Prometheus. It just spoke so greatly to me. I refused to try and keep my way still. I feel as if I was trying to stagnate when in reality I was in a rushing river, Roland continued passionately about his new awakening. I don't mean to chatter on about things that most likely seem quite dramatic to the listener, the Duke said, a little embarrassed that he had opened up so suddenly and freely. I feel there is a distinction between being dramatic and having great passion and excitement. I see you expressing the latter, Your Grace, Lady Louisa reassured him. He gave her a soft, lopsided smile. But you did say there were two things you wished to speak to me about. I pray you tell me the second for surely we will be interrupted any moment by your aunt's desire to hear my opinion on the screen, he teased. Lady Louisa let her eyes drift over to where Lady Hendrickson was speaking with Lady Hartford. She too was certain any moment she would find an excuse to come over. Lady Hendrickson was giving Lady Louisa a particular look that meant she was treading on thin ice. I was made aware of a secret agreement between two parties and was also told that you had foreknowledge of it. Lady Louisa said quickly, and as vaguely as possible. The Duke smiled at her. You don't have to worry. I also know about Jasper and Miss Mary's secret engagement, he said in a whisper. Lady Louisa gave a sigh of relief. She wasn't sure if she would have been able to keep speaking vaguely. She was happy to see the Duke not doing so. Well, I am sure you are aware why they must keep it a secret for now. Actually, I'm not the Duke replied in honesty. Oh, Lady Louisa said, not receiving the response she had expected. I certainly don't agree with my aunt on this matter, but I believe she has two major concerns. One, Mary has assured me she and the Colonel are working on remedying, and the other... Lady Louisa wasn't sure how to explain the second. What is the first? Roland asked sceptically. Well... Lady Hendrickson isn't very happy that Colonel Jasper is a member of the militia. Though I know it to be an honourable career, I believe she thinks it is less than ideal for her own daughter's living. And Jasper is already in the process of selling his commission and acquiring different employment. Yes, and I fear until this matter is settled, Lady Hendrickson will not feel comfortable with the marriage. Well, then I will just have to see to it that I help Jasper find something that her ladyship would consider suitable. Though I would think his good character, his affection for Miss Mary, as well as his exquisite military career should be enough. I do agree with you on this matter. And of course Mary does too. My aunt is just very adamant in her opinion, and I fear that she will not allow Mary to make a match unless she is satisfied with the conditions she has set. And what is this second condition you speak of? the one that you don't see a solution for? Well, I believe it stems from my aunt's own choices in life. You see, my aunt was meant to marry an earl, my father, in fact. But she chose Mr. Hendrickson instead, because she had great affection for him and barely knew my father at all. Of course, her parents would not allow such a thing, so the two eloped. In the end, my mother found companionship in the earl intended for her older sister. My aunt has never made her peace with this. What does any of that have to do with Miss Mary and Jasper? Roland asked, not seeing the line of logic. I believe it is my aunt's opinion that any gentleman not of the peerage is not a viable candidate for her daughters. She fears that they will feel the same unhappiness that she felt due to her life choices. That is preposterous. Jasper is just as worthy, if not more so than any gent of the ton. I know, Lady Louisa cooed, 
trying to soothe his raising voice. I agree wholeheartedly with you, as does Mary. Unfortunately, it is her mother that must be convinced. Roland took a moment to calm himself down. Jasper was like a brother to him, and to have someone consider him less than worthy merely because he was born without a title was infuriating. His uncle's words circled his mind again. If he were to create a connection to Miss Elizabeth, then things would certainly be a lot easier for Jasper. The lady in green invaded his thoughts again, and as much as he cared for his friend, he couldn't subject himself to a lifetime with Miss Elizabeth. Certainly, there was another way that he could use his influence as a duke to change Lady Hendrickson's opinion. I have just the thing, Roland said suddenly. Mrs. Vance's late father used to oversee the whole of Basson property in my absence. When he passed, Mrs. Vance did what she could to keep up with things. Of course, since my return and the increasing need for help, I've been looking to assign one person to oversee the property again. Jasper would have a cottage on the property and a gentleman's salary. Lady Hendrickson would have to accept him with such prospects. Roland was sure of it. Roland didn't wait for Lady Louisa's answer, but instead, in his excitement, searched the room for Colonel Jasper and called him over. Again, Roland told his friend of the plan he had concocted. Jasper hesitated for a moment as he thought the prospect over. It was a generous offer on Roland's behalf. In fact, he hesitated because it was too generous. He didn't like the idea of taking charity. Come on, chap, what do you think? Roland asked when his friend didn't answer. Miss Mary had joined their group also at Lady Louisa's urging, and she now stood silently looking at the colonel. She rather thought it was a wonderful prospect for them. She was sure that her mother would have no objections to her living in Basson Park and continuing the lifestyle she now had, if not a better one, between the colonel's sold commission and the generous salary suggested by the Duke. It was not her decision to make, however. Nonetheless, the colonel looked to his secret future bride for her opinion on the matter. They shared a long look where no words were spoken, but the communication between them was clear. Lady Louisa looked over at the Duke at that moment and couldn't help but feel a fluttering in her own stomach when their eyes met. She quickly looked away. I believe I would be a fool to pass up such a wonderful offer, Jasper said with a smile after silently confirming as much with Miss Mary. The two shook hands on the agreement. Lady Louisa wasn't sure who in their small party was more excited about the prospect of such an agreement. We will establish the details upon our return to Basson Park, the Duke announced, beaming. Return, Lady Hendrickson asked as she walked over to the group. Do you have plans to leave, Your Grace? she asked rather calmly, though it was apparent she didn't find the prospect a soothing thing at all. Yes, I will be visiting with friends for a short time. First, we will go to Lord and Lady Filton's, and then spend some time with the Baron of Chesterland and his family. Again Miss Mary's eyes met the Colonel's, as it seemed it was also news to her that he would be leaving the area for a time. He would have rather explained himself at that moment but was unable to find a reason to do so in Lady Hendrickson's presence without causing more suspicion. Lady Louisa had heard these two family names enough over the last several weeks to guess why the Duke was making calls on these families. He was still in the hunt for the Lady in Green. Though she was glad that he hadn't found her out yet, she also felt a little guilt that he was going to such great lengths to search when the lady he sought was in fact right in front of him. Her only hope was that perhaps he would find a companion in one of these ladies that he was considering as his mystery woman. Though a stab of jealousy pierced her at the thought of it, it would be better for him to find love and give up the chase, and it would be better for her relationship with the Hendricksons if he never discovered her identity as the lady. Chapter 28 the days after the dinner party were not very enjoyable ones for any member of the Menthith household. Both Lady Hendrickson and Miss Elizabeth were incredibly irritable, knowing that the Duke had left Basson Park to search for his mystery woman. To make matters worse, the following morning after the dinner party, Miss Elizabeth divulged what she knew about Colonel Jasper and Miss Mary to their mother. When pressed on the matter by her mother, Miss Mary had no choice but to confirm such affection 
and inform her mother that they had plans to wed. As expected, Lady Hendrickson was appalled by the prospect and forbade her daughter from spending any more time in his presence. Though heartbreaking for Miss Mary to hear, she had no choice in the matter as Colonel Jasper was inclined to follow the Duke on his tour about possible mystery ladies. She did, however, receive a letter from the Colonel that she was forbidden to open or respond to. I will write to the Colonel, Lady Louisa said a week after the dinner, while they both worked in the garden behind the house. Your aunt has no right to object to me doing so. If there is information that you wish to pass to the Colonel, I would be happy to do so. I can also inform him why you have not written a response to him, so that he doesn't question your loyalty to your engagement. Miss Mary was so happy that she burst into tears instantly. Oh, Louisa, you would do that for me, Miss Mary said between sniffles. It has been devastating not being able to read his letter or inform him why I cannot write back. I couldn't bear it if he thought I was turning my attention away from him. Lady Louisa enveloped her cousin in her arms and did her best to soothe her. Miss Mary was usually so steady and reserved. The sudden outburst of tears only showed how much turmoil Miss Mary had been forced to hold back since her mother's scolding. You don't have to fear, Mary. It will all work out in the end. After all, you have the Duke on your side. Your mother will surely not deny your marriage if only because it would displease the Duke and thereby ruin Elizabeth's chances with him. Mother will not care for that now. For surely the Duke will find his lady while he is away and the prospect will be gone. With that, all hope of the Duke's influence will be lost to me. I cannot say that such a thing isn't a possibility, but I can promise you that he will not find his lady in green while away. Why ever not? Miss Mary asked, looking up at her cousin in confusion. Lady Louisa shouldn't have said as much. She was willing to do anything to comfort her beloved cousin in a time of need, however. With a heavy sigh, Lady Louisa responded, because I know who the lady in green is. It is not any of those ladies that the Duke is seeking. That, of course, doesn't mean he might not find a connection with one of them. And I truly hope he does and finds a lifetime of happiness, she added quickly. Louisa, you know, why did you not tell me when you found out? Was it someone in the village as mother suspected coming uninvited? No, Lady Louisa hesitated. She still wasn't sure if she should say anything at all. Please, you must tell me who it was. I will promise to keep your secret as you have kept so many of mine. It was me, Lady Louisa finally said, barely above a whisper. Bess had me borrow one of your sister's dresses after the incident with the sherry. I knew your mother hoped I wouldn't come at all, and would have in fact been very cross to see me. When I saw them approach, I quickly hid, and that is when I encountered the Duke. Miss Mary sat for a moment with her mouth agape with shock. Finally she closed it, and excitement glowed on her face. It is just as Jasper and I had hoped, Miss Mary finally said. What? Lady Louisa was confused. We were sure that you and the Duke were perfect for each other. That is why he insisted on your presence even when you and the Duke were on less than happy terms. I just know you two are the perfect match. We must tell him right away. No, we must not say anything, Lady Louisa disagreed. The Duke would be appalled if he realised it was me. How could you think such a thing? Miss Mary said with a tinge of sadness in her eyes. I know you two had some tempestuous conversations at the beginning, but I believe at the dinner party you got along so well, not to mention the fact that you quite stole his heart at the ball. I didn't steal it. The idea of a mysterious woman did. Lady Louisa countered. I don't think that is true. I am certain that it was your personality that he fell in love with. It doesn't matter either way, Lady Louisa dismissed. You know of our family's differences. If I were to announce to the Duke my identity, and he was for some ridiculous reason to ask me to marry him, it would only cause more strife between our families. It wouldn't create strife between you and me. I would be more than happy with it. Oh, it would be so wonderful, she added as the thoughts came flooding into her mind. We would both live at Basson Park. What great fun we could have together. Just imagine it. That glorious medicinal garden would be yours to tend 
and I could help you with it, Miss Mary continued in excitement. Mary, you are jumping too far ahead of yourself, Lady Louisa cautioned. But you do care for him now, don't you? I can tell already by the way you speak of him. Lady Louisa hesitated. She still was tormented with her own feelings for the man and what ramifications those could have for the people around her. She couldn't bear the thought of causing rifts in her family. Don't think of Mother or Elizabeth, Miss Mary said, sensing Lady Louisa's hesitation. I want you to look inside yourself. How do you personally feel about the Duke? Has your heart been captivated by him? Lady Louisa took a moment to think of all the times she had encountered him, from their first meeting in the woods to the last conversation at the hearth's side a week ago. If she was being truly honest with herself, she did have feelings for the Duke. Who wouldn't, though? He was a most handsome gentleman with his broad shoulders, square masculine features, enchanting green eyes and heart-stopping smile. More than that, he was a warm-hearted gentleman who strove to help those in need, cared greatly for his friends and family, and had even greatly influenced her own character in a positive way. Had it not been for his offer and help to improve her study of medicinal practices, she wouldn't have become the independent woman she was now. In truth, she had grown quite fond of the Duke over the past few months since meeting him. Even more than that, that night at the ball, she too had shared the same inexplicable feelings alone in that room with the Duke. Lady Louisa expelled a long sigh. It was enough for Miss Mary to be further convinced she was right in her assumptions. It matters little how I feel. The truth of the lady in green must stay hidden. Promise me that you will do so for me? Lady Louisa asked. Miss Mary didn't want to agree to such terms, but she had already assured Lady Louisa she would keep any secret that was asked of her. She couldn't go back on her word now. If it is what you wish, of course I will do so. Roland brushed his jacket as he prepared for the evening meal. Five ladies and two months later, he was no closer to finding his lady in green. Earlier this afternoon, he had finally arrived at his last destination. If this was not the lady he hoped for, he wasn't sure what he was going to do. Are you ready? Jasper asked from behind him as he entered the room in his own dinner jacket. Roland gave a deep sigh, put his own jacket on and tugged at his neck tee. The last two months had been nothing but disappointment for him and false hope for the ladies he visited. He was beginning to feel that he was making an enemy with each house he left without proposing to the young lady of it. He turned to his friend. He could scarcely call Jasper just his friend any longer. He had waited patiently through all the months while they travelled from house to house, never complaining. Roland knew it was even harder for him because Miss Mary had been forbidden to write to him. Luckily, Lady Louisa had been kind enough to carry correspondence between the two. Certainly, it wasn't the same as sharing information with his betrothed, but at least it was better than nothing. Jasper had shared every letter he received from Lady Louisa. Roland found himself feeling more and more admiration for the lady with each passing note. For the most part, she spoke of things that she and Miss Mary did to pass the summer months. She would also share news she gleaned from Mrs Vance on Basson Park. Roland expected that the ladies visited Mrs. Vance and his uncle often. It made him happy to know that his uncle, who had chosen to stay behind at Basson, was well looked after. He took one long, deep breath before determining that he was ready, and turned to exit his room with Jasper at his heels. They walked down the stairs and into the drawing room while they waited for the rest of the party to appear. First, Lord and Lady Filton entered the room. He made light conversation with Lord Filton while he waited for his youngest daughter to appear. Finally she did, and Roland caught his breath in anticipation. She was tall and thin, with a narrow face and intricately placed ringlets so light a blonde they almost looked white. In an instant Roland was sure this wasn't the lady he was searching for. He breathed a sigh of defeat. What was he to do now? Of course, he would have to spend the remainder of the meal pretending not to feel disheartened by his last hope being taken from him. Worse than that, he would again have to spend the week visiting with the Filtons, though he knew she was not the one he was searching for. Roland couldn't help but sigh in relief, 
as he saw Basson Park come into view in the carriage a week later. Jasper, who had been asleep for most of the return home, was now awake and eager. Though he had no excuse to call on Miss Mary this day, he was happy just to be back in the same county with her. What am I to do now? Roland said more to himself than anyone else. Jasper looked over at his friend and felt pity for him. Jasper had experienced the same epiphany when he had found Miss Mary. The drastic difference was that something had grown from it. He couldn't imagine having experienced such love and not even knowing the name of the lady. Perhaps it is time to look for Wood, Colonel Jasper said. How? Roland said, fairly frustrated with the whole situation. I have run out of options to find her. Well, what I mean by forward is past this lady. Clearly she doesn't want to be found despite all your efforts. Perhaps it is time to let her go. Roland thought over these words as the carriage came to a stop before his home. Could he just let her memory go? He knew he could never move backwards to the man he was before. Over this season, he had matured and grown into the man he hoped that his father had wanted him to be. He would not just turn and run after failing. He could only see one move forward. He would stay here at Basson Park and hope to someday find his lady in green or at least someone who might erase her memory from his heart. Chapter 29 Mother, you will never guess what Lady Juliana just found out, Miss Elizabeth said upon returning home. What is it, dear? Lady Hendrickson said with a heavy sigh. Lady Hendrickson had been overly irritable these last few months. Lady Louisa suspected it was due to the absence of the Duke, but also because Summer didn't want to give in to Autumn. For Lady Louisa, this was a wonderful thing. She was able to collect two full harvests due to the glorious extension of the season. For Lady Hendrickson, who was still cloaked in black to mourn her husband properly aside from the night of the ball, this extension was rather uncomfortable. Before Miss Elizabeth spoke, she handed over a cool glass of water to her mother. Lady Hendrickson took it with little thanks and continued to fan herself in the coolest part of the drawing room. I spoke to Lady Juliana at the market today. She was also acquiring a dress in green. Did you know that the shop has been quite unable to keep the colour since the ball with the Duke? It's quite ridiculous if you ask me, Miss Elizabeth said. Lady Louisa, who was seated next to the window as she worked on an embroidery pillow, rather thought to remind Miss Elizabeth that she had worn her green pastel dress when the Duke last came for dinner. Instead, she kept her focus on her work. What do I care of Lady Juliana's knowledge of the colour options at the seamstress? Lady Hendrickson snapped. That is not the news, Mother, Miss Elizabeth said, ignoring her mother's irritated tone. I have heard from Lady Juliana this day that the Duke of Rowland has finally returned. Even better, he has returned with no lady on his arm, or promise made. Apparently, he was quite upset about that. Lady Louisa felt a pang of guilt whereas her aunt immediately brightened at the prospect of the unattached duke's return. Did I not say his hunt would be for naught? He has wasted all that time, and I assure you in the course has only realised no fantasy girl can keep up with your accomplishments, Lady Hendrickson said to her eldest daughter, completely beside herself with excitement. Did Lady Juliana say anything about Colonel Jasper returning with him? Miss Mary couldn't help but ask. Even if she had, Lady Hendrickson interjected, it is of no consequence to you. I have told you before he is not a suitable candidate for one of my daughters. Ah, this infernal heat, Lady Hendrickson added, as her excitement had led to perspiration. Mr. Henderson told me that in America, when summers are extended into the autumn, it is called an Indian summer. Lady Louisa said by way of distracting her aunt from focusing on Miss Mary and Colonel Jasper. He says that the trees turn the most beautiful shades of orange and red to match the natives' skin tones. I don't care a whit for what those disloyal ruffians call it, it's inhumane, Lady Hendrickson snapped back. There are pressing matters we must discuss, and I can find no way to do so when this heat distracts me from every thought, Lady Hendrickson said, as she waved her fan furiously. 
Just as Lady Hendrickson was finally beginning to calm herself, while Miss Elizabeth waited on the edge of her seat for their next move, a ring came to the door. After a few moments, a note was delivered to Lady Hendrickson. Just as I suspected, she said after reading it over and before using it too to fan herself with. The Duke has invited us to Basson Park for an afternoon picnic and strawberry picking. He says his fields have become overrun with his absence and have an especially good harvest. What a wonderfully fun idea, Miss Mary said, secretly happy to have a chance to see Colonel Jasper again. Lady Hendrickson looked at her youngest daughter very severely. You will not attend, my dear, she stated simply. What, mother, why ever not? Please let me go, Miss Mary said in desperation. The emotion in your voice is the very reason you shan't go. I will not have you speaking to that colonel and putting false hopes into his head that you two are still attached. I have stated you are not, and that is the end of that. Miss Mary struggled to keep her tears back. Lady Louisa rather wanted to lash back at her aunt. She knew that would be to no avail. Instead, she let her heart calm down for her cousin's sake before speaking. She did her best to sound indifferent to the matter. It might be offensive to the Duke if Miss Mary were not to attend. Why would you think such a ridiculous thing? Lady Hendrickson countered. Well, surely he must have at least some knowledge of the feelings between Colonel Jasper and Miss Mary. I feel the Duke might feel insulted that you would not approve his friend as a match for Miss Mary and still consider Miss Elizabeth one for him. Miss Elizabeth looked at her mother imploringly. No doubt it had crossed her mind as well at her mother's original outburst. Are you so set on the Colonel? Lady Hendrickson finally asked, considering it now that she saw there would be some use to the match. I care for him deeply, mother. He is a great man. Not only has he prepared to sell his commission, but he will also be staying at Basson Park in order to oversee the property. Surely you know that he will provide enough security for me. Yes, yes, her mother waved her off. Lady Louisa wondered if her aunt ever truly cared about her daughter's security, or just securing a title to show to Lady Louisa's mother. I don't care much about all of that. Does he have great enough influence on the Duke so that you can recommend your sister to him? It was an uncomfortable feeling for Miss Elizabeth to realise the fate of her happiness might very well rest in the hands of her younger sister. I know that they are very good friends. Practically consider one another brothers, was all Miss Mary could say in honesty. She knew that Colonel Jasper would be no more willing to recommend her sister any more than the Duke would be willing to follow such recommendation. If your colonel is willing to support our cause, I will consent to the marriage, Lady Hendrickson said with a narrowed eye on her youngest daughter. What shall I do? Miss Mary asked later, while she walked with Lady Louisa to Mr Johnson's cottage. His wife was pregnant with their third child, and Lady Louisa and Miss Mary had visited them every day to help Mrs Johnson tend to the other children and see to the needs of the house. My mother could not have set terms more impossible than these. Never fear, Mary. We only have to convince your mother that the Colonel is recommending your sister until your marriage. And how can we ever make that possible? Well, Lady Louisa said slowly, I suppose we could ask the Duke if he would be willing to show attention to Elizabeth for a time. In that way, your mother would think she had been recommended to him. Your marriage could be as soon as a month's time from now. Oh, that would be so wonderful, Miss Mary said whimsically and Lady Louisa couldn't help but feel some of her excitement. However, I am not sure the Duke would ever agree to such a thing. I think he would. After all, we can be certain the picnic was only an excuse on behalf of his friend. I think he would be willing to do so for a short period of time. Chapter 30 On the following day, the ladies all piled into the open carriage and began the short trip to Basson for an afternoon picnic. Much to Lady Hendrickson's relief, a cool breeze had finally begun to blow. Perhaps it was this fact that had put her in such a pleasant mood thus far. She had not reprimanded or criticised a single one of her charges that day, which was very unusual for her. Lady Louisa would have rather liked to do a little criticising herself when Miss Elizabeth came down in the forest green dress. 
It was clear that for all the accusations about other ladies' desperate attempts to catch the Duke's attention by impersonating the lady in green, she was doing the same. However, little did she know that it was indeed the exact same dress that the true lady in green had worn. Lady Louisa greatly hoped that the Duke wouldn't make the connection, but feared he might. For this reason, she was rather racked with nerves as they made their way down the lane. Miss Mary, too, was full of butterflies, but for a much different reason. It would be the first time she was to set eyes on Colonel Jasper after their months apart. Her greatest fear was that perhaps his affections had cooled over time. Of course, Lady Louisa had done her best to reassure her that such a thing was not possible, but still the fear persisted. They arrived at Basson Park and were greeted by the whole household. For Lady Louisa, Miss Mary and Mr Vaughan, not much time had passed since last they saw each other. The three chatted comfortably like the good friends they had become over the summer months. Soon the opportunity came for Miss Mary to speak with Colonel Jasper in relative privacy as they all walked the path to a patch of woods where the wild berries grew. As Lady Louisa told you, Mother learned of our engagement and was very unhappy about it, Miss Mary said with Jasper on her left and Lady Louisa on her right. Lady Louisa, however, was able to change her mind. She will consent to our union, but with one condition, Miss Mary continued. Whatever it is, I will gladly accept it, Colonel Jasper said. Lady Louisa couldn't help but feel caught up in the excitement of the moment. She only finds the engagement agreeable if you were to recommend my sister to the Duke, Miss Mary said timidly. But you know the Duke has no wish to accept her. I don't mean to offend, he added quickly. He has no desire to accept anyone outside of his mysterious lady. Miss Mary and Lady Louisa exchanged knowing glances, but Miss Mary still held her tongue on the matter. I understand this. It would not be required for the Duke to court Elizabeth in earnest. If he would merely show interest until we were wed, then Mother would be satisfied. Yes, until we were wed, and the Duke removed his attentions. Then how would she feel? I understand the method, but this is also your mother we are speaking of. Are you sure you would be willing to upset her so? Colonel Jasper said, slightly wishing he had a mother of his own to care about his life. I promise you, Hugh, Miss Mary said in a very intimate tone that made Lady Louisa blush for being close by. My mother is not one to ever accept us. If every aspect of life isn't to her benefit, it will never be good enough. We will never be good enough. That should not prevent our happiness, should it? Of course not, he said, smiling down at her affectionately. I will suggest the idea to the Duke at the earliest opportunity. And with luck we could be married within a fortnight, Miss Mary said with a childlike enthusiasm that she so rarely showed. Sooner if I can help it, he responded with a teasing wink that had Miss Mary giggling. Lady Louisa held back from walking with them. She wanted to give them privacy. They had been forced to have her mediation for the last several months by letter, and now they finally had a chance to truly speak their hearts without others listening in. She didn't want to rob them of such joy. They look quite happy, don't they? The Duke said, startling Lady Louisa from her thoughts. I didn't mean to scare you, he apologised quickly. You didn't really, Lady Louisa said, though she had clutched her chest and gasped. You just walk so quietly. I didn't hear you behind me. I shall endeavour to be much louder next time, he said with a playful smile. I am sure there will be many more times we will meet as a small party. It seems the only way that we can bring our two companions together, he added, nodding to the Colonel and Miss Mary ahead of them. Lady Louisa rather considered telling the Duke the formid plan and his part in it, but she thought it would be better received by Colonel Jasper, so she kept her mouth shut on the matter. Wonderful weather today, is it not? Lady Louisa finally said. Now are we to talk about the weather? The Duke retorted with a raise of a dark brow. I don't mean to make shallow conversation, Lady Louisa answered. It is just finally wonderful to get some respite from the heat. He smiled, relaxed as he looked down at her. I couldn't agree more. I spent the last week cooped up in a drawing room. 
Lady Georgiana Fulton was quite adamant about not going in the sun. It was very stifling. How do you feel about going out in the sun, Lady Louisa? Roland inquired. Well, I am here, so I would surmise that I am not too concerned about it. Though I have not yet reached the brave level of my sister-in-law, Abigail, who will spend a whole day with her sunbonnet in her hand and not care a whit for what others may think of it. And you are not like this? Roland asked, hoping to get a better understanding of this lady. Well, she said, motioning to her hat, I do currently have my bonnet on. That is true, but perhaps so that I may not see a blush rise to your cheeks, should I say anything worthy of such an action. And what might you say, Your Grace, to make me blush? Lady Louisa said, already blushing from his brazen words. Well, he said calmly, as if he was contemplating the options. I might first comment on how beautiful Miss Elizabeth's dress is today. Lady Louisa swallowed hard. And why would you think I would blush at such a comment? Lady Louisa couldn't bring herself to look up into his eyes for an answer. He didn't give one right away, and finally she was forced to meet his gaze. His eyes bored deep into hers, almost willing a confession out of her. She half expected she might provide it. She saw a yearning deep inside those eyes that she had felt herself ever since the ball. Finally she looked away, unable to give him the answer they both wanted. After a few moments pressed by the silence, she made an excuse to hold back and speak with Mr. Varwin. The rest of the day was a great enjoyment for Lady Louisa. She kept close to her two friends, Mary and Colonel Jasper, as they laid out blankets and ate a light luncheon in the warmth of the sun and the cooling breeze. She did notice, however, that the Duke was giving Miss Elizabeth several scrutinising looks over her gown. He knew for certain that it was the right dress, and he also knew for certain that Miss Elizabeth hadn't been the one wearing it at the masquerade. Lady Louisa's only hope was that the Duke would simply decide that Miss Elizabeth just happened to own the same dress in the same colour, with the same lace trim. Even as she thought such a thing, she knew it was a ridiculous hope. It is the dress, is it not? Miss Mary whispered to Lady Louisa as the two of them foraged for berries after their meal. Lady Louisa looked over to Miss Elizabeth, who was filling a basket next to her mother, and then to the Duke who had left his own foraging behind for a deep conversation with the Colonel. Lady Louisa didn't have to guess what they were talking about. She hoped that their focus was on enlisting the Duke's help in the Colonel's marriage endeavours, and not the dress. It is, Lady Louisa said as she placed another plump berry in the basket. It is easy to see the Duke knows it too. Why not tell him the truth of it? Can you not see how his health has been damaged by this search? If you will not have him, that is one thing. But at least release him from this misery. Lady Louisa studied the Duke closer. Though he still had his normal long frame and square jaw, his smile did seem to falter before reaching the light of his emerald eyes. His cheeks did look slightly more sunken, but Lady Louisa had just assumed it was the exhaustion of so much travel. It pained her deep inside to know she had been the cause of such great suffering. If she told him the truth, perhaps it would be enough to solve the mystery for him, for he could never actually desire marriage when he found his lady in green to be the rather plain Lady Louisa. It would be to no one's best interest for me to divulge such a thing, including you. Could you honestly say your mother would allow your marriage to proceed if it was made known that I was the lady in green? Miss Murray absorbed this fact for a few moments. I see your point, she said. I cannot allow my happiness to be at the heel of your unhappiness, however. I am not unhappy, Lady Louisa assured her. Miss Mary gave her a pointed look. Had you not told me that you were the woman from the ball, I am sure I would have reached the conclusion on my own. You were a different person after that night. It has changed both of you. Is it true? A male voice said behind them. Chapter 31 Both ladies quickly whipped around in their place to see a figure standing over them. For a moment Lady Louisa was panicked and sure she was about to faint. The sun stood behind the tall frame, darkening his form to nothing but an outline. 
Is it true? he repeated. Were you the lady in green? he hissed out in barely an audible whisper. Lady Louisa and Miss Elizabeth stood before the man. Lady Louisa gave an audible sigh of relief to see Colonel Jasper standing before them. It is, but... Lady Louisa started. I knew it. I knew all along. From the moment I first met you, I knew that you would be the perfect match for Roland. Why have you not told him? What do you have to hide? He practically knows it himself. He hasn't stopped badgering me, insisting that Lady Elizabeth is wearing the green dress. It's a complicated matter, Hugh, Miss Mary interceded on behalf of her cousin. You knew too, he asked his fiancée in surprise. But I swore her to secrecy, Lady Louisa added quickly. But why? Why keep it a secret? First off, look at me. I mean only to save the Duke the embarrassment of his mistake, Lady Louisa said quickly. You have traded modesty for self-shaming, Lady Louisa. I know Roland well. Any man would be so lucky for you to accept him. His affection for you has grown these past months. I would dare say the only thing holding him back is this elusive lady. You are her. Why not tell him so? I can't, I just can't. Not until after your engagement is announced, Lady Louisa said, full of sorrow. The remainder of the day was less enjoyable for Lady Louisa, as a dark cloud of deception hung heavy over her. She couldn't decide what would make her dislike herself more. If she did tell the Duke and permanently offend her aunt, ruining any future relationship, or if she kept her secret, though she clearly saw it pained him. You seem quite sullen, a man's voice startled Lady Louisa from her thoughts. She looked around with a start and realised that most had moved on to collect berries elsewhere. She had stayed seated underneath the shadow of a tree, feeling its darkness deep inside her. I didn't mean to startle you again. I forgot I must tread heavier in your presence, the Duke said, coming to sit next to her and placing a berry in her half-filled basket. I don't mean to seem so. I am having a wonderful time today. Lady Louisa did her best to seem bright. I believe with that statement I have come full circle in understanding you, the Duke said. Whatever do you mean? Well, you were so cross with my attempt at hiding my true self in the past only because it is an impossibility for you to do so. I could read your face as well as any book, he added with a chuckle. Lady Louisa couldn't help but give a little laugh too. She was an easy one to read. It was amazing she had kept her secret thus far. I just suppose I feel rather sad for Mary and the Colonel. It is so cruel the way my aunt is treating them she said vehemently, also thinking of the ways her aunt had destroyed her own possibility of happiness. It pains me as well to see things unfold as they do. It is also most unnerving to see you so upset, he said, looking down at her with affection. Lady Louisa let her gaze drift up to him. Well, I suspect now that Jasper and Miss Mary will receive their due happiness despite your aunt. Would that not be something to brighten your disposition over? Tragedy delights by affording a shadow of the pleasure. I can't see how she will hold true to her word, Lady Louisa quoted from Shelley before she even realised what she was doing. Suddenly her hands clamped over her mouth, while the Duke's dark eyebrows rose simultaneously. Let me guess, he said after a moment. Percy Shelley. Lady Louisa still had her hand cupped over her mouth, but she nodded yes. I believe he is a poet you hold very dear to your heart, the Duke continued. Lady Louisa could only nod again. It was you then, he said as he searched his own thoughts. Yet you kept the truth from me. Larry Louisa removed her hand and placed it on the Duke's arm. It was only for your own sake. I didn't want you to be disappointed not to mention how much it would enrage my aunt. I feared it would ruin Mary's prospects permanently. I did promise Mary and the Colonel I would tell you after they were wed. They knew too, Roland said, feeling personally offended by his friends withholding such information from him. Well, Colonel Jasper only found out today. You must see I couldn't tell you for Mary's sake. I told you how volatile my aunt and mother's relationship is. It would only make things worse between the two families if I made such a thing known. Why? 
I suppose your aunt would again be furious that I chose you over that self-important Miss Elizabeth. I am not putting such words in your mouth, Your Grace, Lady Louisa said hurriedly. I would not presume that you would still hold affections for the woman at the ball now that you know the real person behind her mask. I promise you, he said, tipping his head down just slightly and lowering his voice. My honour to my word kept me searching, but my heart has longed for you to be the one. Lady Louisa looked up at him with tears brimming in her eyes. He had spoken the words she had never dreamed to hear him say. But such things could never be determined by one night. Lady Louisa shook the tears out of her eyes. It was just the infatuation of the moment. We surely are not good for one another. I could never bear to stay behind while you return to the Indies. And I would not wish you to, Roland countered. You have stirred change in me to be the man my uncle wanted me to become. And I promise you, you started that process long before you hid behind that golden mask. I care little of location as long as you would let me be by your side. I have always wondered what the Indies might be like, she said with a soft smile. He relaxed a little. Looking around to make sure no one was watching, he gingerly picked up her hand and kissed it ever so softly. I am certain you would love it, he said with his lips against her flesh. Will you accept me then? Roland asked, looking up at her from behind his thick lashes. Lady Louisa felt her heart beating in her chest. She wanted to scream yes and wrap her arms around him, but she also had the nagging awareness of Mary and the Colonel. What of Mary? I cannot take my happiness at the expense of hers. Is that all that keeps you from being my wife? He asked with a growing smile. She looked at his growing smile questioningly. He was much better at hiding his thoughts than she was. I would secure happiness for all of us this very moment if you would allow me to, he said, letting go of her hand and brushing his fingertips against her cheek. She leaned into his touch and closed her eyes. The sensation his gentle caress gave her was exhilarating and addicting all at the same time. She opened her eyes, and looking lovingly back as she leaned into his touch, she nodded her assent. Chapter 32 Well, that settles it then, Roland said, standing up. Lady Louisa was a little shocked by his quick movement. He reached down and helped her up from her place as well. I am not sure what is settled, Your Grace, she said as she leaned against his steadying touch. Come with me, my love, and I will have us all toasting to our futures by dinner, Roland declared, while holding out his arm for Lady Louisa to take. She did so, and together they walked over to where the others had migrated to. It was not lost for an instant on Lady Hendrickson that her niece and the Duke had interlinked arms. The pointed stare she shot Lady Louisa made her remove her arm rather reluctantly from its place. I have a bit of an announcement to make, the Duke said, gathering everyone to him. Let us retire back to our place at the luncheon so I may share it with all of you. Mr Vaughan simply mumbled that his knees were quite ready to be over with all this crouching over berry shrubs, and was glad that it was finally over. As they walked back to the picnic area, Lady Louisa watched the Duke of Rowland and Colonel Jasper speak in a rapid whisper. She had no idea what he was planning, but did hope that it would work. Finally, they were all again settled in the warmth of the setting sun, while the Duke stood before them preparing to speak. I have done much soul-searching these last few months since returning to England. I'm happy to say that much of it has to do with a certain lady. He flashed a look at Lady Louisa but let his gaze linger on Miss Elizabeth. Miss Elizabeth sat a little straighter. I was not the only one to find my eye caught by a fine lady either. My dear friend, brother really, Hugh Jasper, has informed me of his intentions to marry Miss Mary Hendrickson. All eyes looked at the couple. Really, only Mr Vaughan was unaware of the prospect of marriage, though he had known that Jasper had feelings for her. Now. Lady Hendrickson, he said, turning his attention to the lady who was rather fuming at the Duke's public announcement that attached her daughter to the Colonel. 
I understand you felt some reluctance about their engagement. I completely understand. After all, it must be hard to allow one's daughter away from the safety of your home. Lady Hendrickson flicked her fan back and forth a few times. I can assure you that not only is Jasper like a brother to me, but he is also the finest gentleman I have ever known. Not only this, but I believe this connection to be but the first between our two families. He looked again at Miss Elizabeth. Lady Louisa's eyes widened as his actions dawned on her. He was going to use Lady Hendrickson's own manipulative ways to get her to publicly accept the Colonel, in hopes that it would then mean the Duke would attach himself to Elizabeth. Miss Elizabeth could hardly contain herself. It was clear to her that he was speaking of a marriage between the two of them. Lady Hendrickson didn't waste time agreeing with this. Your Grace, you are quite right that I did feel reluctance, for I care for my girls so deeply, she said a little too dramatically. But with your assurance of the Colonel's character, I see no reason why the two should not be wed, she added with a slick smile. Truly, Mother, Miss Mary asked. Of course, dear, I only want your happiness after all, Lady Hendrickson said for the benefit of the public display. I am so pleased to hear you say that, the Duke said, rubbing his hands together. Then if you don't mind, I would like to announce one more thing. Then perhaps we can all retire to the house to toast in celebration of the future. Miss Elizabeth fretted with her skirts waiting for her time to stand, as the Duke publicly proposed to her. She was sure that there could be no other kind of announcement he would want to make at this time. I do hope that Jasper will forgive me for making my own matrimonial announcement in the same moment as his, he said, looking at his friend. Jasper only nodded in agreement while Mr Vaughan, who was feeling rather drowsy at this point, perked right up at his nephew's words. He reached down to the space between Lady Louisa and Miss Elizabeth. For just a second, she thought his taunting might be a bit cruel, but one look at Miss Elizabeth's high-held nose washed away any guilt. Lady Louisa, would you please come stand by me? the Duke asked, reaching his hand out to her. She took it through, blushing red, and stood next to him. Lady Louisa could barely keep back the smile at seeing both her aunt and Miss Elizabeth's shocked expressions. Earlier today I asked Lady Louisa if she would be my wife. She told me no, he said, looking down at her with a smile. She said what? Mr Vaughan asked, unsure if he had heard correctly. She said no, he explained to his uncle, unless I could ensure that she and Miss Mary could share in engagement celebrations. I am happy to announce that thanks to Lady Hendrickson, I can make that promise. So, Lady Louisa Fraser he asked in front of everyone present. Would you do me the honour of being my wife? Lady Louisa did her best to choke back the tears that threatened to escape her eyes. This man had used Lady Hendrickson's own skills of deception to somehow perform a miracle. There would be no way for Lady Hendrickson to deny Mary her happiness now, after approving it so publicly. Of course, she had done so under carefully created misunderstandings. Though Lady Louisa was sure her aunt would never forgive her for such a thing, she was sure she cared very little for Lady Hendrickson's approval at that moment. Yes, I will, Lady Louisa responded, looking up into her future husband's eyes. Epilogue My love, a soft, deep voice cooed against Lady Louisa's ear to rouse her from her sleep. Lady Louisa woke to find herself having drifted off due to the gentle rocking of the carriage ride. Oh, have I slept long? the Duchess of Rowland said, raising her head from her husband's shoulder. For a bit, Rowland said while he waited for his new wife to fully awaken. We are just getting to the docks. I thought you might want to see it. Oh, yes, Louisa said as she leaned over her husband to see the view of the coast out his window. And we leave tomorrow? she asked as her eyes scanned the many ships below. Yes, provided there is a good tide, the ship will leave in the early afternoon. Her eyes furrowed as she concentrated on each ship. Are you regretting your decision? I know the Indies are far, but I can assure you that sailing the Mediterranean is quite safe even in the winter. Though he had retold her many tales of the warm winds that blew and the exotic animals, Louisa had a hard time imagining it with snow on the ground. 
I was just trying to see which one was ours. I don't understand how you could possibly tell, she said, happy to soothe her husband's concerns. I am not regretting this at all. In fact, I am rather excited to have a warm Christmas. We can stay through the new year. My love, we can stay as long as you wish, Roland assured his wife. She smiled, comforted by his words. I do want to return when Colton gets home, though, she said more to herself. His last letter said they planned to sail in the spring. It will be so nice to meet our little nephew. Yes, and Gilchrist Estates is less than a half a day's ride from Basson Park. We will be quite close neighbours. I expect you will enjoy that since you speak so highly of your brother. I promise you will enjoy it too, Louisa added, as she was distracted by studying the ships again. Is it that one? she asked, pointing down. Roland looked out his own window. That is a military sloop, my love he said with a hint of humour as if that point was quite clear. Louisa wrinkled her nose at his teasing words. Do you think Uncle James will be all right while we are gone, though? Louisa asked, the concern seeming more real with the ships before her. She had started calling Mr Vaughan that way the day of her wedding upon his request. He has Jasper and Mary to keep him company, Roland replied. Yes, I suppose you are right. I guess I am just not used to going out on my own without a patient to tend to or something to do for another. Well, Roland said, resting his thumb under her little chin and tipping it up ever so slightly. I'm afraid, my love, that on this trip, you will not be allowed to do anything but relax and enjoy it. I plan to treat you as a proper duchess should be treated. Oh, Roland, Louisa said, waving off his words. You don't have to do any of that. I'm just happy that I can be here with you. Funny, he said with a wicked gleam to his eyes. You seemed quite opposed to that when you ran away from me at the ball. Yes, well, it's a good thing you didn't give up on finding me, she responded, tipping her head up ready for one of his sweet kisses. He didn't have to be asked with words. He leaned down and met her lips with his own. Wrapping his arms around her, Roland pulled her even closer against him in the already tight space of the carriage. It's a good thing, he said against her lips between kisses, that you were willing to be caught in the end. And he kissed her again, knowing that he would have the rest of his life with Louisa in his arms, and yet it would never be enough. Read Falling for the Governess now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.